Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. I will assume that noise came from the online system rather than, <laughs> rather than from above um, at that particular point. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? clerk? President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. An additional proposal has been lodged by the Select Committee on the Administration of Sports Grants for a private meeting today from midday. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I will move on and I'll call the clerk. Government business order of the day. Number one, electoral legislation amendment miscellaneous measures bill 2020, further consideration in committee. I just remind those on video that um, the Senate can see everything that's happening on the screen, so just make sure you are acting in the same way you would as if you were in the chamber. So the committee is considering the electoral legislation amendment miscellaneous measures bill of 2020. The question is that the, and I believe Senator Waters is seeking the call. Senator Waters. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, look, I believe we've got one amendment remaining and it's Australian Greens uh, amendment on sheet 1003. Um, I'll just flag that I won't be. Yes, that's correct, Senator Waters. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just flag that I won't be moving um, Amendment 1 because it's in conflict with an amendment that passed yesterday, obviously. So um, I'll be moving Amendment 2 on sheet 1003. Now, um, people will be probably getting a bit sick of the Greens raising the influence of dirty donations on political decision making, uh, but we're not going to stop raising it until the influence of dirty money is gotten off our politics. And so we have this bill, which we uh, spent much of yesterday debating, which allows um, uh, donors to continue to donate to federal branches um, of parties in states that have strong donations laws, which we contend is a backdoor around those stronger state donation restrictions. Um, and sadly, that's got bipartisan support. So what we are doing now with this Amendment 2 on Sheet 1003 is trying to bring in the donations restrictions that we think will restore democracy as a function of the Australian people and ensure that democracy can't be for sale anymore. So there's a, it's a uh, three prong uh, elements to this amendment. Firstly, it redefines gift to include party memberships and to in include subscriptions to various different party forums. And I'll come back to that. Essentially, that's uh, pay for access meetings and lobster luncheons. It then uh, bans completely donations from a number of industries that have got a long history of seeking undue influence um, in return for political donations. And that list is property developers, uh, the banks, tobacco, alcohol, gambling, big mining, defence and big pharma. The Greens don't think that those industries should be able to donate one cent because they have a sordid history of seeking influence as a result of making those donations. And lastly, and this is perhaps the most important reform, we would like to see donations capped from everybody else, no matter whether you're an individual or an organisation or a corporation, at $1,000 a year or $3,000 for a three-year term, which obviously works out to $1,000 a year. That is a constitutional way of ensuring that people can still uh, support causes that they believe in. 
but it makes sure that you can't buy undue influence and seek to have policies made to address your personal needs or to address uh, and boost your personal uh, corporate profits. So we want to see big money out of politics entirely. And this is how you do it. You bring in public funding, you cap spending, but importantly, you cap donations and you stop donations from those industries that have long sought undue influence over decision makers. So um, I want to give some statistics in the time that I've got um, available to me on this matter, Chair. Since 2012, fossil fuel and resources industries have donated over $7.5 million to both of the big parties. And that industry in return gets $6 billion a year in tax subsidies. We call them fossil fuel subsidies. And they're things like accelerated depreciation, cheaper diesel fuel, perks, if you like, that uh, ordinary drivers uh, and other sorts of companies don't get access to. So that's a pretty good return on investment. That's about $2,000 in subsidies for every dollar that they donate. Now, generous donations have also bought them a government that's completely paralysed by the phrase climate change, certainly paralysed by the phrase climate emergency, despite the worst bushfires that this country just uh, experienced in our ancient history. Um, it won't surprise you that the gas industry donates millions of dollars. Uh, so it was, of course, no surprise that the Prime Minister appointed a whole lot of his gas mates to the National COVID Commission, who have unsurprisingly recommended support for their own projects. Uh, and uh, we now have this uh, spurious notion of a gas-led recovery, when everyone can see that uh, gas has actually increased gas prices and therefore has led to a suppression of domestic manufacturing. Uh, but that's that somehow has escaped the government's um, uh, laser-like focus on doing favours for their mates. Uh, banking and finance have been a, uh, a serial offender. They've donated about $60 million since 2012 to both sides of politics. And boy, didn't that buy them a lot of reprieve until we finally, after many years of the Greens pushing for it, got a Banking Royal Commission. It bought them many, many years of getting away with atrocious, unethical, immoral, illegal conduct. And uh, finally, finally, after many, many years of pushing, the Royal Commission has exposed that conduct. But one wonders whether $60 million bought them a few years of that continued bad behaviour not being sanctioned properly uh, by those in charge. The gambling industry is, of course, another huge donor to both state and federal political parties. And you can see uh, the evidence of what that donation delivers and its strong support for pokies around Australia. Clubs New South Wales are huge donors to the Liberal parties, and in particular, following um, the attempted reform by um, uh, Member for Denison, Andrew Wilkie. Uh, very generous uh, donations flow from Clubs New South Wales to the Liberal Party after some attempt at gambling reform, which sadly went nowhere. And they're the only donations that we know about. We know that there are vast amounts of donations, dark money, if you like, that aren't required to be disclosed because our disclosure rules are, are terribly weak. And so part of the, um, part of the uh, intention of these amendments today is to try to capture some of those lobster lunches, try to capture some of that pay for access meetings that seems so routine, even though it's disgusting uh, in this chamber. So we would redefine gift to include party membership fees of over $1,000. At the moment, they're excluded. And we would redefine gift to include those pay for access functions, those forums, those subscription fees to, uh, to various party subgroups that at the minute, our electoral laws don't include as disclosable. And in fact, there's some uncertainty that even the Electoral Commission recognises in terms of um, the markup on various corporate lunches that was discussed yesterday. Even the AEC has acknowledged that actually the drafting there is so uh, unclear that um, often those sorts of events, you can get away with not disclosing them. And sadly, the big parties do just that. Uh, the Minerals Council, old friends of ours, donate $25,000 to each major party's such 
forum, and that entitles them to uh, two boardroom events and two policy briefing sessions. And at the minute, that's, uh, th there's no restriction on that. So what these amendments seek to do is to redefine that definition of gift, to um, ensure that those things are disclosable. But then because we cap donations to $1,000, you would then not be able to donate those whopping amounts to get that special access that no other ordinary Australian gets. Um, and so we would seek to clean up those lobster lunches. Uh, I've talked already about the bans that we want to see on property developers, on the banks, on tobacco, alcohol, gambling, big mining, defence and big pharma. Um, we know this has routinely been um, before the courts and has been, uh, has been found to be perfectly lawful. Um, I want to uh, commend some of the state governments for taking steps in this regard. New South Wales in particular has been um, uh, at the front of the pack in terms of donations reform, um, pushed, pushed by our state Greens there, of course, for many years. Um, and even Queensland came on board, thanks again to political pressure exerted by my party, to include a property developer ban um, under our state laws. But it's nowhere near enough. We still have massive donations from the big oil, big coal, big gas. In a climate crisis, they're still trying to buy the denial of the, of the parties uh, in government or those seeking to be in government. Um, and meanwhile, the rest of the community suffers. We need climate action. And we need policies that help people, not boost corporate profits. And part of the reason why we have such poor decision making out of uh, the federal parliament is because those donors get more influence than they should. And their interests get weighed in uh, policy decisions when, in fact, we should be progressing the public interest uh, and protecting nature and setting us uh, all up for a prosperous and healthy future. Uh, so these are the amendments that the Greens are seeking to move today. It's not the first time we've raised these issues. This has been long-standing Greens policy. Uh, I'm not expecting to get support from Labor or the Liberal Party, so you've taken that $100 million in corporate donations since 2012. They're quite happy with that arrangement, and I'm sure they want to keep seeing the money flowing. I had a chance yesterday to vote for lower disclosure thresholds. They didn't do so. Um, they've got a chance today to vote to clean up the dirty donations. I'm not expecting them to do so, but the Greens do not give up. We will keep pushing these issues because democracy belongs to the community. Politicians should not be for sale. I commend these amendments to the Chamber. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Senator Waters. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, the government will oppose uh, these amendments. Uh, the Greens' amendments uh, would arbitrarily, uh, arbitrarily ban eight different specific categories of businesses from participating in the democratic process, um, eight different specific categories of uh, legal, um, lawful businesses. Amongst the businesses that the Greens seek to ban are pharmaceutical companies. At the very time when these companies are alleviating suffering and helping to address the strains of a global health pandemic, the Greens want to stigmatize them by labeling them as a dirty industry. It's quite a disgraceful description of uh, an extremely important uh, sector of our economy, an, an important sector uh, in our community, supporting public health. Supporting public health. Unbelievable uh, that the Greens would come in and seek to stigmatize such an important sector of our economy uh, in that fashion. So to be very clear, I mean, this ban, which the Greens are proposing, would hit companies that conduct uh, pharmaceutical research and testing of medical cures, the sort of companies that are at the forefront of fighting diseases. The amendments uh, also raise obvious questions over the constitu constitutionality of such proposals, given that the High Court has uh, clearly stated in recent cases that donation bans uh, could uh, fail where they are not reasonably necessary and they impermissibly burden the implied freedom of political communication. The amendment uh, also uh, proposes uh, donation caps of $3,000. Those capping provisions cover donations to various political actors, including a state branch of a political party. But the amendments overlook that some parties also have territory organizations. So even putting policy preferences to one side, uh, these are not uh, thought, thoroughly thought through and well-drafted amendments, and uh, the government will oppose them. Thank you, Minister. Senator Farrell. Thank you. Um, uh, Deputy uh, Chair, 
Um, uh, the uh, Labor Party uh, will also not be supporting uh, these amendments. Um, <coughs> there's nothing quite like a Greens political party dripping, dripping in hypocrisy, uh, Deputy uh, Chair. Well, <coughs> how, do I, how do I know that? How do I know that? Well, I know that because my very good friend, my very good friend Lee Rhiannon, um, uh, who's no longer in this uh, house, uh, was so outraged by the hypocrisy of the Greens on these uh, matters that she ghost wrote a poison letter attacking the Greens' leadership at the time. So um, we know we know that the Greens are hypocritical on this. <coughs> um, they tell us today that they want to remove big money from political donations. Well, lovely, lovely objective. But let's talk about uh, Duncan Turpey, a reclusive Queensland mathematician, investor and high-end gambler. High-end gambler. <coughs> now, I can't quite remember all of the categories that uh, uh, <coughs> um, the Greens want to ban, but I do think gambling was, was one of them. Uh, now, what did he? How much? How much big money? How much big money? How, no, no, we're coming. We're coming. We're coming. We're coming Order. to some more. No, this is not the end of it. This is not the end of it, Senator McKim. I know you are embarrassed. You are Order. embarrassed by this policy. What did this uh, reclusive? What Senator did, Farrell, please resume your seat, Senator McKim. Uh, yes, look, Senator Farrell is uh, personally impugning me, uh, and he's wrong. I'm not embarrassed Senator in the slightest. McKim, it's, a, it's contrary to the standing orders. That's not a point orders. of order. Senator McKim, resume your seat. If you wish to make a contribution, please seek the call. Thank you, Senator Farrell. I know the Greens don't want to hear what I'm saying. I know that they don't want to hear what I'm saying. Uh, when they, they want to remove big money, well, why didn't they reject Mr Turpey's $500,000 donation. Um, and uh, who, who are Mr. Turpey's mates? Well, well I, I will tell you, Senator uh, Billick, because you have an interest in this sort of thing. Um, he's, he's a Gold Coast based algorithm specialist, and he's a member of the secret Punters Club gambling group connected with the Museum of Old and New Art founder David Walsh. Now, I'm not sure how much closer you've got to get to the gambling industry than the $500,000 that Mr Turpey donated. But that's not the end of it. That's not the end of it, uh, Deputy President. Um, they say they don't want corporate uh, donations. They don't want big money. Now, you might recall we found out uh, after the election before last that the um, Prime Minister Turnbull made the biggest donation personally uh, of, a, uh, of, a, of a private uh, donor in the history of Australian politics. But who, up until um, <coughs> former Prime Minister Turnbull donated uh, that massive amount of money, who was the biggest single donor in Australian political history? Well. Um, it was the founder of the online travel business uh, What If, um, who donated uh, $1.6 million to, well, to the Australian Greens. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? This party, this party, this party that wants to cut, this wants to party that wants to cut big money, big money out of politics. Um, accepted the largest donation in the history of Australian politics up until that time. So, again, a party dripping in hypocrisy. But that's that's not the end of it. That's not the end of it. No, there's more. There's more. There, there is more, uh, Senator Billick. Um, what about the Western Australians Green convener, Chilla Bulbeck? who personally donated $600,000 to the Greens at the last election. <clears throat> now, maybe the Greens don't think $600,000 is big money, and maybe 
they are not people that they're hoping to catch uh, in this piece of legislation. But there's just three examples that I know of about how hip hypocritical the Greens are on, on these issues. So, um, uh, we do believe in reform. Um, and last, last, we and we believe in practical results. When the Labor Party started campaigning for the end of political donations, uh, foreign donations, foreign political donations at the last election, everybody said, "No, you can't do it. You won't be able to achieve it. You're in opposition. The government will stymie you." And I have to say, we didn't get very much support from the Greens on that issue. But we persisted. We persisted and we argued and we argued and we argued. And what did we get? We got a bill that banned political donations before the last election. So for the first time in Australian political history, foreign political donations were banned in this country. So the former um, foreign minister couldn't rake in all that money while she was the foreign minister. Uh, um, I'm talking about uh, Ms Bishop. She couldn't rake in all that foreign uh, donations to the, uh, to the Liberal Party, as she had done in previous uh, elections. I'm not just picking on the Greens. <coughs> um, Senator Waters, I'm equally having a go at the, uh, the government. Um, so there's plenty of hypocrisy around on these issues, uh, but the Labor Party has got um, records uh, on the board. We've pushed for these issues and we've got the outcome. And the offer I make to you, Senator Waters, because I checked again last night, there hadn't been any calls from the Greens about your um, amendments. Uh, we're very happy to talk to you about a practical outcome in terms of political reforms, because the Labor Party believes in it. More importantly, the Labor Party has achieved it. Uh, and if you sit down with us and Senator Patrick and Senator Lambie, Mr Griff, uh, Senator Griff, uh, then we can get some practical results. But this is not the way to do it. Grandstanding, grandstanding, uh, making this the last, um, the last uh, item um, on, the, on the list, trying to get a bit of cheap publicity, is not the way to do it. You've got to, you've got to be serious about it. Uh, you've got to start at the beginning. Uh, and uh, like we've done in the past, you'll get the results. Thank you, uh, Senator Farrell. Order. So the question is, oh, Senator McKim. Attention, Deputy President. Senator Waters is seeking the call. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Waters. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator McKim. Uh, I'll just take the opportunity to respond to uh, to some of that. Um, I think uh, Senator Farrell might be a bit disappointed that I didn't telephone him. I'm sorry, I went to the leader of your party in this chamber, so uh, <laughs> I, I didn't get a reply, unfortunately. Um, I want to address some of the other issues that were raised. The, um, the government is trying to turn this amendment into uh, something that it's not. I thought that was quite a heroic reinterpretation by Senator Cormann there of these amendments that would stop uh, big industries seeking to buy influence from political parties. Um, Senator Cormann tried to recast that as restricting the operations of pharmaceutical companies. We're very happy for them to continue with their work. In fact, they should not have been sold off in the first place, and we'd like to see public pharmaceutical production. Um, but I think that's sadly a bridge too far for this government because they love privatisation. Um, so, a restriction on their operations. We just don't think that they should be funding your political party. We don't think they should be funding anybody's political party. They should be spending their money on trying to help people. So, I just thought it important to clarify that um, that heroic attempt at a reframe by Senator Cormann. Um, and then, sadly, we had a bit of a lecture, um, a bit of an attempt at a patronising lecture that didn't really land. Um, from the Labor Party on hypocrisy. This is the party that yesterday had a private member's bill for a $1,000 disclosure threshold and then voted against the Greens' amendment 
to do just that in a manner which had exactly the same drafting as their own private members bill. So I think it's a bit rich to be uh, dishing out uh, contentions of hypocrisy there when you just voted against your own private members bill. Um, and he then sought to um, it sought to impugn several uh, individuals who have supported the Greens in the past. Now, I might point out that none of those people, not companies, but individuals, sought to exert policy influence, nor did they receive any policy influence. The big distinction there, our policies aren't for sale. And yes, we do want to cap big donations like that going forward. Yes, we do think that would be an improvement on democracy, and we're prepared to cop it, just like we think all of you should cop it. So again, I really didn't feel like the, uh, the attack landed there um, from Senator uh, Farrell. But lastly, Senator Farrell was championing the ending of foreign donations. Well, he knows as well as I do that there are so many back doors in that legislation that foreign companies can still donate through an Australian subsidiary, a loophole the Greens sought to close with our amendments to that bill. And I'll have to check the record, but I'd hazard a guess the Labor Party didn't support that amendment either. So again, I think you're, it's a bit rich to get lectures doled out from people that don't have very clean hands in this regard. Um, so with those, with those uh, offences addressed, I again commend these amendments to the Chamber. So the question is that the, are you seeking to call Senator Patrick? Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you. I just want to follow up on a couple of questions I asked the Minister yesterday. Um, uh, you might recall, Minister, I asked um, uh, what the burden difference was or, or how, you, how you justify not supporting um, uh, disclosure of donations above $1,000 versus uh, uh, above uh, $14,300, um, just to understand what the burden was. And you, you very, very helpfully, thank you, directed me to uh, section one, uh, 314 AEB of the Commonwealth Electoral Act. I uh, went and had a look at that last night, and it appears to me the only burden in terms of uh, making a donation above, uh, above the threshold is simply to fill in this form. And this form just requires you to put your name, your address, the political party you're donating to, and how much it is. I'm just wondering, is that the extent of the burden that you think uh, uh, justifies such a high threshold? Have I, or have I missed something? Minister. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, it also comes uh, with, uh, you know, obviously, um, risks, compliance risks if you make a mistake. It makes very small entities that are not geared up for this uh, uh, liable to uh, public exposure and potential. Uh, threats from um, other actors in in this process. Um, now, we, again, I mean, I've, I've said for um, consistently for some time now, we believe that the current uh, threshold is appropriate. Uh, and it's an appropriate balance between facilitating participation in a democratic process uh, while also uh, ensuring uh, the public interest of. Uh, appropriate disclosure is, is maintained. And uh, I mean, Senator Lambie quite accurately uh, related um, a, converse, a private conversation that I had with her earlier this week. Um, and you know, it's, just, it's just an observation of fact. Uh, small business people making small donations uh, to um, outside of politics uh, do feel intimidated uh, by uh, you know, some of the consequences that come as a result of that donation from other very passionate and committed actors supporting a different side of politics. And, um, you know, people that are uh, supporting their team or their party of choice um, at that level, we don't believe, uh, should be exposed uh, to that. People who uh, participate, you know, at a more significant level, of course, uh, they uh, need to be able to justify uh, you know what, what they do in a public sense, and there is the appropriate disclosure and transparency requirement there. But we believe that the threshold where it currently is is appropriate. Senator Patrick. Yeah. So thank you, Minister. Look, I appreciate um, that we don't want people threatened, uh, but it is a democracy, and the general principle in a democracy is we do have the ability to express our views, and uh, uh, I would think that authorities would clamp down pretty hard on someone who uh, 
uh, acted in a threatening way towards anyone who simply expressed their political view. Um, uh, so I really question your concern there. And in particular, when you talk about making a mistake on this form, um, it's pretty hard to mess up your name, your address, the political party, and the amount. I mean, that's the, you talk about risk. That that risk is so it must be so small that it's not. Uh, it couldn't, in any reasonable circumstance, be considered to be a burden. Uh, in any way, shape, or form, or is that? Uh, have, have I, I just don't want to verbal you in in some way, but that's that's what you've got to do. You've just got to fill in a form with some very simple details. And perhaps, Minister, you could tell me how many people have been uh, have been uh, brought to a court or to a tribunal on the basis that they, they didn't fill the form in right. Um, I will call the minister, but I'll also flag that Senator Hanson, I can see, is seeking the call. So I will call the minister to respond to Senator Patrick's question and then call Senator Hanson. Look, um, I, I think, Senator, I take that question on notice. I obviously have, don't have that sort of information to hand. I'll have to inquire with the Electoral Commission. Uh, I, I think I've um, answered uh, you know, all of the other questions. Um, I think that Senator Patrick and I, on behalf of the government, will just have to agree to disagree. We have a different. Uh, <coughs> view. Uh, we, we believe that uh, we need to appropriately balance uh, people's right to participate in the democratic process, including uh, by uh, supporting financially uh, the political party or the candidates uh, that they would like to see elected uh, at an election. Um, and um, it is important to have appropriate uh, transparency and disclosure arrangements in place. And we believe the current arrangements uh, work well and appropriately balance those two, uh, the, these two objectives. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson. Thank you, Madam Acting De um, Deputy President. Um, with regards to this bill, it has been raised, and they're talking about the donations under $14,000. One Nation is not going to change whether this bill gets passed or not because <clears throat> it has been agreed upon by both Liberal and Labor it will be passed. But with regards to when talking about under 14,000 donations and in reference to what Senator uh, Rex Patrick has said, I, um, unlike the majority of the people in the chamber, run my own political party and have done since 1997. The fact is that One Nation over the years has been tagged as a racist party with their policies that people don't, um, possibly don't want to be associated with the party, um, but support the party. And this happens in all political parties. When you actually put a donation in under $14,000, you have to, um, List your name, your address, or I may say over $14,000. If you put a donation in over that, you must list your name and address. A lot of people these days support political parties. That is their privacy. If they don't, if they donate $1,000 or $2,000, they can donate that, and it means that they don't have to disclose their name or address. A lot of people may work for organisations, even government departments. If it is seen that they have donated to a political party, they are in fear of losing their jobs. There is a lot of um, concern from these people. It is a privacy matter. It's like when they go to vote, no one knows how they vote. And it, but it is disclosed if they donate to a political party. So it is a privacy matter and it does concern a lot of people. Most of the donations that we get from One Nation, not from big donators, donations at all. It's the mums and dads. So those people who do support my policies, that I thank them for their donations, but they have a right to privacy. And if you reduce that amount under $14,000, these people will not be donating. In some small way, it enables us to do the job that we do to give them that um, representation in parliament by getting people elected to parliament. Do I agree with big donations from some of these companies and organisations and banks to the major political parties? No, I don't. I didn't agree with foreign donations to the Greens because I then question why would international donations be coming to the Greens in Australia unless to control their way of how they vote in this country. So there's been a lot of corruption that's happened over the years. Um, I just think that if the disclosure of over fourteen thousand dollars is at the right place. That's why I do not support the Greens amendment to to um, reduce um, the the disclosure to a thousand dollars. 
and I do question the Greens why they say in their amendment that they have no intentions of actually saying that people should show identification at polling booths. So that's, um, that's all I have to say on the matter. That's my reason behind why I don't support disclosure. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister? No, nothing to add. Uh, Senator Patrick. <clears throat> short uh, set of questions uh, before I conclude. Um, and it, just a follow up really f again from yesterday, but very directly related to the Greens amendment now. Yesterday I was talking about uh, dinner f functions that are held by major parties where people uh, are invited to attend a dinner with uh, a, a member of the party present and they pay substantial amounts of money uh, for the uh, opportunity to do that, several thousand dollars in, in, in most instances. And I was uh, discussing yesterday the, uh, um, uh, the arrangements in place for these things. And I just want to go back to the point I was making, and again, I'm not directing this at Senator Cormann because I think he's a lone fish in this pond, simply that he uh, has knowledge of his own circumstances. Um, uh, there surely must be a concern if you uh, invite people to attend a dinner uh, as, uh, uh, that, that will be uh, attended by the minister as opposed to the senator. In some sense you are drawing people into a room on the basis that you are a member of the executive to, uh, uh, to benefit the political party that sits behind that minister. And I know you understand the line uh, that I'm drawing, Minister. Uh, again, uh, what, what, are the, what are the policies in relation to uh, that sort of conduct? Um, and uh, ha have you ever been in a, uh, at a dinner where uh, the, the attendant or, or whether with a promotion of that dinner, uh, mention the fact that uh, the uh, attendees of the dinner would be meeting or dining with Minister Cormann or the Minister for Finance. Minister, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Chair. I mean, with the greatest of respect, I think we're going around in circles now because I've directly answered that question yesterday, and I will, this will be my final contribution. On, on this point because I've well and truly addressed it. I confirmed yesterday on the record and I confirm again uh, that uh, in all of my capacities uh, as a um, backbench senator, uh, a shadow uh, minister uh, and now as a minister, uh, I have uh, attended uh, a wide range of functions uh, including um, campaign related fundraising events. Uh, that is uh, part of uh, our job um, what guides, uh, you know, these, you know, clearly in, in these circumstances, uh, you know, what guides all of us. Uh, everything has to be lawful, and uh, as a minister, everything has to be done consistent with the requirements in the statement of ministerial standards. Uh, and I can indeed confirm uh, that at all times, um, any activity that I've been involved uh, in has been compliant with those requirements. Senator Patrick. Um, thank you, Minister, and thank you for directing me to this um, statement of ministerial standards. I will go and have a look at them, and I uh, reserve my right to, at some future stage, uh, raise this issue again. Thank you. Senator Waters. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, don't hold your breath on the ministerial standards through you, Chair. Senator Patrick, uh, as we know, they're not independently enforced. They're completely at the whim of the Prime Minister. I digress. Um, just on this issue that you've raised, that. Uh, Senator Co Minister Cormann uh, yesterday attempted to allay your concerns about, our, I think the issue remains when it comes to the markup on a function above the cost of the actual meal, it is actually a grey area under our existing electoral laws, which is precisely why our amendment seeks to clarify that a gift includes um, these such events. Because actually the grey area is, um, is not just us that think it's a grey area. The um, Electoral Commission, when I've previously asked them in estimates, have said, and I quote, 
The classic example we have is when a person attends a dinner where members of a political party or government may be present. Quite often the person who attended might regard it as a donation, while the recipient might regard it as other. That is one of the areas where the Act is not clear and it has been a long-standing issue. Again, it is something we attempt to address in the various guidelines that we publish on our website, but it is an issue. It's one of the reasons it is impossible to accurately match a particular donation with a particular receipt, because quite often there is not a meeting of the minds between the person who is making the payment and the recipient of the payment, end quote. Um, this is exactly why uh, lobster lunches keep happening and pay for access meetings uh, keep occurring and they're not transparently disclosed. Uh, we need to clarify what the rules are about when you've got to tell the public how much uh, someone paid to go out to lunch with you or dinner or whatever it is and what exactly they get for their money. I already referenced a few um, contributions that the Minerals Council makes and they get two boardroom events and two policy briefing sessions for their contribution of $25,000 to each of the larger political parties. Um, so this is exactly why we need an amendment, such as the one uh, that's before us right now by the Greens, to properly define gift to include not only party membership fees of over $1,000, because they're not included at the minute either, another convenient backdoor way of making extra donations, uh, but to actually ensure that any of those uh, subscriptions are disclosed. Um, so I don't accept that uh, Senator Cormann's view that this is already addressed by the electoral laws is, is a correct representation. It is not clear. We have a chance to put it beyond doubt. Um, so yeah, I hope that uh, addresses the, uh, any of the questions that Senator Patrick might have about the uh, dissatisfactory status of the current law. Thanks, Chair. Did the minister No. Um, are there any other questions on the amendment? Uh, Senator Waters. Yes, sorry, Chair. I neglected to say, just in response to Senator Hanson, just to confirm that the Greens have not received foreign donations, so I wanted to make sure the record um, was corrected there because uh, Senator Hanson has, has got that wrong. Um, and also I note her comments about lowering the disclosure threshold. Um, that was yesterday's amendment. As folk would know, the amendment that we're addressing at the minute is to cap donations to $1,000 um, and to ban donations from those industries that have sought to exert undue influence and to clarify that definition of gift so that we can't have these sort of shady pay for access um, occurrences continue. So just so everybody's clear, that's what we're voting on now. The disclosure threshold, which is Labor's policy that they voted against, happened yesterday. Thank you, Senator Waters. Um, I'm going to put the question that the amendments uh, as circulated on sheet 1003 be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. Um, the question is that the amendments be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint I appoint Senator Seward Teller for the eyes and Senator Polly Teller for the nose. Thank you for your indulgence.
The results of the division are ayes 7, noes 30. The question is therefore resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Electoral Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2020 and agreed to it with amendments. I call the minister. Uh, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The minister. Uh, I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill now be read a third time. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the bill be read a third time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McGrath, teller for the ayes, and Senator Seawitt, teller for the noes. The result of the division is eyes 30, noes 4. The question is therefore agreed to. Um. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to electoral matters and for related purposes. Thank you. Uh, I believe Senator Keneally was seeking the call. Yes, thank you, Madam Deputy uh, Acting President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of the Australian Citizenship Amendment Citizenship Cessation Bill 2020. I move that the message from the House of Representatives transmitting the Australians. I'm, I'm moving the motion. I'm actually reading the motion because it has not been circulated. I believe, uh, Senator Keneally, you. Are required to seek leave to move the motion. Are you seeking leave? I am seeking leave. Leave is denied. Leave is denied. Pursuant to contingent notice, standing in the name of Senator Wong, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, like namely to... a motion to give precedence to a motion relating to the consideration of the Australian Citizenship Amendment Citizenship Cessation Bill 2020. Madam Deputy Acting President, the government have indicated to the opposition that they want to see the citizenship cessation bill passed through the parliament before we leave this chamber this week. This is a bill that deals with terrorist conduct. This is a bill that is an important national security bill. It is an important piece of national security legislation dealing with terrorist conduct and the removal of citizenship from dual citizens who engage in terrorist conduct. This is an important tool in our national security apparatus to ensure that our national security agencies have the capacity and the ability to remove dual citizenship from those dual citizens who engage in terrorist conduct. This is a reform that is long overdue. The Independent National Security Legislation Monitor has recommended in unequivocal terms that the current model of citizenship lost, loss be immediately repealed and revoked, that the automatic loss of citizenship 
for dual citizens who engaged in terrorist conduct does not serve our national security interests. Those, that is the recommendation of the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor. It is also the advice of ASIO. ASIO has advised the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security that the current law does not always serve the national interest, that the current law does not always provide the best outcome from a national security perspective. Now, the government introduced this legislation some eight months ago to the House of Representatives. It went to a parliamentary joint, uh, an inquiry of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. The PJCIS delivered its report on Tuesday because the Minister for Home Affairs, Peter Dutton, had indicated to the opposition that it, the government would pass this legislation through the parliament this week, through both stages, through all stages in both chambers, because the government said it was incredibly important that we get this legislative reform done. Now, the opposition, the Australian Labor Party, supports this bill. We support this change, and we have at every juncture provided support to the government to facilitate the passage of this legislation. In the House of Representatives, we indicated that we would be willing to, dis to interrupt legislation to bring this legislation on. The government did not take us up on that offer. However, yesterday, the bill did pass through the House of Representatives. We now only have hours to go before we leave Canberra for weeks. We will not be back here until October. This legislative reform, which deals with terrorist conduct by dual citizens, that, that improves the process by which citizenship is taken away from Australian citizens who are dual citizens or have a right to citizenship in another country, the process by which they lose their citizenship is improved in a way that ASIO wants, that the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor requested, said it needed to be repealed and revoked and replaced with the decision-making model. This is an important piece of national security legislation. It is an important tool for our national security agencies in safeguarding the Australian community from those who would seek to do us harm. And by moving this suspension of standing orders, I send in the clearest possible terms a message to the Australian community and to members in this Senate that the Australian Labor Party stands ready to facilitate this legislation and ensure its passage through this chamber today so that we leave this parliament when we leave for, and I, I note that there is laughter on the other side, such as the disdain apparently some may have for our national security agencies and their legislation. What is serious about this bill is that the, the ASIO has said it is important that we get this done. So we are moving the suspension of standing orders to ensure that we have time in this chamber to debate and pass this important legislation. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Minister. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I've never seen uh, such a self-indulgent stunt wasting the Senate's time in my entire career in this, in this chamber. I have I got to tell you, in 30 and a half years in this chamber, that is the most self-indulgent, unproductive, waste of time stunt from anyone on any side. I mean, you really take the cake. I mean, and, you know, there's, there's been some big competition, I've got to tell you, but you really take the cake. Because this bill that, that uh, Senator Keneally wants to bring on now is the next bill after the one that we're about to debate. And you've now, you, you are wasting the Senate's time, you're wasting 30 minutes of the Senate's time when we could have dispatched uh, the, when we could have dispatched the payment uh, terms reporting bill and got into the Australian Citizenship Amendment, Citizenship Cessation Bill 2020, important national security related legislation, which we've introduced as our legislation, and we want it to be passed today. And you are standing in the way of it being passed today. You are delaying the work of the Senate. 
you through your games, your self-indulgent, embarrassing, wasting the Senate's time games. It's because it's all. Oh, look at me. Look at me. This is this is the approach of these senators. Oh, look at me. Look at me. I've got to, I've got to make myself relevant. I've got to get myself in the middle of this. I've got to I've got to make it look as if somehow I'm helping to facilitate this. Let me tell you. I doubt. I doubt that there will be many non-Labour senators that will be supporting this, and I suspect that Labour senators will only support uh, this stunt this stunt because they're bound by caucus rules. Um, otherwise, I'm, I, I, would be, I would be very interested. I would be very interested what Senator O'Neill, for example, thinks about uh, this particular self-indulgent stunt. I'm, I'm very interested in what some of these other uh, senators think about this self-indulgent stunt. The bill, the bill, the bill that uh, Sen Senator Keneally, Senator Keneally is disrupting the, pro the business of the Senate so that she can move the bill up one. In the, in the order of business. By one. By one. Like, you know, anybody who uh, watches the operations of the Senate knows that, of course, in the ordinary course of events, we were going to get to this today. We were able to pass it today. And if the Labour Party, and if the Labour Party really was serious about wanting to pass this, there is a constructive way to engage with the government. Absolutely. Namely, there's a constructive way to engage with the government in the way that, quite frankly, uh, we often do with the manager of uh, opposition business in the Senate, where, where, we can where we can put certain procedural arrangements in place to ensure that we don't leave uh, tonight unless and until uh, this particular legislation is passed. But you know what? We've got two important uh, pieces of legislation uh, to deal with. We've got the uh, payment, uh, payment Times Reporting Bill 2020 uh, and uh, the Consequential Amendment Bill that needs to be passed. And we need to, uh, of course, deal with our reform in relation to Australian citizenship uh, cessation arrangements. And this stunt by Senator Keneally has done nothing nothing whatsoever uh, to facilitate the passage or to accelerate the passage. All it has done is delay the passage, but the, what it has done, what it has done, of course, it has sort of put a spotlight uh, on Senator Keneally. Senator Keneally was hoping that it would put a positive uh, spotlight on her, but of course all it has done uh, is shown to everyone uh, that in these sorts of matters it is always about Senator Keneally herself personally. She wants to put herself into the limelight in a completely unproductive, in a completely unproductive fashion. We are now wasting 30 minutes of the Senate's time uh, because, because of uh, this sort of completely unproductive and unnecessary attempt uh, to disrupt the business of the Senate. Oh, sorry, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, the Greens are not going to facilitate uh, this suspension for, uh, for the very simple reason that we do not support the bill. We do not support the legislation. We don't want it brought forward because we don't want it to pass. So while we were about to vote with the government on this suspension, the reasons for the position that we are taking are very different from the reasons that the government is taking. And I just want to give uh, a very short. Uh, I want to take a very short opportunity to explain uh, why it is that we don't support this legislation. Because under uh, this bill, the threshold for depriving dual nationals of citizenship on national security grounds will be lowered and there are inadequate protections provided to reduce and prevent the likelihood of people being made stateless. This legislation, should it pass, will mean that with the stroke of a pen, the minister will be able to render people stateless. So Labor is suggesting uh, that its, uh, its approach is uh, in support of human rights, but make no mistake, because this bill will lower the threshold for determining dual citizenship and will provide inadequate protections against statelessness, this bill is actually contrary to Australia's human rights obligations. There is diminished judicial review. There is no merits review of ministerial decisions that may make people stateless, and this legislation is inconsistent with Australia's international legal and human rights obligations. So we're not going to facilitate this suspension, and even though we will be voting on the same side of the chamber as the government, it is for very different reasons. 
Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Look, just um, very briefly, uh, in response to um, the Leader of the Government's um, outburst to this suspension motion, it was uh, you know, our view and uh, shared by the government as we understood it that this bill should be dealt with this uh, sitting session. Uh, we are in the last hours of this. Well, if you if you'd taken a look at the speaking list for the payment times bill, you would see that the payment times, including the amendments, would take us up to 11:45, the hard marker, and um, we were giving the opportunity for the government to agree that this should be prioritised above that, dealt with, and then move into payment times to make sure we got this done before other uh, matters before the Senate today. That was the idea of Senator Keneally. That was the reason she moved this today. It's pretty straightforward. If the government wants this done and wants it guaranteed to be done, this would be a sensible way of timetabling the program. We think there is a risk that it won't be done because the payment times does have a lot of speakers. There are amendments and it could take us up to the hard marker. So that was the reason we did it. Quite sensible. I don't think it needed that kind of response uh, from the government, frankly, particularly on a bill that they want done. And, and we, we would have just a few minutes to deal with it, reorder the program and get on with it. Minister. Minister, interjections are disorderly. There being no other speakers, I put the motion moved by Senator Keneally. Those, all those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
what I'll do is yeah. stop the bells, but I'll give the whips a moment. Just hide behind the screen because you're not allowed out.
question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Keneally, my memory serves, um, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McCarthy, tell her for the ayes, Senator McGrath, tell her for the noes, and I thank senators for their understanding. The result of the division is ayes 11, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the negative. We return to business. I'll call the clerk. Government business order of the day number two, payment times reporting bill 2020 and a related bill. Second reading debate. I'll just give senators a little bit of time to move to their seats or to leave the chamber. Senator Griff. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Look, I rise to speak on the Payment Times Reporting Bill 2020. I have spent a career working in and with small businesses, and I understand how important they are for local economies and the national economy, and how difficult it can be to run a small business. And let me tell you, cash flow matters. It doesn't matter how good you are at what you do. If your customers don't pay on time, you simply cannot survive with a small business. For small business people, landing a contract with a large firm feels like you've made it. It gives you a kind of security that you don't have with other contracts. Security that you've got a buyer for your products. Security that you have money coming in. Security that you can pay the salaries of the workers who are depending on you. But once that feeling passes, and believe me, that feeling passes generally very quickly, you learn that a contract with a large firm can also give you a very high degree of insecurity. If one customer is a quarter or half of your business, you are completely dependent on them. If they drop you or scale back, you have to let go of employees or you might even have to shut up shop. When you're dependent on one big customer and they tell you that they're not going to pay their bills right away, you're absolutely in no position to argue or to renegotiate with them at all. They are the ones that hold all of the power. Now, this bill will require those big customers to publicly report on their payment terms and their actual payment periods for their small business customers, and that very much is a good thing. At the very least, this will allow small businesses to check out the practices of potential larger customers and decide if they're willing to take on that exposure. And of course, small businesses will 
still take on that exposure regardless because they would see it as uh, representing a, a, a large chunk of their business. Now, it's going to be a useful tool for many business people. Um, the government also says that the register will create an incentive for large businesses to improve their payment performance. Now, I'm somewhat sceptical about this um, you know, for a number of reasons, but I do hope that in the end that will actually be a, be a, be a benefit to small businesses. The reason large businesses can push around small businesses is because there are plenty of small business suppliers, but only a small number of large uh, customers in any market. Now that's what gives the big players market power, and unless those power dynamics change, there won't be many big players changing their payment performance. Transparency alone will do little to make things better. Indeed, my main concern with this bill is that transparency may actually make things worse for some small businesses, particularly those in concentrated markets like the banks, petrol stations, supermarkets and telecommunications. For big businesses, the register will allow them to see the payment terms of their competitors, which is something I think very few people have thought about. And it will allow some of the better performers to scale back their payment terms in a race to the bottom that can only hurt small business. Unfortunately, I don't see a way around this to amend these bills so that we can capture the benefit of transparency without incurring the harm. Now, the benefits outweigh those harms, so Centre Reliance will be supporting this legislation, but reluctantly. We would encourage government to look at this as one step in a journey towards making life easier for small business people. This means adopting some of the other recommendations of the Small Business Ombudsman such as the regulation of the use of supply chain finance products. But more than anything, we need to find ways of dealing with the market power enjoyed by too many large businesses in Australia. Market power hurts small businesses, but it also hurts consumers and employees. If the government is serious about a productivity-based recovery, market power itself is where they need to focus. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator, there being no other speakers. Sorry, we'll just sort out what Senator Davy, you're the next speaker. Sorry. Uh, Hanson Young, your mic wasn't on. Can you just draw the attention to the state of the chamber? Uh, quorum required? Quorum required? Yep, bring the bills.
Stop the bells. Quorum is reached. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Payment Times Reporting Bill. Um, I, I note that uh, on the 28th of November 2018 at the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry Annual Dinner, the Prime Minister announced as part of a strategy to assist smaller businesses that cash flow measures would be introduced. He said, and I quote, Cash flow always starts with getting paid. If the invoices you issue are not being paid, that hurts your business. That makes it harder for your business. Businesses, smaller businesses, should never be treated as a bank by governments or large businesses. We should all pay on time. He then spoke of the government's track record on payments and plans to get Commonwealth payments down to 20 days, something he clearly expected to flow further into the supply chain uh, when he said that. So, you know, when the government plays primes, we want to make sure that a uh, uh, more quicker payment makes its way to smaller business. And he said this, what we have said is that anyone who wants to work with the Commonwealth Government, you've got to agree to those terms as well. You've got to pay business on time, because the quicker the money moves around, the better the economy does. It's just common sense, so we're working to deliver that. We're also requiring that more businesses uh, with a $100 million turnover, that's 3,000 businesses, to publish information on how they pay their small uh, businesses. I want to see the scoreboard. You need to see the scoreboard if you're a small or a family business. Who are the big businesses that pay on time? So, uh, all good words that were coming from the Prime Minister, and I note that the, the number has now changed in respect of reporting. We do need to make sure uh, that we move to a situation uh, where the, uh, uh, you're not in a position to get a government contract if you don't pay on time. And I have written to Minister Cormann recently about uh, this because it's within his portfolio responsibility, and, and he assures me that uh, the government is, is, is moving down uh, that particular pathway, although, in my view, not quick enough and, in uh, Kate Carnell's view, not quick enough as well. The, general, the, the federal government generally does pay well. Um, the old system directs uh, suppliers uh, uh, to supply within uh, uh, 30 to 45 days. Now, I note Defence, for example, has really stepped this up during COVID and are paying suppliers between two and seven days, but not always. So we've got some good things that are coming in respect of government making payments on time, and I congratulate them. But I do throw out this concern. Whilst the government is paying people very quickly uh, uh, in, uh, as a result of COVID, defence companies, large defence companies very quickly, uh, and that initially started with very short payment times to the small businesses. That has uh, apparently turned around, and so I just draw the government's attention to the fact that whilst they're doing the right thing, some large defence contractors are not. Uh, so that kind of frames us up in terms of where this bill uh, lands in the Senate today. There are there is other stuff the government's doing. Uh, so I could sit here and say. Uh, you're not doing enough. You're not going uh, fast enough. And I think they, those words uh, are true. Uh, but uh, at least you are looking at the problem. Now, Kate Carnell, the small business om om ombudsman, said in February this year, late payments by large businesses to small businesses account for 53% of all invoices. That's $115 billion paid late to small businesses equivalent to seven billions of, uh, of uh, working capital to Australian small businesses every year. So this is really important legislation, focusing on re reporting payment times to small businesses with a turnover of more than $10 million. So whilst I'll be supporting this, uh, this legislation, I will also be supporting Labor's amendments that place legal obligations on companies to pay small businesses on time. The time has come to stop large businesses uh, using small companies as banks. That is just not an acceptable proposition. It causes great harm. It causes great stress to business owners, as Senator Griff was uh, uh, talking about. It causes 
uh, uh, companies to not have the, the cash flow to grow their own businesses. It's effectively removing money from out of, uh, uh, out of local economies, and that is simply uh, not acceptable. And I want to uh, use this opportunity to, to uh, present uh, a particular concern that I have, uh, and uh, this is something that uh, uh, the people of uh, small business of, of Wyala have talked to me on a number of occasions. I've been up to Wyala talking about this issue uh, in December 2018, again in January 2019, April 2019, June 2019, November 2019, March 2020, and August. Uh, uh, 2020. So just recently, um, uh, I was up uh, visiting my brother in Wyala and took the opportunity to talk to um, talk to uh, local businesses again. There's a problem up there, and the problem relates to the, the the steelworks. Now, the steelworks up there have been in significant financial difficulty for years. Uh, it was given a potential lifeline. Uh, in 2017, when British billionaire Sanjeev Gupta brought the steelworks and unveiled a multi-million dollar redevelopment. And much of this is, is, uh, is, is still to happen. Now, as part of the uh, arrangement—and people will remember there was a, a, a fairly uh, serious crisis on our hands because if indeed uh, the wireless steelworks to, were, to, were to close, it would basically bring the city to its knees. Um, you, we might recall that uh, uh, Mark Mentha was, was engaged as the administrator and we saw orig uh, originally uh, Mr Mentha making a uh, decision for uh, a South Korean company to take over the Wireless Steelworks. Uh, that didn't work out and Mr Gupta um, stepped in. And generally he's well regarded uh, around town. Uh, although there is some of that regard is, is wearing off. Uh, as part of the uh, arrangements that were put in place, the South Australian government made a funding commitment uh, that was then Labor, and I note that uh, the current treasurer, Mr Rob Lucas, the Honourable Rob Lucas, said that he would honour that commitment. Uh, there are conditions associated with it. Now, in the meantime, what's, what's happening is Mr Gupta is travelling around the world and he's buying up uh, a, a whole range of steel-related industries, many of them that are in distress. But while he's doing that, he's leaving people in Wyala unpaid. Good businesses run by good people carrying out good work, either producing good products or providing good services. He's, uh, he's contracting them, they carry out the work, uh, and then they don't get paid on, on time. And his payment terms are quite uh, lengthy already, but he's not meeting those. And Mr Gupta, as much as I support you in terms of uh, your ambitions for Wyala, you will see no one uh, standing closer to you when you uh, advocate for support for your plans because it will transform Wyala from a city of 22,000 to a city of 80,000, and, and uh, you know, it will be the cause of dual carriageways all the way to Wyala. We'll see desalination plants. We'll see 737s flying in and out of Wyala from uh, Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne. And I did talk about this uh, uh, on Tuesday night, and, and indeed in previous uh, speeches. Very important. I absolutely support what Mr. Gupta is planning for Wyala, but you can't continue to do what you are doing to the businesses of Wyala. There's uh, well over a million dollars owed to, owed to small businesses in, in Wyala, and it is causing great distress. And remember that many of these businesses were. Uh, receiving the same treatment as, uh, as, as uh, they are receiving now when Arium were running the company. So it's been, it's been a long-term uh, uh, hard slog for these people. Now, it's lucky we have uh, tough people in steel towns, but it's not good enough and we have to do something about it. And uh, it, you know, I, I want uh, GFG to succeed, but they have to be good corporate citizens, and right now they are not. 
and it is unacceptable. And Mr Gupta, you need to step up. You need to, to pay. B big businesses are much better positioned to predict their cash flow. They can see what money is coming in and what is coming out. And they should never put themselves in a position uh, where they uh, place an order on a small business with the knowledge that they simply won't be able to pay that, uh, that provider. And then what we see in many instances, because these businesses are distressed, um, uh, they're in a, a distressed state, uh, these companies then often come up to, uh, to the smaller business and say, and say, well, you need to trim your price as well. If you want to get paid on time, you need to trim your price and we'll give you a, uh, we'll give you a guarantee that you'll get paid on time. It's just totally unacceptable conduct. Um, it's an, it's a, in some sense, it's a bit of a sad indictment that we have to legislate like we are today. And I support the idea that uh, we should be reporting companies that are not paying on time. I think when you shine a light on things, often you get improvements. They say the people who operate in the, the thing that people who operate in dark places fear the most is light. So we do need to shine a light on some of these companies that are simply doing the wrong thing. And that's why this bill is important. But I think we need to go a step further. We need to, uh, uh, to uh, push forward with punitive measures uh, where businesses do not comply with uh, payment times. And remember, these payment times are an agreement between two parties, between the large business and the small business. No one forces anyone to do this. And so uh, one expects that you go into uh, these, these arrangements in good faith, in good conscience, and that uh, provided one party meets their side of the, the, uh, the agreement, the other party must uh, also meet theirs. So I uh, uh, support this bill, but I also support what Labor are trying to do uh, with this, and that is to make sure that there are penalties associated with businesses, who, large businesses who don't conduct their business in a conscionable fashion. I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of the Payment Times Report Bill and consequential amendments. In my previous life at the Transport Workers Union of Australia, the largest organisation representing small businesses in Australia, namely the thousands of owner drivers in the country, I frequently dealt with the ongoing issue of payment delays. The committee reviewing this bill heard evidence that 98 per cent of, truck, of trucking operators are small or family businesses. Many operate with tight margins, often under incredible pressure, with high upfront costs, ongoing debt and unsafe working conditions. These conditions are made all the worse by the repeated behaviour of retail and mining clients at the top of the supply chain who are pushing out payment times, often resulting in these small businesses waiting 60, 90, 120 days plus. Truck drivers are not like, are not like truck drivers and their companies are not like publicly listed companies. They cannot borrow at the rates the larger companies can. They cannot sell equities or issue debt bonds when they are in, not paid a time. When the client at the top of the supply chain, often a company with millions of dollars in financial and legal assets behind them, decides not to pay. What recourse does the contractor or owner-operator have? What recourse does this bill propose to allow them? Nothing. The bill will require companies with turnovers greater than $100 million to twice yearly report how regularly they pay their companies and contractors. We understand that would be roughly 3,000 Australian businesses, which is a drop in the ocean of the number of companies that need to be held to account for payment times. The government's Zero 2019 report that prompted the bill estimated that late payments from big businesses cost our small businesses up to $7 billion a year. We know from the 2016 research by Dun & Bradstreet Australia 
that large companies in Australia can be 20 per cent slower in paying their bills than smaller companies. The Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman in 2017, inquiring into payment times and practices, found that average agreement payment times in Australia were 26 days late. Only significantly large companies that regularly pay late, creating cash flow problems for small businesses, will be under this bill, effectively named and shamed for their behaviour. This bill is a positive step in that regard, but one that will create some minimal transparency around this practice. However, where this bill fails is that it relies entirely on this name and shaming tactic to drive change. Similar policy, uh, programs in other parts of the world has fundamentally failed. This bill can really be described as a no help, no harm bill. It provides no actual help to small business and provides no harm to the larger businesses who do the wrong thing. The bill does not mandate nor enforce maximum payment times. Instead, this government is relying on companies to have an ounce of shame or regret in how they treat others in their supply chain. It is really optimistically, as always, a corporate self, as corporate self-regulation is. As the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, Ms Carnell, told the committee that reviewed this bill, and I'm quoting the report, some large firms simply ignore bad publicity about their practices. That's why Labor will be proposing its own amendments to this bill to provide a fail-safe against late payments. An amendment that will deliver greater financial security and certainty to small business. While those in the opposite often trumpet they are the party of small business, when it comes to actually ensuring fairness for small businesses, the Liberal Party instead sides with the largest of companies. As for the Nationals, I hope they will follow suit in the spirit of the great Nationals Senator John Williams, who backed the 30-day maximum payment system. In some markets and industries, Small businesses cannot shop around to, for, their, for other clients or other work because the market power held by the top of the supply chain. Moreover, naming and shaming businesses with bad payment times will likely do nothing to stop the market power exercised by these firms, and that's the experience overseas. Small businesses already know which companies are good or bad operators. If Aldi built a reputation for not paying contractors or small businesses in its supply chain on time, does that erode any of its market power to set rates in the supply chain and continue its practice? The answer is, of course, not. This bill on its own will do nothing to prevent these companies from running roughshod over smaller operations. This bill, in its current form, will also do nothing about the disturbing trend of supply chain financing, where small businesses are forced to engage a third-party financier to pay invoices owed to them, often for free. A process that sees desperate small businesses at their wits' end taken advantage of by these financiers, essentially payday lenders for small business, losing money in order to pay, be paid on time. Big businesses and companies that never seem to have a problem paying their executive bonuses or their shareholder dividends, for some reasons, can rarely be bothered to pay those in their supply chain on time. The practice of supply chain financing is unacceptable and a byproduct of this government's failure to curb the practice. There are 3.4 small businesses in Australia, many suffering the consequences of intermittent cash flow due to a delay in payment times. Instead of telling them that they are what they already know, instead this government could take decisive action and mandate a maximum 30-day payment, a mandate that should not result in companies that pay in less than 30, 30 days pushing out their payment times, but instead one that ensures companies practice payment times that treat others in their supply chain fairly. A 30-day maximum payment mandate is a proposal backed by the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, the Institute of Public Accountants, Self-Employed Australia and a rare moment of unity, the Australian Trucking Association. As the ATA made clear in their submission on this bill, late payments are a chronic problem in the road transport industry, and there is a great deal the government could do. However, I will not hold my breath because it was this government and only one Prime Minister ago 
that abolished the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal. The tribunal was brought in because the client economic pressure at the top of the supply chain is overwhelmingly the biggest factor contributing to the high rates of injuries and deaths and collapsed companies in the trucking industry. And poor payment terms are one of many features of this gross economic power that are strangling the transport supply chain. This was the finding of the National Transport Commission 2008 report, and I quote, the, and I quote Overwhelmingly weight of evidence indicates that commercial industrial practices affecting road transport play a direct and significant role in causing hazardous practices. A finding that had been confirmed by countless inquiries, reviews, reports, including coroner's reports. Legislating the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal was a shining achievement of the Gillard government, who took action to support the tens of thousands of small businesses operating in the road transport industry. The tribunal's first order, yes, the very first order, issued on December, the 20, uh, December 2019, mandated 30-day payments. And if this government had not abolished the tribunal in 2016, 30-day payment times would be the law of the road transport industry. Countless small businesses might not have been gone bankrupt waiting for payment of their invoices. Drivers would have been able to maintain their vehicles and not suffer the indignity of injury or, of course, the tragedy for their families and friends of death. The government abolished that tribunal and replaced it with nothing, and they're replacing it with nothing now. It repealed a body that was promoting safety, ensuring small businesses were paid on time and replaced with nothing. In preparation for this speech, I reached out to industry leaders, including Peter Anderson of the Victorian Transport Association and Hugh McMaster of the New South Wales RTO, Australian Road Transport Industry Organisation and the Transport Workers Union, and asked them questions about late payments. I was informed of eight companies surveyed in the last 24 hours that they have 23 invoices already 60 days late on payment, of six invoices 45 days late, of two invoices 90 days late, and five invoices that are now 120 days late, all from clients that are major companies that are serviced by tra the transport industry and many of them servicing multinationals. Some of them even have the audacity to ask the discounts in exchange for improved payment times, let alone being paid on time. This is the state of the industry post the repeal of the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal. Frank Black, a representative for owner drivers and contributing to a 2017 report, Macquarie University Associate Professor Louise Thornwaite and University of New South Wales, Dr Sharon O'Neill. Frank Black went on to describe the effect of repealing the, tri repealing the tribunal. Things are going backwards and the pressure on drivers is growing. The government can't be surprised at the high rate number of deaths and injuries on our roads. In the Small Business Ombudsman September 2016 review into the RSRT, they examined the issue of payment times and terms and talked to owner-operators in the industry. One driver remarked, BP required me to pay my fuel bill at least fortnightly, but I can wait up to four months to be paid for my work. This means I often have to pay for fuel with a credit card. Another driver pointed out that cash flow is the most important weapon with small businesses. It ensures accounts are paid on time, financial security. Many large companies are pushing their payment times out to 60 and 90 days. No one can survive with these sorts of terms. Fuel, wages, superannuation all have to be paid within a 30-day period. These drivers raise an important point. There is one practice for small business and another for their clients. Small business cannot afford to miss payments for, from their, to their suppliers. Delays can put them out of business. All the while, the clients ones that market power is in supply, has the market power in supply chains can do what they want. Transport companies are not price makers. They are price takers. They are at the mercy of the client's gross economic power. As an official of the TWU for 30 years, I've heard what the pressure 
could sounds like. It's the pressure struggling to make ends meet, while an owner-operator goes 100 days without payment for his or her work. It's the postponing of overdue maintenance on your vehicle in order to make those ends meet. It's burning the midnight oil driving through the night to make an extra delivery, to make an extra run, to earn just a little more. And it's the sound of carnage on our roads. Since the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal was abolished, there have been some 706 deaths from accidents involving heavy vehicles. While passing this bill won't do any harm, if the government is serious about addressing payment times, to improve fairness for businesses at the mercy of powerful clients, to stop the callous practices of those at the top of the transport supply chains, and to ease the financial pressures that contributed to deaths on our roads, then the government should listen to the industry, listen to the drivers, and listen to the opposition and support our amendments. I've said, as I've said before, and I've reached out to the nationals in particular, and I will re Re, uh, incarnate in the senatorial terms, Wacker Williams, Senator Williams, get off your backside, do the right thing, and turn around and support small businesses in your regions and in your towns. Yes, many of them are trucking businesses, but many of them are in those supply chains and those real retailers, those ruthless operators that are non mandated requirements on codes, non arbitration is screwing every day of the week. Stand with all of us, stand with the opposition, and most importantly, stand with your constituency. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to um, just align myself with the comments and the contribution that Senator Sheldon has just made. I rise too to speak on the Payment Times Reporting Bill 2020 and Payment Times Reporting Consequential Amendments Bill 2020. And I want to say from the outset that without amendments to this bill, and specifically the Payment Times Reporting Scheme, this bill should not be supported. The Payment Times Reporting Bill introduces a new Payment Times Reporting Scheme, which requires approximately 3,000 large businesses and government enterprises with annual turnover of $100 million and above to publicly report biannually on their payment terms and practices for their small business suppliers. It's an important piece of legislation if we are to get Australia moving again. After all, businesses, and in particular small businesses, are the backbone of Australia's economy and Labor understands the policy to ensure these small businesses are supported is an important work of government. And there is no more important time than right now as we are emerging out of the health pandemic and the economic recession that we have found ourselves in. Small businesses in Tasmania are the backbone of our state's economy. There's over 40,000 businesses in our community, and 95 per cent of those small businesses employing, on average, between 1 and 19 employees. These businesses are made up of local people, which deserve our support because we are a close-knit community that supports one another. As we emerge from this crisis, it is crucial we support local small businesses in our cities, suburbs and regions. And it would be really good if the Department of Finance, for instance, was to ensure the payment of electorate office accounts are paid in a more timely manner, because many of those are local small businesses. The objective of the scheme outlined in the bill is to improve payment outcomes for small businesses by creating transparency around payment practices of large business entities. The government argues that by providing access to information on large business payment performance, small businesses will be able to make a more informed decision about potential customers. The government argues that greater transparency on payment practices and performance will also create pressure for cultural change to improve payment times. The opposition agrees. Now, the government chaired Senate Standing Committee on 
Education and Employment handed down its report on 30 July, recommending passage of the bill with additional recommendations of a statutory review after two years. The report included additional comments by Labor senators that drew attention to the majority of witness testimonies to the Senate committee arguing that the bill will not have a tangible effect on reducing payment times from large businesses to small businesses. As stated Mr. President, earlier, without amendments to this bill and specific changes to the payment times reporting scheme, this bill should simply not be waived through. As noted by Labor senators, the Payment Times Reporting Scheme is, in reality, a transparency initiative to support self-regulation. The efficiency of self-regulatory regime is usually poor to questionable unless backed by a genuine threat of heavy-handed regulation. In principle, the transparency regime should be given a limited time to demonstrate its efficiency. However, Labor senators are of the belief that complementary backup measures are necessary to ensure the payment times reporting scheme improves general payment times to small businesses. The committee's evidence was consistent. Most witnesses argued for mandated 30-day payment times or clarification that the object of the bill was to achieve payment times of 30 days or less. These witnesses were not any old witnesses. They were witnesses of those opposite should be listening to. You don't reform without consultation with the sector or with the Australian people. That is when policy fails, something this government just doesn't understand because they don't like to hear an argument that they don't agree with. Now, these stakeholders included Australian small businesses and family enterprises ombudsman, Australian Trucking Association, the Institute of Public Accounts, Self-Employed Australia and Chartered Accountants, Australia and New Zealand. These are informed witnesses that deal with these practices every day. We know the world over that self-regulation does not work and certainly business is not going to start self-regulating now during a global pandemic when budgets are weakening, investment is low, business confidence is low, wages are stagnating, and they were before the pandemic, and many people find themselves in insecure work, which has only increased due to the pandemic and the government's policies. Labor supports accountability and transparency measures, but without them, we cannot support these bills. So we're urging you, the government, the crossbench and the nationals, and the Nationals come into this chamber day in, day out, talking about regional Australia. Well, they should be standing with us and supporting our amendments. That will be in the interest of small businesses around the country, but particularly important to regional areas of this country and to my home state of Tasmania. Now, the Payment Times failsafe mechanism is intended to provide an incentive for reporting entities to collectively improve their payment practices or run the risk of more stringent regulation by introducing the following features. The regulator is required to report to the minister after each reporting period after the first three reporting periods on the medium and average times taken by all reporting entities to pay small businesses invoices. The reports are tabled in both houses of parliament. The payment times failsafe mechanism is triggered if after the first six reporting periods, the medium of medium times reporting by all reporting entities to pay small business invoices for a reporting period is more than 30 days. The regulator must report these factors to the minister. Now, we have talked in this chamber over the last two weeks that we've been here about the true impact of the pandemic, both from a health point of view and an economic point of view. We've seen the recent figures, which have unfortunately seen us plummet into recession. So we've stopped the last 29 years of growth in this country has now been set aside for the worst recession 
that I've seen in my lifetime. And a lot of that rests with this government and the decisions that they've been making. So firstly, they should be supporting our amendments. Secondly, they should be ensuring that as government agencies are using the best practices by ensuring that they pay their accounts within that 30-day period, because many of them, as I've outlined before, are to small business as well as for larger businesses. If we are to do this and work together, then we will see better practices throughout the country. But the first instance is that those opposite, the government should be supporting our amendments if they truly want to make this bill uh, work more effectively and to see that transparency. If they won't support it, then we are again calling on the nationals to do the right thing. And it was really interesting uh, to hear Senator Sheldon's contribution by referring back to the former Senator Wacker Williams. He was a straight shooter. He knew what was needed in regions uh, around the country and in his home state. So I'm calling on those from the nationals to get with the program and support our amendments. Order. Senator Roberts, we have remotely for a few minutes. If he's there, he's not. I will then go to Senator Lambie. There are no speakers. I think, uh, yeah, I think we're here. I think we've got. Um, if there are no speakers on this bill, I've sort of left. It, I, I need to call the minister to close the debate. Thank you. Um, I'll just jump into okay. a contribution. In that case, I call the minister. Uh, I'd like to thank all senators that have made contributions to the debate. Uh, as noted, uh, by many late payments has assumed negative impacts on small business and produced flow on effects throughout the economy, and that is why I now commend the bill to the Senate. The question is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark. Payment Times Reporting Bill 2020, Payment Times Reporting Consequential Amendments Bill 2020. There are yes, there amendments are. to ah, Well, in that case, for the space of a minute and 20 seconds, I need someone else to take the chair. We're going to a committee stage. Um, I Senator Polly, can you take the chair for a minute until 11.45? Thank you very much. I'm always here when you need me, Chris. Okay. Okay. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam chair at this point in time. Uh, I am going to be moving the government amendments, and if I have them in front of me, that would actually assist. Um, I will move the government amendments on sheet RS116, and I will also table the supplementary memorandum, which also will be appearing shortly, I understand, and will be tabled. And uh, in the final 20 seconds uh, that I have, uh, before can I just ask that the chamber, if it's agreed that you move those together, those that people say aye, those against, minister. It, it is now 12:45. I now report to the chamber. The committee reports progress. Being 12.45, thank you, Senator Polly. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Seawitt, you're seeking the call? I am. I give notice that I will soon be into, uh, tabling a, a motion or introducing a motion um, around uh, job seeker. Thank you. Are there any other notices of motion? There uh, being none, president. is there a report uh, from the— no. Oh, sorry, Senator Waters. Yeah, thanks, President. Um, just in case the email wasn't quite sent in time, I give notice that on the next day of sitting, uh, I'll be uh, introducing a motion noting the one year anniversary of the passage of a federal ICAC bill, um, a Greens bill, and sadly no action on the government from that yet. Are there any other notices of motion? 
There being none, I shall move on. Is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President, there is. I present the eighth report of the 2020 8th report of 2020 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that the report be adopted. Thank you. Um, now, I have a series of amendments. Senator Dunningham. Uh, I move the following amendment. At the end of the motion, add, and in respect of the provisions of the National Commissioner for Defence and Veteran Suicide Prevention Bill 2020 and related bill, the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Report on 30 November 2020. So I have that amendment. Um, Senator Lambie, it's been flagged with me that you might have an amendment to that amendment with a different date. Am I correct? Senator Lambie. Uh, I do, uh, Mr President, at the end of the motion add, but in respect but in but in respect to the provisions of the National Commission of Defence and Veteran Suicide Prevention Bill 2020 and Veteran Suicide Pre Prevention Con Consequential Amendments Bill 2020, the Foreign Affairs and Defence Trade Legislation Committee report on the 28th, 24th of April 2021. Okay, so I'm going to, absent any debate, put the amendment. Senator Cormann. Well, you can speak to the debate, seconds. Senator Cormann. Oh, okay. Yep. Well, essentially, I just. Uh, want to uh, advise uh, the chamber that the government will be supporting a referral of that legislation if the reporting date is 30 November 2020, because we do want to, uh, the Senate to have the opportunity to uh, deal with this very important bill before the end of the year so that the, um, this very important legislation can be passed by the end of the year. Uh, we don't think that a reporting date next year is appropriate because it would delay the establishment of uh, this very important standing commission with the powers of a royal commission. And I would also like to announce on behalf of the government uh, that uh, we uh, intend to make an announcement in relation to the appointment of a uh, commissioner during the month of September. Senator Lambie, you wish to speak to your amendment? Oh, I do. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, look, it's as simple as this. You are going to put an interim commissioner in early this year. We are still waiting for you to do that. You are now having decided that we still do not know who the new interim commissioner is. We are now sitting in September. We've got no idea what you are doing, who it is, no terms of reference. You've got a real problem here. So what we're asking is when that is done is if we can overview that and have an inquiry in what you're going through. I can tell you. You are the same government that still has not responded to the recommendations of the Productivity Commission. What is wrong with you people? So my thought is this. The only way you could come up with this is two ways. You are going and you are using information from the exact same people who are, who are pushing these veterans to suicide. That is the Department of Defence and the Department of Veterans Affairs. I can tell you now. The Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, I have sat on that, those inquiries for the veterans' suicide and the veterans' health. I have sat on those with some of your senators and watched them in tears over the years. And you want to rush this through? If this was so important to you, if this was so important to you, why are we six months later and there's no interim commissioner? Why is that? What sort of games are you playing with these lives? What sort of do you think that we can do this in a month? Nobody in their right mind can do this in a month. You are being very unfair and very unjust to these veterans, and you know you are. And the only thing stopping you is, you know what's stopping you? Is because you, you know what? You could be doing this. You could be doing this, you and the Prime Minister, sticking your chest out at me because you, I won't give you what you want, and those veterans are paying that price. How can you do that to them? How can you do that? One month is not going to cut it, and you know it, unless you've already got this all down on paper. Have you got this down on paper? That would be the question, and you already have. No discussion with anybody that actually cares and is heavily involved in this about who the interim commissioner is. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. And quite frankly, today you should be ashamed of yourselves. 
They're going to know what you were up to. But one month? One month? One month? Who's the interim commissioner? Where is he? Where's, where's this magic man? You know what? Is he coming to the inquiry? If it's so important, why wasn't this commissioner put in six months ago? Why wasn't he? If you really care about these veterans, why wasn't he? If you really care, where's your response to the, re to the Productivity Commission? Where is all that? I mean, this is even beneath you. This is just absolutely disgusting that you think someone can do this in just over a month. My God. My God. There is no way you can do this in just over a month. There is no way. You are kidding yourself. I bet the interim commissioner's a mate. I bet he's a mate. Yeah, I bet he is. He'll be a mate of yours. Well, as long as that interim commissioner, if he's a mate of yours, if he doesn't do the right thing, I'll be riding him from day one. And God help you. God help you. These veterans are suicidal because you're part of it over there. You've been mucking around with their lives for years. You've been doing this. You just throw them around like they're... They can be used and abused like they're some bloody regimental number and not a human being. It's absolutely shameful of you people today. If you actually gave a stuff about these veterans, you would leave this until April and take my amendment. It's your darkest day yet when it comes to these veterans. You are shameful. The question is, um, Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I urge the government to reconsider its position, give time for this committee to conduct its work, uh, give uh, time for the appointment of the interim commissioner, uh, let the inter interim commissioner get uh, his or her, her head around uh, the issue, such that they can also appear before the inquiry. Uh, it's an important inquiry, and uh, we should give it the time it needs. Now the question is. We have two amendments before the chair, and I will put them in the reverse order they were moved, because I will interpret Senator Lambie's amendment as pushing out the reporting date of the government's amendment. My advice from the clerk. So, Senator Lambie's amendment, the government's amendment is for the 30th of no, reporting date of 30th of November this year. Senator Lambie's amendment is for the 24th of April next year. So, those in favour of Senator Lambie's amendment and the reporting date of the 24th of April 2021 say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. The, no, the noes have it. That division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is the amendment of Senator Lambie be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 25. The amendment is therefore negatived. I understand, before I put the next amendment, Senator Hanson would like to speak to the debate. She's at remote. Yes. Senator Hanson. Yes, thank you very much. Um, in relation to the amendment that was put up by the government, I just want to clarify that it was the inquiry would be held out to the reporting date was the 30th of November and it was not one month as Jackie Lambie was, was saying it was only going to be for one month. I'd just like to explain Senator to the Hanson chamber Young. that I, I, I'd just like to say to the chamber that I do support the government's move to have the reporting date to the 30th of November. I have heard from a lot of people who are fed up with the inquiries into suicide Yes. A lot of people are calling for a Royal Commission into it. That is true. But the government have made a commitment to put a commissioner in place. They have given an undertaking that commissioner will be announced almost immediately who will be the commissioner. I believe that the commissioner should be given the opportunity to study his work. If we hold up with another inquiry, that means the, the interim commissioner cannot do anything and cannot do the job. 
People have had enough with inquiries. I think it's about 17 or 18 inquiries we've had into this. I understand Jackie Lambie's passion about this. I understand that she's frustrated that the answers have been met. But until we give a commissioner the opportunity to actually start investigating, Order. and it's not future deaths, it's about deaths in the past. So it's looking at those over 500 deaths that have, have, have been um, heard due to our defence, and I fully understand that. I do support Jackie Lambie having her inquiry, but I think to extend that inquiry out to the, for a year, which was initially to August 27th next year, was not reasonable. Um, even now, to take it out to, to April, I think needs to be a shorter period of time. I'm all for, and as I explained to Jackie Lambie, and that we need to get the commissioner working and to start working on this. Therefore, I I cannot support Jackie Lambie's amendment. Senator Billick, to out on a point of order. And I support order. the government. Senator Hanson, yeah. Senator Hanson, I have Senator Billick on a point of order. Senator Billick. To Lambie as Jackie Lambie. It's yeah, Senator I, Lambie, I was, and that's how she should be um, referred to. This debate has been characterised by a little bit of dancing around the standing orders. It is a matter of some passion. I was going to draw Senator's attention to the use of correct titles and not uh, and addressing comments to other senators through the chair at the end. <laughs> um, but I take your point of order. People should refer to others by their appropriate titles. Senator Hanson. I, I do apologise as um, when I refer to uh, Senator Lambie. Um, I've, uh, I am very passionate as well about the suicide deaths that have happened in the defence and answers need to be um, had. But to extend an inquiry out, and it was regarded to the terms of reference to a Royal Commission, there has been no undertaking that the government will give a Royal Commission what I have suggested to the government and to Senator Lambie, let the commissioner do his job. He will be independent of the government, will do investigations into previous deaths that have happened. Let him come down with his findings. If that is not the case, then the Senate can review that and then look at how we will proceed with this and possibly then take it to a Royal Commission. But this has never happened to have a commissioner in this position, and I believe that we need to actually move forward with this. Now, Senator Lambie, you have got the opportunity now. A commissioner has been appointed that will be named. You have got a three-month period of actually having your inquiry as you wish, and it's been referred to the Defence, um, Foreign Affairs, Defence, Defence and Trade. So I would suggest um, you know, that you've got an opportunity now to have that inquiry and um, I'd support this, um, the government's amendment to this. Thank you, Chair. So the question is, order. The question is that the government amendment that has a reporting date for these bills be 30 November 2020 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. No, I, I only heard one voice there. I will do the Senator Lambie the courtesy of doing again. However, I will point out that will mean there is no reporting date in the bill, because the bill at the moment has no... It would actually mean, I'm corrected, the bill is not referred to a committee if the noes have this motion. The clerk has just advised me. So I'll put the motion again. Those that support a reporting date of 30 November 2020 say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith tell of the ayes, Senator Urquhart tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 25. The matter is therefore negative. Senators, we have a hard marker at 12.17, so I will take it that all the amendments circulated have been foreshadowed. I will now move to Senator Rustin to move her amendment. I move the following amendment. At the end of the motion add, and in respect of the Higher Education Support Amendment, Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill 2020, the bill will be referred to the Education and Employment Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by the 25th of September 2020. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Mr President, I have an amendment to Senator Rustin's amendment, which would simply which I move. Order. Senator, I'll Sorry. Uh, microphone on. Start again, Senator Gallagher. Sorry, Sorry. I uh, thank you. I move an amendment um, to Senator Rustin's amendment on the higher education support amendment to job ready graduates and supporting regional and remote students bill 2020 to have a different uh, reporting date a reporting date of the 30th of november 2020 okay. senator faruqi the president i just want to make a short statement um, on you can speak to the debate senator faruqi. speak to the debate uh, i mean it's good to see that the government has seen some sense in having an inquiry but you have been dragged kicking and screaming to the table embarrassed with your tail between your legs no, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to lower my volume. This is a big issue, and it's, it's a shame that Senator Pauline Hanson's One Nation has become, even more so during the pandemic, just an arm of the Liberal National Government. We on this side of the chamber want to keep you accountable, transparent, and scrutinize your decisions. And I thank every single member sitting on this side of the chamber for doing that. We are doing our hmm? jobs, and you have been pushing against us, pushing against scrutiny. You gave us six days to look at the exposure draft of this bill. Six days, not even one week. What are you afraid of, really? Do, will, are you afraid that everyone will find out how destructive your uni fee hikes uh, and funding cuts bill is? Are you afraid that everyone will find out your juvenile, Murdoch-driven hatred of humanities and universities? Are you, afraid, are you afraid that your bill doesn't do at all what you say that it does do? You are cowards. You are cowards. And we will expose you. We will expose you through this inquiry. We want the 30th of November date as well. But we will expose you no matter through any inquiry that we get. We are here Order. to do our jobs, to keep you accountable, to make sure that every single person in Australia finds out how destructive 
your horrible piece of legislation is. The question is, I'm going to put the amendment moved by Senator Gallagher, because that pushes out the reporting date first. So the question is that Senator Gallagher's amendment for these bills for a reporting date of the 30th of November 2020 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Senator Gallagher. Our vote on that. The opposition would like their vote recorded in support of that amendment. Senator Seward. Please uh, note uh, the Greens' support for that amendment as well. Senator Seward. So I'll now put the original amendment moved by the government for a reporting date of the 25th of September 2020. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I now have an amendment by Senator Hanson Young. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I got an amendment to the selection of Bill's report as well. It refers the Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Amendment Act, which is currently being uh, debated in the House of Representatives as we speak, uh, to an inquiry. It is just unthinkable that this uh, government would push through this piece of legislation without allowing the Senate to do its job. And if they don't allow this bill to go to an inquiry, not only is this an attack on the environment, it is an attack on democracy. It is an attack on our children's future because this is about the health and the sustainability of our planet. And if you can't find it in your own common sense that our job in this place is to inquire into pieces of legislation, to scrutinise them, to work out what best the legislation and the amendments should be, what form they should be in order to make sure we actually protect the environment, then I don't know what you think you're doing on the front benches. This act and this piece of legislation requires a full-blown Senate inquiry. And why the arrogance of this government to assume that they don't have to worry because they don't want to have to hear about it is just absurd. It's arrogant, it's undemocratic, and it is an attack on Australia's environment and our wildlife. The question is, the amendment moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bell. The question is the amendment moved by Senator Hent. Young, the agreed to the ayes were passed to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell her for the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell her for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 25. The matter is therefore negative. So I'll now put the original substantive motion that the report of the Selection Bills Committee as amended be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that uh, a government business order of the day, as shown on today's order of business, be considered from 12:45 p.m. today, and b government business be called on after consideration of the bills listed in paragraph A and considered till not later than 2 p.m. today, and c general business notice of motion number 782 and order of the day number 56, as shown on today's order of business, be considered during general business today. The question is: the Motion moved by Senator Dunning be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk to notify postponements and extensions. Mr. President, postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of business of the Senate notices numbers one and two postponed to the sixth of October, and general business notice of motion seven eight seven postponed to the sixth of October. And committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item seven of the order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I seek to move to general business notice of motion number 7676 relating to the censure of the, for, of the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, and I ask that be taken as a formal Is there motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Wong. I thank the Senate. I move the motion standing in my name, uh, and I seek leave to make a short statement of no, no more than one minute. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Wong. I again thank the Senate. Mr President, the neglect of older Australians has to stop. I do not move this censure lightly. But if this government, the Morrison government, will not act to protect older Australians, this Senate must act. Senator Colbeck has been warned repeatedly. Every three months since he has become minister, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission has told him that standards were not met were not met in as many as 45 per cent of site audits, 100 per cent of review audits. Today's Daily Telegraph tells us that every week 100 older Australians are being raped, assaulted and killed in aged care facilities. This is appalling, it is distressing, it is shocking, but most of all it is unacceptable. This nation must do better, this minister must do better, the Morrison government must do better, and the Senate should express our view that we, it must do better by censuring this minister. The, the country has lost confidence in this minister. He, is, he has lost the confidence of the parliament. He has lost the confidence Order. of his colleagues, Senator and he Wong, should be censured. The statement's expired. Senator Cormann. Leave to make a one-minute statement. Leave is granted. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the government, uh, Liberal and National Senators in this chamber, strongly oppose this motion. We stand with our colleague, Senator Colbeck, who is doing a very Order. good job in a, a very challenging area, in a very difficult context. Very difficult context. Every death from COVID-19 is a tragedy, and uh, we do send our condolences to affected families and loved ones. We continue to work, and Richard, Senator Colbeck continues to work day and night. 
um, to safeguard the most vulnerable in the community, with the government providing over $1.5 billion additional support to the aged care sector to date to support senior Australians in aged care. Uh, Minister Kolbeck has acknowledged, taken responsibility and apologised for not having the number of deaths in aged care due to COVID-19 uh, at, at his fingertips at the recent Senate inquiry. The resources applied to the National COVID-19 Health Response Plan to support the aged care sector are a clear demonstration of the important work undertaken in support of aged care residents through the COVID-19 pandemic. And let me say, I know Order, firsthand Senator how Coleman, strongly uh, Senator Coleman has performs expired. I'll now put the motion. The question is, motion 776 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion 776 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell the noes. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 21. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator, I'm going to return to the top of the notice paper, given that we are restricted for time. Senator Lambie, business of the Senate, matter number three. I'm going to ask senators to be as quick as possible so we can get through as much as possible. Senator Lambie. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to postpone it. The motion. Um, next day of sitting. Is that seek yeah, leave? Yeah, next day of sitting. Okay. Thank you is leave much. granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Cormann, business of the Senate, matter number four. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number four, uh, relating to the rights of the Senate to determine its own proceedings and a reference of matters to the Procedure Committee. Uh, in the name of uh, my servant, Senator Wong, on behalf of the opposition, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Cormann. Uh, I move the motion standing in my name and in the name of Senator Wong. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart, business of the Senate, matter number five. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number five standing in Senator Kitching's name to be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator I move Urquhart. the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Government business matter number one, Senator Dunningham. I ask that government business notice of motion number one relating to the consideration of legislation be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The, the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Can I ask Hansard to record our opposition uh, to this? Um, the government business motion number one. The Greens' yes. opposition has been um, recorded. Thank you for the courtesy. General business matter number 718, the name of Senators Water, Waters and Rice. Senator Seward. I ask that general business notice of motion number 718, standing in, in, in the name of Senator Waters and Rice, for today be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Seward. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it? The aye. I, I called it for the noes. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved. Seven one eight, sorry, seven one eight. Sorry, yes, Senators Waters and Rice. Um, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair. The noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart. Tell if the ayes. Senator Dean Smith. Tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 24, noes 24. The matter is therefore negative. Now, Senator Patrick, I know you are seeking the call to move to your motion. I previously announced that we were going in the notice paper, so I am going to ask for leave of the Senate to proceed. Leave is granted. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank, you, um, thank you, Mr President. I uh, seek uh, leave to move. Oh, sorry, I ask the general business notice of motion number 781. Be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. Mr. President, I move the motion. Senator Cormann. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I seek leave to move an amendment to the motion. It, leave is not granted. Uh, pursuant to contingent notice, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving an amendment to the motion. That, and, that gets put immediately without debate, pursuant to the order we adopted. So. Um, I put the motion to suspend standing orders to allow the amendment to be moved. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that so much of standing orders be suspended to allow Senator Cormann to move an amendment to Senator Patrick's motion. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes, and I'll appoint Senator Patrick, teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 44, noes 3. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call Senator Cormann. I move the amendment as circulated. The question is the amendment be agreed to. Uh, Senator Patrick is about to seek the call. Senator Patrick. I seek uh, leave to make a one-minute statement in relation to the amended motion. The leave is not granted. Uh, I will put the amendment. The question is that Senator Cormann's amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The question, those, of the, those of that opinion say aye. This is Senator Cormann's amendment to Senator Patrick's motion. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I will now put the amended motion of Senator Patrick. The, Senator Patrick. I seek leave to make a one-minute statement in relation to the amended motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Patrick. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. We've just gone through a, a, a pandemic, and the government has spent, and I'm not, this is not a criticism, uh, of, uh, of over $200 billion. And yet the government is considering shifting something that works in Adelaide, that is full cycle dockings for submarines, over to Western Australia at the cost of $1 billion or more. We know that the South Australian workers there will not leave. The ASC has told us that about 10 per cent of their workforce would be prepared to move to WA. We will strip that enterprise of all, its, all of its corporate knowledge. That will damage national, national security because submarine availability will drop. We need to be very sensible about what we do moving forward. This makes no sense. If you've got a billion dollars to spend, Spend it on, on, ma on build, making something new. Spend it on improving something. Don't spend it on shifting something for political purpose. Order. The question is the amended motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. It being 12.45, that concludes the discovery of formal business and those matters. Senator Seawood. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to an order for production of documents as circulated in the chamber. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Pursuant to contingent notice standing in, my, in the name of Senator Waters, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion relating to an order for the production of documents. What I'm seeking to do here is to move a motion that is that from myself and Senator Farrell that, that calls for uh, that there be laid on, a table by the, by, on the table by the Minister for Sport no later than at 10 a.m. on 7 September 2020. A copy of the talk, talking points prepared by the former Minister for, for Sport's office concerning the expansion of funding for the Community Sports Infrastructure Grants Program ahead of her meeting with the Prime Minister on 28 November 2018. Any records of that 28th of November 2018 meeting, the subsequent exchange of letters referring to that meeting as a basis for expanding funding for the Community Grants Infrastructure Grants Program and any evidence the government is able to provide for the minister's legal authority to be the decision maker in the Community Sports Infrastructure Grants Program. This is, of course, a program that has stunk for a very long time. There's a long list of documents that the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and his Liberal Party uh, uh, machine have withheld from the parliament. These are what I've just listed in our motion, which is why it is so important that they are provided to this chamber and, of course, the public. They have withheld legal advice from, the, from Sports Australia. Who were, perfectly, um, who were perfectly happy to provide uh, the uh, inquiry these documents. It's easy for these things to get lost in all the procedural talk, but the truth is this matters for everyday people out there in community. It counts and it's important for the people that were affected by this particular process, but it's also really important that we get to the bottom of this, because if we don't, it could happen again, and we never want to see this sort of thing happen again. I want to quote from one of the witnesses who appeared before the committee, Dr James Meyer, president of the Gulao District Pony Club. We put our heart and soul into these applications. We're doing it for nothing. We're going for, for it for the love of sport and for the community that we're involved in. It, if to have it tinkered with in such a disingenuous way is disappointing. Politicians may look at why we distrust them. It's activities like these that foster that distrust. 
We'll obviously keep applying for grants, including local council, state and federal. We will put as much effort in because we still want as good a chance as we can. As we can. We just want the same integrity and return that we put into it to come back to us. We can understand the anger and disappointment that people would feel on finding out about these rorts. We've heard from the Gippsland Rangers Roller Derby Club, who had the highest uh, assessment score in almost 2,000 evaluations, but nothing out of the funding in this rorted program. We've heard from clubs across the country about the hours they've put in, most of them volunteers preparing plans, get, getting approvals, writing submissions, only to see the funding go to country clubs chosen by the Liberal and National parties as part of what is pork barrelling. The Liberal Party should come clean with the Australian people about what they've done. Yep. They should provide us with these documents, a copy, as I've said, a copy of those talking points ahead of that 28th of November in 2018 meeting. Any records or explanations of why they didn't minute a meeting, where the PM approved an extra $30 million in funding. A copy of the letters formalising the agreement between the Prime Minister and Minister at the time, Minister Mackenzie. They should also provide some basic legal evidence for the minister's legal authority to have been, uh, to even have been the decision maker in this program. It is frankly just astonishing that in all of the evidence here in the chamber or in the committee uh, inquiry, not a single piece of evidence has been put forward on which the basis the minister has the legal authority to be the decision maker. This program stinks to high heaven. This is why we are, have taken the step of suspending standing orders to get this OPD through, to get these documents on the table. It's critically important that we get to, bottom, to the bottom of how these rorts happened and make sure they never happen like this again. Here, here. Senator Cormann. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, that is now the second attempt by non-government uh, senators to disrupt uh, the orderly operation of uh, the Senate. Uh, we have important business uh, of the nation to transact, uh, including, of course, the payment uh, terms uh, legislation uh, of th that is uh, put forward by Senator Cash, uh, and also, of course, the very important citizenship cessation legislation, which Labor uh, previously indicated uh, was very important uh, to them. Uh, by moving a particular motion earlier today. So I assume that Labor will be opposing uh, this suspension motion because, like uh, the government, I'm sure that you would want us to get to the uh, legislation, the citizenship uh, cessation uh, arrangements uh, as swiftly as possible because that is, of course, a very important reform uh, to um, uh, protect and to support our national security arrangements. So uh, I, I will not uh, waste the Senate's time any, any more. Uh, I urge senators to oppose uh, this suspension and to get on with the business of the day. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Just um, briefly on the suspension, Labor will be supporting uh, the suspension. We think we can support the suspension, support the motion, support the payment times bill and support the citizenship cessation bill getting dealt with uh, today. Um, I'm not going to waste time on um, or taking up the Senate's time either, other than to say the sports rorts um, inquiry, every time it meets, uncovers another bit of detail about the dodginess that went on with this sports grants program. Uh, it says everything about this government, that program, it sums it up. It's all about the marketing, all about the spin, all about the secrecy <laughs> and all about the rorting and the pork barrelling. That's what went on in this program and the government should actually uh, learn from its mistakes with this program and actually release all the information so we know exactly when, what, what went on, what the minister's involvement was, what the prime minister's involvement was and why $44 million was uh, allocated uh, to targeted and marginal seats after caretaker began and seemingly this government doesn't mind um, that, that that's the way they conducted themselves. It's dodgy, it stinks. The information should be provided to the Senate, and that's why we support the suspension and the motion. The question is that st so much of standing orders be suspended. Sorry, up, oh, Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President. Every day we learn more about the scale of the rorting by the Liberal and the National parties. And last night's hearing of the Senate inquiry of the Select Inquiry into Sports Rorts revealed so much more. It is absolutely vital that the government comes clean, and it comes clean quickly and reveals the extent to which they rorted this grants program, basically to turn it into a pre-election slush fund 
to shore and shoring up votes in targeted and marginal seats. Last night, we learned that despite all the public spin, the Prime Minister was deeply involved in deciding to brought this whole program to try and buy votes in marginal and targeted seats, and in doing so, to overturn the recommendations of Sports Australia, to trash the trust of people and sports clubs across the country who had thought that their grant was being assessed in a fair and objective process, where it didn't matter where you lived or who you knew in order to get funded. I want to take you through some of the details of what we learnt last night because it highlights the importance of the documents that we are seeking under this order for protection of documents and why we need to see them absolutely pronto. I mean, we found out that before Sports Australia had even finished assessing their applications, before that, former Minister Mackenzie, she wrote to the Prime Minister on the 17th of October 2018, seeking extra funding and she provided the Prime Minister with a spreadsheet that was entitled Copy of Electorate Divisions of Applications. It's pretty clear just from the title of that document. In other words, here's what you need to know, Prime Minister, which electorates the grants under this community sports infrastructure program are in. This was before Sports Australia had even finished assessing the applications. Mackenzie's office was emailing the Prime Minister's office with information about whether they were in targeted or marginal seats in order to ask for extra funding. And then, a few weeks later in November, Mackenzie's office sends two more spreadsheets to the Prime Minister's office prior to a meeting that she has scheduled with the Prime Minister on the 20th of November. And one spreadsheet's got the details of the program as a $30 million program, the other with the details of the program as a $100 million program, and identifies that there would be 109 Senator more Senator Rice, I've got Senator Dunningham on a point of order. We're currently debating a suspension motion, as far as I could tell, but I can only hear from Senator Rice a whole heap of political points being made and a bit of her version of history of events. I just wonder if you could ask Senator Rice to be relevant to the question before thank the chair. You. Um, thank you. There's traditionally some discretion granted, but I am going to ask to at least the speech to be made relevant. There's been some slippage in this and they seem to be becoming more common. So I'm going to ask senators to address the motion to suspend standing orders, not necessarily the substantive one they wish to move. Senator Rice. Thank you. I am seeking to suspend standing orders so that we can get this OPD voted on today, so that the information that was revealed at last night's meeting is there for the public to be able to realise the extent that this government has been wrought in the program. I mean, going back to the chronology, which we learned about only last night, this is why it's urgent. The day before the scheduled meeting with the Prime Minister, when the former Minister Mackenzie meets with her staff to prepare for that meeting, we found out last night as part of that preparation that there was a four-page set of talking points that were prepared for Senator Mackenzie, which focused on how many extra projects in marginal and targeted electorates could be funded if the program was increased to $100 million. These are the talking points. That, they're one of the documents that we are seeking to have with this OPD. We need to see them. We need to have them laid on the table. And all of Australia needs to see them, especially the mums and dads who gave their all putting in applications for the incredibly worthy projects that didn't get funded through this grants program, that missed out because the Minister for Sport and the Prime Minister were colluding on how to rot the program to buy votes. And that meeting between Minister Mackenzie and the Prime Minister actually didn't end up taking place until the 28th of November, but then just days after the meeting, surprise, surprise, the program gets extra funding. And then there's a letter that's exchanged that specifically refers to an agreement in that meeting. We need to see that letter. And we also learnt last night that on the 4th of March, just two months out from the election, the Prime Minister's office actually asked Mackenzie's office for information about the unfunded projects, including which ones had coalition MPs lobbying for them. The Prime Minister is up to his neck in this, and we need to see this information so that it is clear, it is absolutely clear to the people of Australia how much it is. The government needs to come clean. 
The Prime Minister needs to come clean about his role in rotting his grants program, and we need to see all the documentation of how this occurred. This whole affair stinks to high heaven, and the longer there is a delay in sharing this critical information, the longer this stink is going to hang around. Order. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McCarthy, tell of the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 20, noes 25. The matter is resolved in the negative. We will now return to government business. I will give senators a moment to take their seats or depart from the chamber. I will call the clerk. Government business order of the day number four, Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Amendment Jabiru Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. I'll, Senator McCarthy, I'll come to you in a moment. Senators, if you could please leave the chamber quickly and acquaint yourselves with the exit. Thank you. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting President, Deputy President. Uh, firstly, may I extend respects and greetings from the Labor opposition to the Mirar Aboriginal people traditional owners of the township of Jabiru, which is the subject of this bill. and I do so as I acknowledge the traditional owners of this country, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Labor is happy to support this bill, which has been a long time coming for the Mirror. The effect of this bill will be to return ownership of Jabiru to the Mirror people and to allow for a community entity representing the Mirror to hold a lease over the town. Let me remind the Senate that it was a Labor government back in October 2009 which set this course of Mirar self-determination with an in-principle agreement for amendments to the Land Rights Act. And it was Labor leader Bill Shorten in January last year who committed a Labor government, which sadly didn't eventuate in May last year, to fund $220 million to improve the visitor experience in Kakadu National Park and to support the future development of Jabiru. Undoubtedly, it was knowledge of that commitment that spurred Prime Minister Morrison to commit similar funding for the same purposes. Labor is glad that a new Mirar community entity will be holding the head lease over Jabiru Township, rather than the Commonwealth's Executive Director of Township Leasing, because that reflects the preference of Northern Territory land councils and traditional owners. Gunjakmi Aboriginal Corporation first presented a plan to, for Jabiru to become a service and tourism hub for the region in 2001. Even before that, in 2000, an agreement known as the Kakadu Charter was signed by Mira traditional owner Yvonne Margarula and then president of the Australian Conservation Foundation, Peter Garrett, to mark a path forward for Jabiru from uranium extraction to sustainable tourism and development. So 20 years on, 
Today begins a new chapter for the Mirar traditional owners. The Jabiru settlement sets an innovative and practical standard for Aboriginal-led regional economic development. The Mirar and their team at the Gunjakmi Aboriginal Corporation are to be congratulated on their groundbreaking achievements. This history-making is possible because of, first of all, the enduring and inspired commitment and hard work of the Mirar people themselves, especially Mirar senior traditional owner Yvonne Margarula and her next elder sister, Nida. The Mirar have been ably served by tenacious and dedicated staff at the Gunjakmi Aboriginal Corporation and particularly their long-term expert legal adviser, Susan O'Sullivan, who has worked tirelessly with the Mirar for almost 20 years and is very much a driving force behind all of this. I'd also like to acknowledge Justin O'Brien, CEO of the Gunjakmi Aboriginal Corporation, who certainly did not want to be mentioned, but Justin and I couldn't help myself because you certainly deserve to be. This bill is about a future for Jabiru post mining, a future that is about local landowners making and realising their own plans. And there will soon be a head lease that provides security of tenure for the Mirar to develop Jabiru. The town of Jabiru was built on Mirar country in the 1980s without the consent of the traditional owners to service the needs of the range uranium mine. The town and the mine are surrounded by Kakadu National Park. Aboriginal land, which is leased to the Commonwealth's Director of National Parks. The Mirar never wanted the Ranger Mine or Jabiru Township that goes with it. The good news for them is the Ranger Uranium Mine is set to cease operations in January 2021, and the Mirar's vision to turn the mining town into a service and tourism hub for the region can be realised. The Mirror want the parliament to know that Jabiru is open for business. Kakadu is home to spectacular scenery, pristine environment and immense cultural value and should be shared with the world. Traditional owners want Kakadu to be at the top of the list for Australian and international visitors. The impact of COVID has been felt on tourism in the Northern Territory, and that is obviously unavoidable in the current climate. But the Mirar are ready to rebound to restore the uh, to restore this the future of the World Heritage listed environmental and cultural site. This will require infrastructure investment from this federal government. Jabiru falls within the realm of the Northern Land Council, and I'm pleased to record the NLC support for this bill under CEO Marion Scrimger. After the bill was introduced back in May this year, the NLC noted that it would allow for the transition of the township from a mining town to a regional service centre and tourism hub that will drive economic activity throughout the West Arnhem region. For many years, the Mirai people have been planning and looking forward to the shutdown of the Ranger Uranium Mine next year, and they've developed a comprehensive master plan that will transform the Jabiru economy from one that's been focused on mining and ancillary services to one based on the social, cultural and natural resource wealth of the region. I'm also pleased to record the observations of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, which has considered the human rights implications of this bill. The committee has reported that the bill engages various human rights embedded in international covenants. The right to enjoy and benefit from culture, the right to self-determination, and the rights of equality and non-discrimination. Dealing with the Land Rights Act itself, the committee has noted that it promotes the right to enjoy and benefit from culture by recognising the Aboriginal system of land ownership by traditional owners and providing ways for them to own, control and use the resources of their land. By restoring Aboriginal land to the traditional owners, the Land Rights Act has enabled them to maintain and, in some cases, re-establish their cultural identity. They have withstood immense pressures from political and mining industry influences for so many decades, and their culture has remained strong and vibrant. Now, finally, they have the opportunity to chant their own destiny, to manage their own affairs, and to prosper from their own endeavours. I know that the Mirar people have been looking forward with much anticipation to the passing of this legislation. 
and we on this side are happy for it to proceed without the need for further scrutiny by a Senate committee. In closing, Mr Acting Deputy President, I wish the Mirar people well in their future business. There's so much work ahead of you to realise the full potential that will be delivered by the passage of this bill. I'm sure you will achieve your aspirations for economic development, and I'm sure you will enjoy the goodwill of us all. Yo, Bowdy Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to this uh, debate on the Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Amendment Jabiru Bill 2020 and would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of Jabiru, the Mirar people. This bill facilitates the execution of a township lease and transfer ownership of Jabiru to the traditional owners, the Mirar people. Um, and it's, I think, a really, really important day that um, when this bill goes through. It makes the township lease consistent with other Section 19A township leases um, by removing the requirement that the term of the township lease by, uh, be by 99 years uh, be allowed for a shorter term of 40 to 99 years, and this would allow a lease that aligns with the term of the Kafkadu National Park lease, removing the requirement that the initial grant of the township lease can only be uh, to the Commonwealth. This will enable the lease to be held by either the executive director of the township leasing on behalf of the traditional owners or a community entity report, uh, representing the Mirar people. The Greens are very supportive of this bill. Importantly, these chamber changes enable the township lease for Jabiru to be held by the traditional owners, which allow the Mirar people to be decision makers about their land. The Rangi uranium mine was built four decades ago and was imposed on the Mirar people. The closure of the uranium mine and the expiry of existing leasing arrangements will occur in January next year. The passage of this bill will pave the way for, for Jabiru to transition from a former mining town to tourism and services led by First Nations peoples. And I understand how excited they are about that and what amazing visions people that um, Mirar people have for this area. The construction and development projects planned for Jabiru will help boost recovery for these towns, um, recovery, but particularly post-COVID. Um, I would like to acknowledge and strongly congratulate the Mirar people who have campaigned long and hard to have Jabiru returned to the traditional owners of the land. In 2018, the Mirar people had their native title rights and interests recognised after first lodging a native title of applications 20 years prior. Putting control back into the hands of the traditional owners is an important step towards justice for First Nations peoples. It is an essential step, in fact. This bill marks an important step towards the Mirra people realising their vision and master plan for tourism and regional services um, across Kakadu. The federal government has announced a $216 million investment over 10 years to upgrade the Kakadu National Park and support the transition of the Jabiru town site to a tourism and services hub. The Northern Territory government has also invested um, or promised um, $135.5 million um, to this project. I understand that Kandapi Aboriginal Corporation is um, very keen. Um, for these funds and is raring to go to start the project to transform Jabiru um, into their vision. And they want to get going sooner rather than later. I hope that the government is able to support the Mirar people as much as possible and the corporation to ensure that this happens in a timely manner to facilitate these visions and dreams coming true. This bill is a very important step for the Mirar people, and we must acknowledge um, the hard work that they have undertaken to get to this point. We also wish them well and congratulate them and support their strength and determination to see this achieved. Uh, thank you, Senator Seward. And before I call the minister, I'd just like to advise the chamber that we haven't received uh, the message yet from uh, the other place in relation to the Broadcasting Services Amendment, Regional Commercial Radio and Other Measures Bill. And so we will be, after this bill is dealt with, we will be going back to the Payment Times Bill. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you. I thank Senators 
for their contribution and their support, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, thank you, Minister. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, Clark. Or relating to the town of Jabiru and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the town of Jabiru and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Payment Times Reporting Bill 2020 and a related bill in Committee of the Whole. The committee is considering the Payment Times Reporting Bill 2020 and a related bill and government uh, amendments 1 to 17 on sheet RS116. The question is that the... Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, very briefly, just in speaking to the government amendments which I moved uh, prior to this debate recommencing, the Senate Education and Legislation Employment Committee considered these bills in detail and recommended that they be passed. Uh, and I do thank the Chamber for the support of this bill. The committee also recommended that a review of the Payment Times reporting scheme occur two years after its commencement. I agree with the committee's recommendation and, in addition to agreeing to this measure, further government amendments to the bill have been made in response to feedback provided by various parties. The key amendments to the bill include reducing the transition period for the introduction of compliance and enforcement measures from 18 months to 12 months, moving the definition of small business to the bill and inserting a new legislative note to the definition, requiring a payment time report to include additional information on payments made beyond 60 days, including payments made more than 120 days after a small business is, uh, invoice is issued, and uh, moving more content requirements of a payment times report from the draft subordinate legislation into the main bill, including details such as the reporting entity's name, ABN and main business activity. Other technical amendments to the bill include ensuring that most reporting entities start their first reporting cycle on the scheme's commencement and requiring businesses to report in a form and manner approved by the payment times regulator. Um, I uh, therefore do commend uh, the amendments to the Senate. Uh Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. Labor will support the government's amendments. In particular, we welcome the government listening to Labor and stakeholders about amending the reporting requirements so that large businesses with egregiously long payment times, such as 180 days, can't hide this uh, data in the 60 days uh, or a greater threshold that existed in the original legislation. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Uh, the question is that the amendments uh, moved by Senator Cash be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I have One Nation amendments. Uh, Senator <coughs> Hanson. Thank you very much. Um, I move a the amendment on sheet 1026. My name. Senator Hanson, do you, do you wish to speak to that? No, I don't. Okay. Senator Cash. Um, um, I, I, uh, the government will be supporting the amendments moved by Senator Hanson, and I do thank Senator Hanson on behalf of One Nation for her uh, constructive discussions in relation to this bill. And as I said, the government will be supporting the amendment uh, moved by Senator Hanson on behalf of One Nation. Thank you, Minister. Yeah. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, my, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, we supported the government's review into this amendment, <coughs> and uh, we support Senator, Senator Hanson's amendment to ensure that certain matters are considered by the review. While we believe the fail-safe mechanism is the only feasible way to reduce payment terms in this parliament, we don't object to the stronger terms of reference being imposed on a statutory review. I want to take this opportunity to note that such a re review with these terms would help fine-tune the fail-safe mechanism before it is set to begin in our amendment. 
As such, I would hope Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts will consider voting in favour of the fail-safe mechanism soon. Uh, we should pass uh, that amendment to uh, this parliament and ensure that uh, technical clarifications can be made to it at a later date to assuage concerns of Senator Hanson may have. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. If there's one thing everybody in Parliament can agree on, it's that the Jackie Lambie Network is truly the party of small business. Sure, Liberals claim they are. Now, Labor say they're the real ones. I've even heard the Greens say they're the best party for small business. But you all say that publicly. I think it, when push comes to shove, you'd have to agree that the Jackie Lambie ne Network is a spiritual home of small business owners. And you're all just saying that for the cameras, but you don't really mean it. I'm bringing this up because no party claiming to be the party of small business will design a bill like this one. So the Liberal Party can't claim to be the party of small business and maintain a straight face. Surely you'd give it up. And the Labor Party says the problem with this bill is that there's not enough to protect small businesses. Hey, at least you're turning up for the party. Welcome to the main game. But even if you are still moving too slowly, I can tell you people are getting pretty sick and tired of the major parties talking big and doing nothing about the problems facing small businesses. They've had enough of the government taking big and doing nothing about the problems facing Australian small businesses. And once again, the government is asking the Senate to consider do-nothing bills that won't actually help fix the problems that small business owners are actually facing. It's the same thing every time with these guys. More reporting, more reviews, more talk, no action. No action. It's time to wake up. While we stand up here debating these bills, small business owners are going to the wall because their invoices aren't getting paid on time. They can't pay their rent, their own suppliers or their workers. They're getting squeezed while big businesses make money off cash that doesn't belong to them. It's not right. Sadly, those small business owners aren't going to see anything, anything change because of this proposal from the government. All they're getting is another marketing exercise, and I tell you, these marketing exercises, you're not even good at them. I'm willing to bet my very last dollar that it won't do a damn thing. The only difference this proposal makes is to force big companies to admit that they're refusing to pay their invoices on time, and this should have been done years ago. It will set up a regulator to the public and the parliament how many businesses are waiting for more than 30 days to pay their invoices. Whoopee! How about you make them pay it in 30, within 30 days? My goodness! I'm sorry, but what a joke. What's the point of more reporting? What's the point of more talk? We already know what the problems are. We already know how big the problem is. The fact that we need to do something now should be bleeding obvious to everyone by this point. Instead of more reporting, we should be forcing those big businesses to cough up what they owe. Stop running about your political donations from them. We should stop letting those wealthy corporations make billions of dollars off the backs of our small businesses and send them down the gurgler. Because that's what they're doing. We should stop letting those fat cats have all the power. We should stop standing by while small businesses are being run into the ground by much bigger players. Because until we do something, not just about reporting, not just about watching, then those small businesses are at the mercy, mercy of big businesses. And they will continue to be at the mercy of big businesses who can simply decide to do the wrong thing. And you guys do nothing. No penalties. It doesn't make sense that this is the system we're working with. No one else in the country gets to choose to ignore their bills. When I don't pay my electricity bill on time, my energy company doesn't wag their finger at me and give me a little tap on the knuckles now, does it? Oh, no. They don't just put me on a naughty list, which gathers dust and has no impact. They charge me a late fee. They make me pay up extra to compensate them for not getting their money on time. They try to teach me a lesson. They try to discipline me. They'll send debt collectors if I push them too far, and other businesses can choose not to do business with me if it affects my credit rating. That's the way things are for the rest of us. Ordinary people have to do the right thing and pay what they owe. Why should big businesses be any different? Oh, that's right. I keep forgetting because they're getting their political donations. What do you know? If they don't pay the money that they owe on time, they should be chased for it. I tell you, they should be hounded. They should put them in a damn corner and discipline for them. They should cop a fine, a bloody big one at that. Otherwise, you are not using anything as a deterrent, except for, oh, hello, you're being naughty. Jesus. Late payment should hurt them financially, not benefit them. But that's not the situation we're in. The only reason big businesses don't pay on time is because they simply don't want to. They have no incentive to because you're not making them. 
You're not making them. They know they can get away with pushing out payment times because the government isn't going to force them to behave better. What's new? They know they can ignore their bills, hold on to their money, earn interest on it, squeeze their little supplies out there and make them go under. And Do they give us stuff? No, they don't give us stuff. Why would they? And they know that you guys over there will turn a blind eye just like you have done for years. This is how it is in this country. This is where we're at. That's why nearly $80 billion gets paid late to small businesses each year. That's why more than a third of small business invoices are paid after 30 days, and that's why late invoices take an average of 63 days to be paid. Shocking. Some of those fat cats even charge small businesses a fee if they want to get their payment in a reasonable amount of time. Isn't that absolutely bloody disgusting? That's where we're at because you've allowed them to walk all over the top of you for so long. Where's your spine for small business? Where is it? The government's weak response to this problem doesn't reflect how deep it runs. A naughty list is not a punishment for those big businesses. It's the softest tap on the knuckles you can imagine. That's because we all know those big companies don't have any shame. They have no shame at all. They don't care about getting a bit of bad press. Why would they? They know that a bad media day will blow over. Today's news is tomorrow's fish and chips, as far as they're concerned. They know the journos will move on. The truth of the matter is that all those big businesses care about is their bottom line. Nothing else, not their personnel, not their small business and anything else below them. They don't give us stuff. Let's be honest about that. It's in their financial interest to stuff over their suppliers. They'll do it. They'll do it every single time. They won't think twice about it. And if they get caught, they'll stand up hand on heart and say, oh, we're truly sorry. Oh, jeez. Give me a break. They'll go to the government hand in hand. They'll beg for forgiveness, which they'll give them because they're your donors, and the government will roll over every time like a dog, because that's how it works. This is how it works these days. Give us cash, we'll leave you alone. Give us cash, we'll leave you alone. The little guys who are trying to do the right thing will continue to get messed over and ignored, and they're fighting a losing battle. And I can't believe the National Party is doing it for them. Oh, that's right, they get those big donations too from the miners and all the rest. Whatever suits them, that's fine. They need the government to come out swinging. They need the government to stand up for what they say to help out small business. That's what they want to see. They don't just want to see lip service. They actually want to see you doing something. Seems to be the lip service. Seems to be the story of your line these days with the lips. Honestly, it's all about lip service, no action. Lip service, no action. That's your new motto. The Liberals, lip service, no action. They need a minister to back them up, and you're not doing that. As a matter of fact, you are a long way from it. Because at the moment they're getting squashed under the weight of those wealthy corporations, and you know it, Minister. With everything that's going on this year, many of them won't survive, and they're not surviving, and you're still not helping them. Instead, this government is doing nothing to stop late payments from happening. This proposal does nothing to stop them from happening. And frankly, this proposal from the government is completely meaningless, just another line of lip service. Tasmanian small business operators have had an absolute gutful. They already know that we have a problem here and that it's, time, it's about time the government did something about it. It's about time the government grew a spine. Tassie small business owners need the government to back them up. They need an enforcement bill. They want to hit those big corporations right where it hurts most, their bottom line. They want some payback. And they want someone to stand beside them and deliver that payback so they can keep their doors open. That's why I want a mandatory payment times for big businesses. I'm sick of the fact that we're letting them get away with this stuff. Originally, I wanted to force big businesses to pay up within 21 days or risk a fine. And since I circulated my amendments, I've had conversations with the crossbench and the ALP, and I'm willing to compromise to get this done. That's why I'll be moving an amendment to the ALP's failsafe mechanism to make it kick, it, to make it kick within 18 months rather than three years. I'm giving big, business, big businesses a full year and a half a full year and a half, only because I've got a compromise, I can tell you, their affairs in order. And if you, if you don't think that those big businesses with all that cash can't get their affairs in order in that amount of time, and you want to give them three years, oh my God, what is wrong with you people? We're, we're, in, a, we're in a crisis. Small business can't keep their doors open. And you're not punishing big business for what they're dishing out to small business. I mean, what is wrong with you people? God, no wonder we're in an economic mess. You'll have more people unemployed. What is wrong with you? The only reason they are doing it already is because they aren't being forced to. My amendments are an opportunity to make sure that big businesses can't get away with walking over little guys anymore. And I won't stand back and watch the minister kick this can down the road. No one who cares about small business should be comfortable with that. 
So to you in the Liberal Party over there and you in the Nationals, now's your opportunity to do the right thing by small business owners you supposedly look out for. Support the fail-safe mechanism and support my amendments that are going to go along with it, because it's about time we force the big players to put their money where their mouth is. And it's the same with you, Minister. It's about time you put it up them. Start helping small business, because quite frankly, I'm calling you out today. I'm going to call you out. It's not good enough for a minister. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Uh, Senator Hanson. Uh, Senator Hanson, we just, we just can't hear you at the moment. Senator Hanson, sorry. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, Senator Hanson. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to respond to that with regards to what uh, Senator Lambie just said. Um, small businesses have struggled and we're not getting payments from businesses, but it was taken into consideration that if we did a mandated time of paying businesses, gave them 30 days and put that in the legislation, the problem was that you have the farming sector, especially the farming sector now, that has contracts with the big end of town, whether it be coal or woolly, selling the product to them, that they usually do get paid within seven days, maybe 14 or even 21 days. If we mandate it and put it into 30 days, therefore you, you will get these big businesses saying, well, now I don't have to pay you um, until 30 days. So that is going to affect the farmer. Different businesses have different ways of paying. Like you may have the farmer that deals with, say, elders, whereas they buy their seed, they buy their um, uh, fertiliser from them or what they need for the farming. They give them long contracts so that they then allow the farmer to get their crop in before they pay back these businesses. If we mandate it to a 30-day contract, you are going to force these farm farmers to try and find the monies to pay back these businesses. I agree that it does need to be cleaned up by all means. Hence why I do support the government in the bill, because you're going to name and shame these big businesses, and it's been proven that overseas it has worked, because people look at their payment times. There are heavy fines to these businesses if they don't report their payment times. That is one way to deal with it at the moment. Um, we can't, and then it's up to the business themselves if they want to do business with these other companies that are not paying. And the extension times of some of these businesses are going out to 90 days, 120 days plus. This is a way of reining it in. With my amendment, it was basically to say, okay, a two year review period. If that doesn't work, then this will be reviewed on these businesses. They could be then looked at a, a payment time. Plus, we look at the 30 days, but we have to take into consideration the farming sector who have advised my office they don't want it mandated to a certain period of time. So there's a lot of businesses have different payment times. There's also what, they're, what we're trying to bring in, or the government's trying to bring in, is e-invoicing, to get more businesses into e-invoicing, which they could hopefully get their payments done within a five-day period. Also, with my amendment, if you look at it in 2, um, 2D2, it basically does say that if the business is after the reporting entity that has failed to pay a small business invoice issued to the entity within the period specified in the terms of the relevant contract to pay interest on that payment, that will be looked at. And I do believe if businesses don't pay within a, a, a specified period of time, they will be paying interest to that company they owe the money to. But I, I believe that under circumstances, especially the way it is now at the moment, with COVID-19, how it's affected businesses out there, I think it is a time that we, we need to um, have this period of time. Let's look how this works. It is in my amendment that it has to go before a review. A review that we do see if it has worked, if it has changed the payment times from these big businesses, these companies that are actually not paying the, the smaller contractors. And I do say that is, it is very good to see that the government has now reduced their payment times and paying under the 30 days. So they've got to set the precedent for the rest of the community, and that is exactly what they have done. I understand the frustration of Jackie Lamb of Senator Lambie. I do get that, and we hear it all the time. I personally have been a small business person most of my life, so I understand where you're coming from, and I hear it from tradies, the people that don't get paid their payments. 
But if we go in with a sledgehammer, we could end up with nothing. So you've got to try and find the balance between those people who get their early payments to those people who are actually paying in excess of time frames. So I'm all, I am supporting the bill with my amendment so that if it doesn't work, we will have in, it in place then to rein them in and do bring in the heavy fines. Look at mandating times then, but let's get um, feedback from the community and how businesses feel about this, see if it is working. If it's not, then we can come in very hard and uh, to try and address the imbalances. But I believe give it a go and uh, see where we stand in two years' time. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson. Uh, Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. First of all, I don't know where Senator Hanson's living. Honestly, I don't. I mean, she's out there campaigning, which is what she's doing in Queensland. You better go and talk to some of those small businesses. <laughs> I can tell you that now, because I don't know what, what's going on. But in Tasmania, those small businesses, they want to be paid within 30 days. They are not surviving. They are not surviving. And that is the truth of the matter. There is no way the Jackie Lambie Network will support your amendment. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Uh, so the question uh, before the, the chair is that the amendment one on sheet 1026, moved by Senator Hanson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Uh, Senator Lambie. Is it I move? Uh, here we go. I think you're you're seeking uh, leave to, to move together amendments yeah. one I'm to four on sheet eight nine seven two. I am. I'm uh, seeking leave, Mr. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President to move uh, amendments one to four, sheet 8972, by leave together. Uh, is leave granted? Uh, no objections. Le leave is granted. Uh, Senator Lambie? Uh, I'm Mr Acting Deputy President. I move the amendments. Uh, thank you. Okay, the question before the chair is that amendments one to four on sheet 8972, moved by Senator Lambie, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the, the noes have it. No. Uh, division required? Uh, ring the bell for four minutes, please. Sorry. Senator Lambie, uh, the, uh, please cancel uh, the division. Uh, the division has ca called for the noes. Thank you. Uh, Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr uh, Deputy um, President. I want to um, move um, <coughs> The motion uh, 1 to 11 on sheet 8986 and seek to, um, seek to make a brief um, statement. You're, you're seeking leave. Are there no objections? Uh, leave is, is granted. Thank you. Um, so I move uh, the amendments on sheet uh, 8986 uh, in my name and moved with the exception of amendments 4 and 7. We won't move amendments four and seven as those matters have been dealt with uh, in the agreement with the government's amendment. I also ask that the proposed subsections in amendment six named CA and CB be renamed as DA and DB as a consequence of agreeing to the government amendments. In terms of the broader amendment, Labor believes that uh, complementary backup measures are necessary to ensure the payment times reporting scheme improves general payment times to small business. Uh, our amendments uh, would introduce a fail-safe mechanism. That fail-safe mechanism um, <coughs> means that uh, over the next few years, if the government's sh scheme does not uh, broadly improve payment times to small businesses to 30 days or less, the mechanism is triggered. I could uh, go on a little bit, uh, 
But in the interest of time, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I will um, limit my comments to that and ask that the, um, the Senate support my amendments. Uh, thank you, Senator Farrell. So the, the question before the chair is that uh, amendments uh, one to three, five to six, and eight to eleven on sheet eight nine eight six be agreed to. Those of, of that opinion say aye. Mr. R uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, I note that Senator Lambie also has some amendments which she wanted to move to our motion, and uh, I think if she is proposing to move them, then she probably ought to do it before we vote on our amendments. Okay. Well, Senator Lambie, before uh, we vote, I, Senator Lambie, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move items one to four on sheet. 1013 uh, by leave together. Is um, leave granted? Leave oh, is granted. I seek, sorry, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move items one to four on sheet on sheet 1013 by leave together. Yes, leave has been granted. Yes, so you, by leave. So I seek to move the amendment. So you're moving those amendments. So the question before the chair is that amendments 1 to 4 on sheet 1013 moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Uh, so we now go back to the, op to the motion, uh, the amendments moved by Senator Farrell which is um, one to three and five to six and eight to 11 on sheet 8986 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Uh, division is required. Uh, four minutes. Ring the bells for please.
stop the bells. So the question is that um, amendments as moved by Senator Farrell on sheet 8986 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I <coughs> beg your pardon, appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Brockman as teller for the noes. Order, there being 23 ayes and 24 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Lambie, you're seeking to move, <coughs> seeking the call. Thank you, Madam Deputy um, President. Uh, we seek uh, leave to withdraw amendments one and two, sheet 8973. If there are no objections, uh, Senator Lambie, yes, leave, leave is granted. Uh, so we, oh, that's it. So um, uh, I move. Oh, sorry, uh, Minister. Oh. The question now is that the Payment Times Reporting Bill 2020 as amended be agreed to and the Payment Times Consequential Amendments Bill 2020 stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move. Oh. Uh, the, question now, the question now is that the bills be reported. Getting ahead of myself. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it, Minister. Oh, I'll get it right eventually. Um, the committee has considered the Payment Times Reporting Bill 2020 and Payment Times Reporting Consequential Amendments Bill 2020 and agreed to them with amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be now adopted. Okay. Uh, those of the opinion say aye. Those against say no, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. Uh, the question is that the bill now be read a third time. Those of the opinions, opinions say aye. aye. Those against say no. Uh, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to provide for certain entities to report payment terms and practices and for related purposes. A bill for an act to deal with consequential matters arising from the enactment of the Payment Times Reporting Act 2020 and for related purposes. We have a message. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Australian Citizenship Amendment Citizenship Cessation Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. Move that this bill now be read and uh, may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So the question is that the bill now be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. 
Australian Citizenship Amendment, Citizenship Cessation Bill 2020. Minister. I take a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to speak on the Australian Citizenship Amendment, Citizenship Cessation Bill. I say from the outset that Labor welcomes this legislation and we will be supporting it. This legislation fixes a significant problem in the bills that were passed in 2015 to remove, dual citizenship, to remove citizenship from those dual citizens who have engaged in terrorist conduct. There was a flaw in that bill passed by the government, a flaw that was pointed out by Labor at the time, a flaw that has been called out by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor, who said that this, the, the mechanism or the provisions in that bill for automatic loss of citizenship uh, by conduct was flawed, should be immediately repealed or revoked and revoked. ASIO has called for this law to be repealed and for a new model to provide for the loss of citizenship for those uh, dual citizens who have engaged in terrorist conduct to be put in place. That is to move from the automatic loss of citizenship by conduct to a decision-making model whereby the minister makes a clear decision based on evidence provided to him or her that citizenship should be revoked and it is in Australia's national security interest that citizenship be revoked. It's important to understand that ASIO's view is that it is not always in Australia's best interest for citizenship to be revoked from a dual citizen who is engaged in terrorist conduct. It might be in our better interest for that person to retain citizenship, either to gather information uh, or to prosecute that person for those serious offences. So, in the short time remaining, in anticipation that we may have uh, less opportunity throughout the day to contribute to this debate, I make clear, uh, Mr. President, uh, that uh, Labor will be supporting this legislation. We wanted it passed this sitting week, uh, and I look forward to the government facilitating that happening before Parliament rises today. Uh, this is important national security legislation. I do draw the Chamber's attention to the additional comments Labor senators have provided in the Parliamentary Joint uh, Committee on Intelligence and Security in relation to the matters which we uh, remain concerned uh, in this bill, things we would have done differently, but we are not going to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This is a long overdue reform. It should have been brought by the government earlier. It is time that they gave ASIO uh, the powers that they want and need. And on that basis, Labor is happy to provide support to the government for this bill to pass through the chamber today. I note the Greens have indicated they're going to oppose this legislation. And on that, I say shame on you. It is important that our national security agencies have the powers that they need to deal with terrorist conduct. Uh, we take on board the advice of the national security agencies, Mr. President, and we will be supporting this legislation. Order. I know Senator McGrath is seeking leave. Senator McGrath. I seek leave to move a motion to enable the Education and Employment Legislation Committee to meet during the sitting of the Senate today. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator McGrath. I move that the committee be authorised to hold a private meeting otherwise than in accordance with Standing Order 33-1 during the sitting of the Senate today from 3 p.m. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Minister, what is the economic impact of the Morrison government's reduction of JobKeeper in 24 days' time? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Gallagher, for your question. Um, first of all, I would reiterate that the government is extending the payments to people who are on unemployment benefits with the extension of the coronavirus supplement from the end of September until Christmas. Um, and it, it, any assertions that, that, that there is anything other than an extension an extension of a payment. Order. Uh, an extension of a payment Order. is actually false and misleading. 
As I said yesterday, every single person in this chamber, every single person in this chamber who came in here in March when we put forward a massive package of order, reforms. Senator Wong on a point of order. <laughs> a point of order is direct relevance. Um, I know the minister is reading from a prepared brief. The question went to the reduction. Those were the words used, the reduction of job seeking. Um, Senator Wong, I, I can't. Return to the I question. can't that, that's not a point of direct relevance. Uh, Senator Cormann, on the uh, point uh, of order. Uh, one should never mislead the chamber, but certainly one should never mislead the chamber in a um, point of order. Job seeker is not being reduced; it's, it's being absolutely not reduced. The coronavirus supplement is being extended. Job seeker remains precisely as order. it was. Um, I, I think order. I'll, ru I'll rule on the point of order when there's silence. This is traditionally a time the opposition values. I'll rule on the point of order. Um, Senator Wong, um, that goes to the terminology and the substance of an answer, which is a matter for debate. Um, I cannot instruct the minister how to answer a question. The minister is being directly relevant. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And, um, what I would say is that the assertions that are made by those opposite just clearly show that they do not understand what they actually voted for themselves when they were here in this place. Um, and Order. secondly, um, Senator Wong, I'm quite happy to take that interjection. In fact, I'm quite happy to, to continue to answer this question without even, uh, without even looking down, Senator Wong. But Order. there you go. Senator you can Wong. waste as much time as you like in the answering of this question by your interjections. That's entirely up to you. But, uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, I mean, those opposites show their extraordinary ignorance of understanding of the budgetary process and the economy if they think that one measure in isolation is, is going to actually tell them the answer to. The impact of the suite of measures that are put in place by our government has enabled this economy to be cushioned through a once-in-a-century pandemic that totally and totally has destroyed the economies of every country around the world. And Australia yesterday demonstrated that despite the fact that Australia and Australians have been significantly been impacted by this coronavirus, we have actually fared very well on the basis of the economic stimulus that our government put in place in March to support all Australians, individuals and businesses throughout the pandemic. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. After the biggest economic quarterly contraction on record, the Morrison government has already accepted that we'll see further contraction in the next quarter. Minister, this is the fourth or fifth time I have asked you this question. What is the economic impact of the Morrison government's reduction of job seeker and the coronavirus supplement in 24 days' time? Senator Rustin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, look, once again, um, you're probably directing your question in relation to economic impact to the wrong minister. I make my decisions Order. on what I that the, the money that is provided through the uh, the stimulus. Order I on my left. My, Order. my advice to government in relation to uh, the initiatives that are put in place around social policy on Order. the basis on the basis. You'd like me to divulge by ERC um, discussions Order. now, would you? I make my decisions when it comes to social policy on the basis of putting in place the economic supports that people need, depending on the circumstances that are before them. And right now we are in the midst of a pandemic and the government made a decision and was announced in July that we would continue to provide additional levels of support to people who find themselves unemployed until Christmas. Uh, my decisions Order. are always based on the social impact and the social Order. impact of the people that I represent. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Extraordinary. Uh, thank you, Mr President. With the 1.5 million Australians relying on support and 13 applicants for every single job, why is it that the minister can't tell us what the economic impact is of cutting economic support or cutting financial support for those on Job Seeker with the coronavirus supplement? Does the minister take any responsibility for making the recession deeper and longer? By cutting the coronavirus supplement and cutting wages at the worst possible time. Yeah. Senator Rustin. Well, look, thank you very much, and um, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Gallagher, for your question. But once again, it just shows your lack of understanding about government budgeting processes and how the economy actually works. 
to actually take one single payment, one Order. single initiative, and Senators expect Keneally that one Watt. initiative to be the single thing that impacts on the economy just shows a complete Senator Watt. lack of understanding the rules, about how Senator e e economics works and how our budget works. Clearly this, government, clearly, this government has put in place the largest ever stimulus package to support the, ec the economy through the coronavirus pandemic. We have put in place initiatives that support people who are unemployed, people to remain engaged with their employers, Senator small Polly. businesses, large businesses, sectors of the economy that have been massively impacted. We have put in. $314 billion worth of support to the Australian economy, and yet all those opposite can do is ask me a question about one little tiny part of it. Shows your lack of understanding. Order. 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 On my left, on my left, Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Senator Keneally. Senator Antic is on his feet asking a waiting to ask a question. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is working to get Australians back into jobs and on the road to economic recovery? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And I thank Senator Antic for the question. Mr. President, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a devastating impact on Australia, Australians, the global economy, and it has seen Australia fall into recession. But the Morrison government moved decisively, uh, in fact, as Minister Rustin has articulated earlier this year, uh, to stop the spread of COVID-19, protecting the health of Australians, uh, but also we moved decisively to protect the livelihood of Australians through our measures, such as JobKeeper, which is, of course, keeping that really important connection between around 3.5 million Australians, between them as employees and their employers. Mr President, nearly all Australians have had their lives impacted in some way or another by COVID-19. Uh, but in particular, it is still having a significant impact on certain sectors of Australia. And in that regard, I note what is occurring in Victoria, uh, where so many are still subject to very strict lockdown measures. But, Mr President, as large parts of our economy begin to reopen uh, in the coming months, the government is focused on getting Australians back into work. And, Mr President, our JobMaker plan it will return Australians to work and help Australians' economy return to growth. Every minister, every department, led by the Prime Minister from the top, we are working to put job creation front and centre of everything we do. And Mr President, our long term, because we have a long term plan for Australians, unlike those opposite, all they have is just frivolous comments. Our long term plan to get Australians back into work will actually chart the way forward for a new generation of economic success. And of course, Mr. President, uh, we will continue to build on this plan. We'll undertake that important skills reform that I've referred to, the industrial relations reform, removing unnecessary red tape, and of course, delivering a record infrastructure spend. Because when you invest in infrastructure, as we all know, you create jobs. Locking in affordable and reliable energy, boosting our manufacturing capability, and of course, as Senator Birmingham well knows, opening new export markets to create Order, even more Cash. opportunities Senator and jobs. Antic, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how has the government's strong record of economic management and job creation enabled us to respond to COVID-19 and plan for economic recovery from a position of strength? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, I do remind uh, those on this side of the chamber that of the promise that those opposite took the la to the last election for Australian people—$387 billion in new taxes. Can you only imagine? Can you only imagine the position that Australians would now be in if those opposite had been able to legislate $387 billion in new taxes? And you know what the irony is? They stand here and they say they are the friends of small and family businesses. The last thing they need are more taxes, which is exactly what you had said you would promise them, and perhaps that's why they didn't vote for you. But, Mr President, we entered COVID-19 from a position of economic strength and record employment. In fact, the employment figures in March 2020 showed that employment in Australia was actually at a record high of in excess of 13 million people. And Mr President, that is why we continue to focus on job creation front and centre Order. of Senator policy. Senator Cash, Senator Antic, a, supplement, a final supplementary question. Order. 
Senator Watt and Mackenzie. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, can you please update the Senate on the recent ABS labour force figures and any insights they provide into the nation's recovery from COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Despite the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on our economy, the ABS labour force figures for the month of June and July they actually demonstrate the ongoing resilience of employers out there and the ongoing resilience of the Australian labour market. In fact, during June and July, as we know, we actually saw the reopening of many parts of the Australian economy. Direct correlation of, with the easing of restrictions is the movement of people back into work. And in those two months, we saw the economy uh, create 340,000 jobs. In fact, in July alone, Full-time employment increased by 43,500, and part-time employment rose by 71,200. As Senator Payne knows, this includes almost 60,000 jobs, Senator Payne, for women in July, and almost 56,000 jobs for young people. And that is why we are focused on job-creating policies and putting in place those economic conditions that businesses Order, can leave Senator off, Cash, create Senator, more jobs time for, for the us. Answers expired. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. The Prime Minister claims his only involvement in the Rorted Community Sport Infrastructure Grants Program was to pass on, and I quote, representations made to us as every Prime Minister has always done. But the Auditor General last night told the Select Committee on Administration of Sports Grants he had never previously seen so much interaction between a Prime Minister's office and the Minister across the entire duration of a grants program. What was the Prime Minister's true involvement in this program? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thank the Senator for his question. Order. Uh, Mr. President, the, the, the Prime Minister's involvement in the program was, is as he has described it. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Order. Senator Chisholm. You decided you're going to go out with a bang, you? The ANAO also revealed the then Minister's office drafted notes for a meeting with the Prime Minister that included, and I quote, how many additional projects in marginal and target seats could be funded? Was the Community Sport Infrastructure Grants Program funding increased to allow the Prime Minister to make more pork barrelling announcements? Senator Colbeck. Mr President. Uh, Order. Thank, thank you, Mr President. Uh, I, I think it's quite unsurprising that a minister who is looking to promote funding into their portfolio would meet with the Prime Minister proposing to do exactly that, Mr President. Uh, I've done that a number of times in my portfolios, Mr President, and uh, the, the record of that is uh, public to, to, to see $1.5 billion into aged care for COVID-19, Mr President. So I think it's, it's quite unsurprising that a minister would go to a meeting with the Prime Minister to advocate for additional funding into a program that had received order. significant Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order. The minister is not answering the order. Senator Rennick. I hear Senator Wong's point of order. I'm happy to sit down for Senator Rennick. Senator. <laughs> go on. Go on. Go on. Tell us. Uh, Sorry, it's Thursday. You, I of, of, a, of a week when no one went home, uh, so I know. So, Senator thank you. A point of order is uh, on relevance. Uh, the minister is avoiding the question by talking in the abstract. He was asked a very, di very direct question: whether or not this program, this program, was increased to allow the prime minister to make more pork barrelling announcements. And I'd asked him to return to the question. Senator Cormann on the point of order. <coughs> thank, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, the minister is being directly relevant to the extent that he can be directly relevant as somebody who was not the minister at the time, who was not the minister at the time. So, I mean, direct relevance has got to be seen in the context of whom is, who is being asked the question. And, <coughs> and Senator, well, Senator Colbeck is answering the question in a directly relevant way to the extent he can, given he was not the minister at the time and was not involved in this process at the time. On the, on, the, on the point of order, the minister was asked about a meeting. It contained, contained somewhat loaded terminology, and I've said before, when there are very specific question-seeking fact, 
being directly relevant requires a very strict interpretation. Um, when these more loaded and contested terminology, ministers have more discretion in responding and remaining directly relevant, including challenging the assertions. The minister is being directly relevant, in my view, and I'll call him to continue his answer. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I was about to say, uh, Mr. President, this was a very, very popular program, Mr. President. Uh, in the first round, there were over 2,000 applications, Mr. President. And given the popularity of the program, Mr. President, I'm not surprised that the minister, then minister, went back to uh, ERC and the Prime Minister Order, to Senator seek Colbeck. additional Time funding. For the answer has expired. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Given the Prime Minister was clearly able to devote so much time and attention to the rorting of sports grants, where was the time, attention, or colour-coded spreadsheet for aged care? Yeah. Um, that I'm going to. I'll allow the minister. I'm, I've long been of the view that ministers should be given the chance to respond to questions. Um, which contain assertions. I will say that's very difficult. That, that is getting close to not being a supplementary question, in my view. Um, dealing with effectively a different portfolio, as well as a, um, a, 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 it happens to be the minister's other one. But I've, I've always, I'm not going to rule it out of order. I'm just going to say I think it comes very close to the line. Senator Colbeck will have an opportunity to respond. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. And I really have no choice but to reject the complete premise of the question, Mr. President. Uh, the, decisions, the decisions with respect to uh, sport funding made in the previous parliament, Mr. Question, in the previous parliament, well, uh, Mr. President, the decisions made in the previous parliament, uh, which, as, uh, which I were not party to, but, Mr. President, uh, I believe. Uh, and, and from the, the understanding that I have, all the decisions made to increase the funding for this program were appropriately made through the ERC process, uh, and accordingly the, 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 the grant program and the program was administered from there. Senator Seward. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Treasurer Senator Cormann. Um, when asked on, the ABC breakfast, on ABC Breakfast, he would bring forward personal tax cuts, Mr Frydenberg said, there is one, that is one issue we are considering. We did legislate the tax cuts after the last election. They were in three stages. More money in people's pockets means more spending, and more spending means more jobs. In a recession, why would the government hand out tax cuts and put money in the pockets of millionaires while cutting the coronavirus supplement? when? A higher Order job seeker payment right. is a fail-safe way of stimulating the economy and helping the most vulnerable in our community. Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I can confirm that the government is considering uh, lower taxes for hard-working Australians. That's what we always do, because we understand that providing uh, tax incentives for Australians uh, to work hard and get ahead helps the economy grow, which creates more opportunity for all Australians to get ahead. And we want to create more jobs so that more people can get off welfare back into work. That's what we want to do. The uh, coronavirus supplement uh, was uh, put in place uh, for a six-month uh, period. Uh, at the $550 level. That was always temporary. It was historically unprecedented crisis level support. It is very important now for Australia to move out of the crisis settings uh, into the new normal. And we want to ensure that uh, all Australians have the best possible opportunity to get back into work, to get back into work, which is of course why uh, the policy put forward uh, by Senator Rustin enables those Australians on job seeker to earn more before they lose any of that income support. In fact, uh, Senator Rustin has put forward a policy, which is a very good policy, uh, to increase the amount of uh, income they can, can earn to $300, uh, uh, $300 a fortnight. $300 a fortnight that people can earn instead of $105 a fortnight before they lose any of their, any of their job seeker support. We are a government that encourages, uh, in, that encourages people to have a go. We are a government that rewards people that have a go. And that is how we strengthen the economy and help the economy recover as a result uh, after this coronavirus pandemic. Senator C, what a supplementary question. Does the, does the minister reject the concept from econ economists that actually giving money to people with low incomes goes into the economy quicker yep. to stimulate the economy, whereas giving money to millionaires, it gets saved. 
Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, President. I, I completely reject this uh, class warfare rhetoric, which was also rejected by the Australian people at the last election. I mean, the, in, in the lead-up to the last election, the Greens had somehow captured uh, the, the then leader of the Labor Party into this sort of attack uh, on, uh, on uh, aspirational Australians or those Australians who had done well. We want all Australians to do well, and we want all Australians to have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. We want all Australians to have the best opportunity to get into work, uh, to, get, to pursue a career, and to be the best they can be. We are, we are not going to join you in this sneering approach uh, to policy. Uh, we, 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 are, we are a government that will continue to ensure that the tax policy settings provide an appropriate, appropriately well-targeted safety net for the vulnerable, but also provides the appropriate incentive for people to have a go uh, and do the best they can. Senator C, with a final supplementary question. Minister, what do you say to the 1.8 million people on Job Seeker and Youth Allowance who won't see a cent of tax cuts and are facing their income, a cut in their income of $300 a fortnight? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. The stronger economy that our tax policies will help create will get those people back into work. We want those. We want those Australians to get off income support, off crisis level income support, back into a job. And you know what's happening right now? There are lots of jobs out there. There are lots of jobs out there where businesses can't find anyone to take that job on. That is a terrible situation. Order. And that is why we Senator, need to start making Senator's those adjustments. On my right. That's why we need Senator to start Seward. raising out uh, the crisis level support that was provided uh, to uh, job seekers in the context of the initial uh, six month period. That is absolutely the right and responsible thing to do because it will help us strengthen the economy, it will help us create more jobs, it will help us ensure that those people, that are, those Australians who are currently on uh, income support, will be able to get a, a job and uh, look after their family and get ahead. Order, Sen order. Senator, Senator Patrick. Mr. President. I preface, uh, my question is to, is to the Foreign Minister. I preface my question by recalling the remarks of former Foreign Minister Julie Bishop, who, a week out from the 2016 US presidential election, observed that the then candidate Mr Donald Trump was domestically focused and that uh, it would be, I quote, up to our region, including Australia, to persuade a Trump administration to focus on the Asia Pacific. Now that you've been the Foreign Minister for two years, how is that project going? How successful have you and the Prime Minister been in persuading Donald, President Trump to focus positively on our region? How has, the pres has President Trump, Trump's diplomacy helped Australia's interest in the Asia-Pacific? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patrick for his question. I think the best way to respond to Senator Patrick uh, is, in fact, to refer to some of the singular outcomes of the 2020 Osmin meeting held recently uh, in Washington between Secretary of State, Secretary of Defence, Pompeo and Esper, and Minister Reynolds and, uh, and myself. Because the Indo-Pacific was the principal topic of our discussion in Washington, Mr. President, we reached agreement on a wide range of issues. And let me start just with the deployment of an affordable, safe, and effective COVID-19 vaccine, if one is achieved, and therapeutics to the Indo-Pacific region. What that builds on, <clears throat> what that builds on, Mr. President, is early U.S. support with Australia and New Zealand for the distribution of key medical and health supplies through the, from Suva to the Pacific uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. We agreed our global health security statement, which will also help us build Indo-Pacific partner capacity in biosecurity, in biosafety and in biosurveillance to prevent, detect and respond to infectious disease outbreaks. And importantly, to reduce the risk of future pandemics, we agreed to establish a new working group between the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Department of State to monitor disinformation efforts, to counter state-sponsored and other malicious disinformation and interference. In terms of supporting the economic recovery in the region, we focused on the development of high-quality infrastructure investments, particularly through the Trilateral Infrastructure Partnership uh, and other mechanisms, including the Papua New Guinea Electrification Partnership uh, and also the proposed undersea cable for, for Palau with other partners, including, as I've said, Japan. 
We're looking at ways to mobilise private sector investment in the Indo-Pacific to deliver high-quality infrastructure and natural resource projects. When you meet Adam Bowler, the head of the uh, DFC, the Development Finance Corporation in the United States, you absolutely know how focused the administration is on those high-quality infrastructure projects Order. in the Pacific Senator and in Payne. Southeast Asia. Time for the answers expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In the run-up to this year's US election, what positive efforts have you and the Australian Ambassador in Washington made to engage directly with Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden's foreign policy team? What discussions have you or Ambassador Sinodinos had with Mr Biden's senior foreign policy advisers, for example, former Deputy Secretary of State uh, uh, Tony Blinken or former Deputy National Security Adviser to the Vice President and East Asia expert Ellie Ratner? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patrick for his supplementary. Uh, can I start, Mr. President, by saying what an exceptional job former Senator Sinodinos is doing as Australia's ambassador in the United States, dealing with the significant challenges that COVID-19 brings, both to the operational aspects of an embassy, particularly a large embassy like that in Washington, but importantly, the significant challenges it brings to the management of any bilateral relationship and those engagement issues. Senator, uh, Ambassador Sinodinos has been exceptional in his outreach across Washington, uh, and I see that in every interaction I have and every engagement I have. Uh, Senator Patrick, it would not usually be the case that a uh, minister would uh, canvass in public discussions had with. Uh, uh, with uh, representatives uh, across the political uh, sphere in any country. Uh, but I can say, uh, Senator, that uh, on my previous visit to Washington just in March of this year, I know that a uh, number of those uh, mentioned in Senator Patrick's question participated in a very diverse roundtable Order. discussion with foreign Senator policy Payne, experts, and I particularly appreciated their insights. Expired. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Joe Biden's former uh, foreign policy platform so that says that he aims to quote uh, to win the competition for the future against China. Mr. Biden's East Asia adviser, Mr. Ratner, wants Australia to increase defence spending to help blunt uh, China's regional power. How do you think a Biden administration will deal with China? How might that differ from President Trump? And what do you expect a Biden administration will ask of Australia? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Patrick for his question. Uh, I think uh, no matter from whom any exhortation to Australia comes in terms of defence spending, we have a very, very significant reply, and it's called the Defence Strategic Update. Secondly, I would say that the United States' relationship with China and vice versa is a matter, of course, for each of those countries, not for Australia. Uh, and it's a matter for any US administration, no matter who is the elected US administration. What I would say, though, Mr. President, in relation to the Indo-Pacific, the Indo-Pacific is where we both live, the United States and Australia. It's the home of our greatest responsibilities. It's the home of our most compelling priorities. And what we do, our work through OSMIN and our bilateral relationship, is all about making the most meaningful contributions we can to foster a better Indo-Pacific, an Indo-Pacific that is open and secure and prosperous and based on the rule of law. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is guaranteeing essential services and ensuring people with disability have equal opportunities on our road to economic recovery? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank Senator Chandler for her question. Um, the government is absolutely committed to ensuring that people that live with disability are included in all aspects of community and also making sure that we provide them with the equal opportunity that they deserve. We recognise that part of that has got to be making sure that we are well informed about um, the requirements of people with disability, and that's why research funding is so important in achieving understanding as well as being able to achieve good outcomes. And that's why we recently announced a partnership with, uh, with the Melbourne University Disability, Uni uh, Melbourne Disability Institute at the Melbourne University of Melbourne, uh, a national disability research partnership. The government is providing $2.5 million uh, in seed funding to establish this partnership, which will focus on disability and mainstream services, including such things as health, education, housing and justice. So over the next two years, this partnership will prepare and progress a research agenda, a research capability roadmap and practical guides for disability-inclusive research into partnerships with the disability community. 
We recognise that data and evidence is absolutely essential when it comes to developing uh, good policy and evidence-based policy. And that's why we've provided a further $15 million uh, to make sure that we can de develop a national disability data asset. This asset will help governments across the whole country, as well as policymakers, understand how people with disability are supported through services, through payments and through programs across the multiple levels of services and service systems that exist within this country at many levels, including state and federal. And through the sharing of this de-identified data through the data asset will allow governments to better understand the life experiences and outcomes for people with disability. We believe that this is an essential part of developing an, an inclusive uh, and equal opportunity for all Australians, including those with disability. Order. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government is supporting scholarship opportunities for regional and remote Australians with disability? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, clearly, um, you know, getting a job and keeping a job is an absolute game changer for anybody, no matter where they live or who they are in this country. And it shouldn't be any different for somebody who lives with a disability. And that's why we have partnered with the ABC to showcase the incredible work of our up-and-coming um, content makers uh, who live with disability, and to help increase the employment opportunities for those people. Uh, this program is now in its third year, um, and the program, Regional St uh, Storyteller Scholarship, offers $60,000 worth of funding to provide opportunities for regional Australians with disability to undertake a scholarship with the ABC. Um, this scholarship provides opportunities um, for people to further their career aspirations in content making um, and allowing them to showcase their skills and experience through a wide range of avenues that are offered through the ABC. Uh, and can I take this opportunity to congratulate this year's scholarship winners who were announced in June, and I'd encourage anybody who wants to be part of it to, to apply for next year. Order. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on the government's plans for a new national disability strategy? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, the, the next national disability strategy will be sat, laid out by governments across Australia about how we can work together, state and territory and federal government, to make the lives of people with disability as best as we possibly can. So we're working with the states and territories on the new strategy, uh, and I recently released a, a position paper which has kicked off the second stage of the consultations. The position paper outlines the key features that we are proposing to include in the new strategy and is informed by the previous strategy uh, and the successes and the, some of the not successes of the previous strategy. We are inviting all Australians, whether they live with disability, have experienced dis with disability or whether they don't, to have their say in this position paper because we want to make sure that the next national disability strategy, as is informed as it possibly can be, to make sure that it provides uh, the support and the, and the initiatives for people who live with disability uh, and to make sure that our next strategy Order, is the best Senator strategy Rustin, it can be. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Yesterday, the minister claimed, and I quote, we have to put the incentives back in place so people can start engaging with the job market. Given there are 13 job seekers for every one job vacancy, what jobs does she want the one million unemployed Australians to engage with? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator McAllister for her question. Um, well, quite clearly, Senator McAllister, the decision that was made by this government and announced in the July economic financial update uh, for the extension of a number of measures, whether it be the JobKeeper extension or whether it be the extension of, of uh, the coronavirus um, supplement, recognise the fact that we understand that the job market is still very, very shallow. That is not to say that the jobs market has not improved and, and it continues to improve with new jobs being created, but I will absolutely agree that the jobs market in Australia remains very shallow, and it's particularly evident in a state like Victoria, uh, where the vi and, and I have to say acknowledge the Victorian economy and the people of Victoria are going through an extremely difficult time with the stage four lockdowns having a massive impact on their economy, but also on the livelihoods and the wellbeing of people who live in Victoria. 
But notwithstanding that, Senator McAllister, through you, Mr Chair, um, the rest of Australia, seven out of the eight uh, states and territories of Australia, are starting to see their economies open up as restrictions are lifted, and hopefully we'll see the restrictions lifted even further, and we will start seeing um, the jobs that we, uh, that we want to see return to the economy come back again. But we as a government remain committed to have elevated levels of support for people across the whole of the economy going forward. These announcements have already been made in recognition of the fact of the circumstances that are before us at the moment. But we do, and we make no apology for saying to people who find themselves unemployed, we want you to start engaging with the jobs market. We want you to start understanding um, you know, what opportunities might be out there at the moment. There are areas in our economy where we are seeing significant new jobs being created. And I think Senator Cash actually pointed out a minute Order. ago about the number of jobs that Order have been created over recent times, and we Order. will continue to support the on Australian people through this pandemic. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you. The same day the national accounts showed the biggest quarterly contraction on record, household consumption plummeting and business investment tanking, the minister claimed, and I quote, Across much of the economy, we are starting to see the green shoots. Can the minister explain to the one million unemployed Australians and the 400,000 Australians expected to lose their jobs by Christmas where to find these green shoots? Senator Rustin. Well, look, um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And I'd just like to point out that, that the, the basis of the question that has been put forward, that the accounts that were pre uh, presented yesterday, reflected the economic conditions that followed the shutdown of the Australian economy in March, following the states and territories' decision to shut down borders, close down their economies. And yesterday, our national accounts reflected that. And I don't think there's anybody in this place that would disagree agree with the fact that the results that we saw yesterday were, had, had, had a devastating impact on the Australian economy and the lives and livelihoods of many in it. But to suggest that, the, that there are not the opportunities starting to, starting to open up in our economy, the jobs figures that were quoted a minute ago by the minister who has responsibility for employment, Senator Cash, saying that there are jobs coming back into the market. What we as a government want is we want people to actually realise that we are doing everything we can to Order. make sure Senator jobs Rustin, are created. Senator time for the answers expired. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary. Thanks, Mr. President. Australians are living through the worst economic recession since the Great Depression, wages are declining and 600,000 Australians have been forced to drain their super completely. Why is the minister telling unemployed Australians to engage with jobs that don't exist while refusing to use her power to maintain support and cutting back payments for the 1.5 million Australians relying on them? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I mean, I, I think Senator, um, Senator McAllister obviously clearly hasn't listened to, to what I have been saying. I have not denied that the jobs market is very shallow. I have merely suggested that the people who find themselves unemployed um, should be, especially in the states and territories where we are seeing job creation starting to come back online, that they should be starting to, to engage with the jobs market to see if there are jobs out there that are available to them. And to continue to perpetuate this myth about us making cuts, I would reaffirm to you we have continued the support that we have had in place by extending the coronavirus supplement past the end of September. And in fact, I'll acknowledge that even Senator, uh, Senator Gallagher said um, you know, we argued for it to be extended and it has been extended. I mean, those opposite obviously acknowledge the fact that we have extended the supplement. And now to come into this place and to say otherwise, I'm not quite sure what you actually want. Order. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister outline how the Morrison government is keeping Australians safe by ensuring the Australian Army has the firepower, mobility and protection it needs on the modern battlefield? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator Henderson not only for her question but for her passion and her relentless commitment to defence industry in Victoria. Uh, Mr President, the first role of this government, and indeed any government, is to keep Australia and also Australians safe. That's why this government is investing $270 billion over the next decade into upgrading our defence capabilities. 
and this includes $55 billion into new land capabilities. This will ensure our land forces have greater lethality, greater range, greater mobility and, most importantly, greater survivability for our troops. We must equip our army to deter potential adversaries in our region and also be able to respond with credible force. That's why this government is investing in strike weapons, watercraft, helicopters, armoured fighting vehicles, logistic capabilities and also emerging robotics and autonomous systems. Our region's challenging environment also demands that our army can fight across a range of different domains and a range of regions. Thanks to this coalition government, the ADF now has an outstanding amphibious capability centred on our two magnificent Canberra-class LHDs. Larger and more capable Army watercraft will support rapid uh, regional deployment of ADF land capabilities, and they will be capable of independent and also task force operations. These investments and the many more that we've outlined in the four structure plan are essential to our nation and they're essential to Australia maintaining our capability edge. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister provide an update to the Senate on the self-propelled howitzer project yes. and how this project is supporting jobs in my home state of Victoria and the great city of Geelong? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thanks, Mr. President, and again, thanks, Senator Henderson, for that great enthusiasm for, for the Greater Geelong region. Uh, Mr. President, today I was pleased to announce that Defence will shortly release a request for tender to Hanwha Defence Australia to build and also to sustain over the longer term 30 self-propelled howitzers in Geelong. This is an important next step in progressing the Morrison's government 2019 election commitment to provide this essential capability for Army. This will create up to 350 jobs. And by reviving this project that Labor so scandalously cancelled, this government is ensuring our army has the combat power it needs. It is this Morrison government that is ensuring Australian industry involvement in the delivery of this capability over the next decade. And that means jobs for Australians. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister provide an update to the Senate on the Hawkeye project and how this project is also supporting jobs in my home state of Victoria and the great city of Bendigo? Senator Reynolds. Well, we've got the trifecta. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, the great passion for Senator Henderson for Bendigo as well. But today, uh, Mr. President, I also announced that the ADF's new Australian-designed and Australian-built Hawkeye light protected mobility vehicle will enter full rate production, that is 50 vehicles per month. Hawkeye production by Talus Australia will sustain over 200 jobs in Bendigo and uh, an additional 180 nationwide. But most importantly, the Hawkeye will again better protect the lives of our Australian soldiers. Hawkeye has provided vital business continuity for many small businesses in Victoria, and particularly important uh, during this time as Victoria deals with the COVID-19 outbreak. And Mr. President, this is yet another wonderful example of defence and Australian industry managing business practices in a COVID-safe environment so we can continue to deliver Order. Australian ADF capability. Senator O'Neill. Very much, uh, Mr. President, and my question, without notice, is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian Senator Colbeck. News Corp paper, newspapers revealed in reports this morning that more than 100 older Australians are being raped, assaulted, and even murdered in this minister's aged care system every week, with more than 50,000 incidences of assault and abuse going unreported each year. Advocacy group Aged Care Crisis has found, and I quote, aged care residents in nursing homes have been raped, robbed, bathed in kerosene, attacked by rodents, suffering injuries or death from other residents, burnt to death, strangled, cooked, melted, sedated to death, over-medicated or choked to death. Is the minister going to ignore these warnings? Minister for Senior Australians in Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I thank um, the Senator for the question. Uh, and the government isn't and hasn't been ignoring those warnings. In fact, uh, this government has continued to act to reform the aged care sector, in, including, Mr. President, the calling of the Royal Commission, which is currently investigating in a forensic manner the aged care sector, Mr. President. But while the Royal Commission is being undertaken, we have continued to act to reform the aged care sector, Mr. President. So, uh, beginning from the last. Beginning from uh, July last year, we've had the new aged care quality standards that we've put in place, Mr. President. We've instituted a new charter of rights for residents in residential aged care. Uh, we've completed the legislative process to bring together the Aged Care Quality Safety Commission as one entity, and uh, that entity began its work as a single entity on the 1st of January this year, Mr. President. So we have continued to act in a reform sense uh, as this, uh, as the Royal Commission has continued. And in, in respect of the story in the media this morning, I mean those things are clearly unacceptable, clearly unacceptable. And that's why, Mr. President, we've uh, progressed the work on the serious incident response scheme. And in, in, and in that serious incident response scheme, we've incorporated some things that didn't exist previously, including resident-on-resident -resident attacks, which a lot of these uh, uh, issues that were reported this morning are, Mr. President. We've, in, we've included home care into the serious incident response scheme, Mr. President. And we actually brought forward the funding, instead of waiting till the budget in October this year, we announced the funding for the progression of the serious incident response, response scheme in June this year, because we understand that it's an important uh, piece of work and we wanted to make sure that it was being progressed, Mr. President. So not only do we recognise these issues, we understand that they're not acceptable, but we continue to reform the sector to improve the outcomes for residents in residential aged care, and, uh, aged care across Senator the sector. O'Neill, a supplementary question. I have question. to say reform hasn't been going too well so far. The CEO of Payne Australia quit the Morrison government's Aged Care Quality Advisory Council because she found, and I quote, the focus was not about quality at all, and it just really fell short of the mark. Why do older Australians have to suffer the consequences of a minister who keeps falling short of the mark? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the individual that uh, is mentioned by uh, the senator actually, as I understand it, resigned from the previous incarnation of the Quality uh, Advisory Councils over two years ago. Mr. President, uh, there is a new Quality Council in place now. Under a, under a new framework, Mr. President, uh, and it is operating quite differently, Mr. President. So uh, it's it's all it's all very well it's all very well for uh, Senator to bring up historical Order. events, but Mr. President, as I said in my previous answer, we have continued to reform this sector. Uh, the the new Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, which commenced in its new form on the 1st of January this year, is operating in a different way. We are providing additional powers, and, those, and some of those powers have occurred during, uh, uh, during the, the COVID-19 outbreak, Mr. President, and we continue to look and work with the Quality and Safety Advisory Council on what additional powers might be required for the Commissioner to utilise. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. As a result of the horrific reality of the minister's aged care system, including ants crawling in wounds, loved ones left abandoned for hours, and families, families who've lost mothers, fathers, grandmas, granddads. The Senate has actually censured the minister. When will a minister resign and give his portfolio to someone who won't fall short of the mark and might be capable of getting it right? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. What I will continue to do and what the government will continue to do is the work that we have been doing in reforming and improving the aged care sector in this country. And Mr. President, had the, minute, had the senator listened to the answers that I gave to the first two answers, she would understand that that work a, has been going, has been occurring, and continues to occur. And not only that, Mr. President, we we act with with appropriate urgency to ensure that these reforms continue. And Mr President, it was this government that called the Royal Commission into, uh, into aged care. Mr. President. Uh, there's been members on the other side trotting around the place saying that they supported it when they didn't. In fact, they called into doubt whether we actually needed a 
and Aged Care Royal Commission, Mr. President. So this government has and continues to act while the Royal Commission continues to reform the sector to improve it so that senior Australians get the care that they deserve in residential home, uh, care and in home care. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is investing in Australia's national parks? to provide short-term economic stimulus that leaves long-term environmental and economic benefit to industries such as tourism. The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator McMahon for her question. And indeed, our government is investing a record $233 million in Commonwealth national parks to maintain their status as global icons of Australia but importantly to drive and create job opportunities, especially in the Northern Territory, where indeed our iconic national parks primarily sit. $233 million being funded over three years to support specific projects across Uluru Katajuka National Park, Kakadu, Booderee and Christmas Island National Parks, as well as the Australian National Botanic Gardens. These parks are internationally renowned, especially those in the Northern Territory, as key tourism, cultural and ecological destinations. The funding Mr. President, will support critical growth and employment with the creation of over 1,100 jobs in regional and remote areas as a result of this investment and work. It will be vital economic stimulus for those communities, providing an opportunity for our national parks, together with local industry and communities, to be revitalised following the COVID-19 pandemic, to ensure that we invest in their strong recovery, to encourage strong tourism visitation to those regions once international travel is available again, to help drive the tourism businesses and regional re economies there to recover strongly from the heavy impacts. The investment is in addition to the $216 million already committed to growing tourism in Kakadu National Park and the waiving of park entry fees that our government introduced. The work involved will provide some 1,114 estimated jobs, some 564 during the construction phase, a further 550 indirect jobs in manufacturing, hospitality and transport businesses. We recognise that these parks form the lifeblood of many communities, the lifeblood of the tourism industry in the Northern Territory, and that's why we are investing that to support the industry and support the Territory Order. through these tough Senator times. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Wonderful news indeed, Minister. How does this investment, investment complement other support being provided to Territorians in my Northern Territory? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Indeed, uh, our support for the Northern Territory uh, is strong in delivering, in delivering the support for the national parks through the JobKeeper and JobSeeker program. We're supporting, indeed, through JobKeeper, more than 5,000 organisations in the Northern Territory have received more than $200 million in support and funding to sustain jobs and employment during the pandemic. Our government's also provided support to individuals and households. And indeed, the business support, seeing more than $180 million paid out in credits across the Territory. Our freight assistance mechanism has helped the Territory by establishing an air bridge between Darwin and Brisbane that can enable necessary freight, uh, be that mud crabs heading into Asia or soon into the mango season, we will see Territory produce headed from Darwin to Brisbane and then onto flights across the region and out into the world, sustaining jobs and export for Territorians and the Territory. Order. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Um, Minister, it's, it's great to hear that we will be able to have our mango daiquiris. Um, <clears throat> uh, Minister, how important is tourism to jobs in Australia? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr President, around one in 13 Australian jobs depended upon our tourism and hospitality sectors as we head into the pandemic. And sadly, many of those businesses, many of those jobs have been unavoidable victims of shutdowns and restrictions across the country. But their potential recovery is being hampered and impeded by the disproportionate maintenance of blanket border restrictions across the country. Mr President, let me acknowledge, though, the wise words of Mr Albanese on this, uh, on this topic. 
Back at the time of the uh, back at the time of uh, debate about Virgin Australia, he said hundreds of thousands employed in the tourism sector depend upon a viable two airline industry as an essential component of an effective tourism industry in Australia. Well, Mr. President, what else do you need for a viable tourism industry? You need routes that planes can fly on and states that people can travel between. And Mr. President, I would now urge Mr. Albanese to lend his voice to support. Don't just leave it to Paul Keating. Don't Order. leave it to Paul Senator Keating Birmingham, to stand up for the time for the answer has expired. Let Mr. Albanese Senator Birmingham, time for the answer has expired. Order. Only a few minutes to go, everyone. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. In June, the minister announced a serious incident report scheme would be operational in 2021. In fact, today in question time, the minister referenced this announcement as an example of his actions. Can the minister confirm the establishment of this scheme will be four years? four years after it was first recommended in 2017. Can the minister explain to the Senate why he and the Morrison government have taken four years to heed the warnings of the Elder Abuse, a National Legal Response Report, and establish the scheme? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the, point, the point that I made earlier in question time was that uh, rather than wait until the budget for the announcement of funding for uh, the Serious Incident Response Scheme, uh, my initiative and my imperative, Mr. President, was to ensure that that work could commence immediately, immediately, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, that's why, when I had the opportunity to ensure that this funding was available, $23 million for the implementation of the Serious Incident Response Scheme, uh, I took the opportunity to ensure that occurred, Mr. President. As uh, I said in my answer to a previous question today, the, the incidents that we've seen, the incidents that have occurred, uh, are not acceptable, Mr. President. They're not acceptable, and that's why we've incorporated into the serious incident response scheme uh, uh, resident-on-resident assaults, which previously hadn't been part of the program, Mr. President. Order. And that's Senator why Wong we've on a expanded point of order. it. Uh, Mr President, this, I, I raise a point of order direct relevance. The question went to why it's taken four years. Um, the question was quite lengthy, Senator Wong. I think the minister talking about the activity he claims to have undertaken is directly relevant to... I'm, I'm, excuse me, I'm, I, I try from the chair to use non-pejorative phrases on questions and answers. Um, he is being directly relevant, um, talking about his program of work and activity. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And so, so, so my action was to make sure that this funding was available quickly, that it was uh, available to continue the scheme. It was to ensure that, Mr. President, that uh, uh, resident-on-resident uh, incidents were included in the scheme, and, Mr. President, also to ensure that uh, the scheme covered. Home care, which it didn't previously, Mr. President. So we have, I have, uh, all through my time in this portfolio, put this as one of the important things that I wanted to ensure that we achieve. Uh, and so I made sure that the funding was available uh, and announced in June, rather than waiting until the budget came down in October. Uh, and I will continue to pursue this as an important measure for the government and for those who are residing in, in residential aged care, but also, Mr. President, importantly those who are receiving home care services. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. This minister has ignored the 2018 Aged Care work Workforce Strategy, the 2019 Aged Care Royal Commission Interim Report entitled Neglect, warnings from the Northern Hemisphere, warnings from experts and unions, warnings from Dorothy Henderson Lodge in March and Newmarch House in April. Isn't the 2017 Elder Abuse a National Legal Response Report just another warning this minister has ignored. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and I completely reject the premise of Senator Wong's question. Uh, we have, this government has continued to act to progress the interests of residents in aged care across the country. Uh, we called the Royal Commission 
uh, Mr. President, into residential aged care because we wanted a forensic investigation of the entire residential aged care sector. And, Mr. President, we have continued to reform the sector while the Royal Commission was being, is being conducted, uh, despite the Royal Commission saying that they didn't want to be investigating a moving target, Mr. President. So we've continued the important reforms, important reforms like the Serious Incident Response Scheme, important reforms like the new code of conduct for residential aged care uh, residents, like the new quality standards for uh, residential aged age care across the board, and including the creation of the new Aged Care and Quality Safety Commission. So, Mr. President, I have and this government has continued to reform this sector while the Royal Commission is doing its Order. work, and we look Senator forward Colbeck. to its report in February Wong, next year. Final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. This minister has ignored warning after warning failed to plan, failed to act urgently, and as a result, he has lost the confidence of the Australian people and the confidence of the Senate. Today in the House of Representatives, Mr Morrison, the Prime Minister, couldn't bring himself to express confidence in this minister. So I ask this minister, when will you resign? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Again, I reject the premise of Senator Wong's question. Uh, and what I will do is what I've said I will do in previous questions uh, during question time today. I will continue to work in the interests of senior Australians. I will continue to, in to bring reforms forward to government, as, I've, as I have done during my tenure. And, and I will continue to uh, in uh, work to ensure that senior Australians, through the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic, have access to the resources uh, and the support that they need, Mr. President, uh, in, uh, in, in ensuring that they get an appropriate level of care throughout uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And, Mr. President, $1.5 billion as a result of my interventions and work with the ERC and the government is a clear demonstration of the fact that I take this role seriously and I will continue to do just that. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed on a notice paper. Thanks. Um, colleagues, I'd like to make two statements now that question time has concluded. First, touch wood, now that we have successfully delivered our first, night, first fortnight of remote participation, I would like to acknowledge the efforts of people across DPS who designed, delivered and supported the system that has enabled this to be a success, building on the work undertaken that has seen more than 100 committee hearings with active video conference facilities since April. This has involved delivering not just the technical aspects but also direct contact with participating senators to ensure they were equipped and prepared ahead of this sitting period and troubleshooting technical issues as they arose. The, length, the list of people involved is lengthy, so I'll identify just some of the key people led by DPS branch heads Cons Fyrus and Christine White. From ICT, James Lawson, Gary Asbert, Liz Lawrence, Michael York, Chris Williams and Tim Ryan. From Parliamentary Broadcasting, Michael Ferguson and Matthew Burke. Um, on behalf of the Senate, I thank you. Second, I need to make a statement relating to security management in the building, and it corresponds to a similar statement made by the Speaker at the end of the June sittings. The electronic access control system is currently in the process of being activated on the Senate side of Parliament House. In common terms, this refers to the new swipe cards that replace keys to access your suites. The rollout of this project predates my time as president as part of the suite of security upgrades undertaken across the building over several years. I have always and continue to appreciate the sensitivity senators have, regard, have regarding access control and associated data records and management, so I'm making this statement to the Senate. Accordingly, I ensured that extensive consultation has been undertaken prior to activation. The Speaker and I have now formally approved and enacted the Electronic Access System Code of Practice, which governs the management of this system, including its associated data. Prior to my approval of this policy, it was considered and approved by the Senate Committee on Appropriations, Staffing and Security. As a condition of that approval, I agreed to make this statement to the Senate. First, the specific focus of all usage of the EACS and EACS data is for the purposes of security, safety and law enforcement. One of the key purposes of the Code of Practice is to function as a safeguard for parliamentarians against the possibility that the EAC system or its data may be used in a manner which improperly interferes with the functions and authority of the Senate or with the free performance by senators of their parliamentary duties. In this regard, the administration of the EAC and the powers given to officers under the Code of Practice have effect only subject to the powers, privileges and immunities of the Houses and their members. 
these protections are appropriately spelled out in the text of the code. Second, that while changes to the EAC's code of practice must be approved by the presiding officers, that is the Speaker and myself, I will not make any change without consultation with the Senate Standing Committee on Appropriations, Staffing and Security, unless required as a matter of urgency, when in such an instance it will be reported to that committee as soon as possible. Finally, the Code of Practice includes a requirement that the Code itself and compliance with it will be reviewed at least every two years by an independent and suitably qualified person appointed by the Assistant Secretary, Security Branch, in consultation with the Security Management Board of Parliament House. This process has taken several years. As I said, I inherited it upon taking office in November 2017, and I would like to thank the many senators and officials who have assisted in finalising this code, including former Senator Collins, Senator O'Neill, but particularly Senator McAllister, who has worked extensively and consulted extensively, reflecting senators' concerns over the last 10 months. So a personal thank you as well. Senator O'Neill. Yes, I, uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. In response leave. to your statement, President. Leave is granted. Thank you. I wish to make some brief comments as the Chair of the Committee of Privileges, which I have agreed with Senator Abetz, the Deputy Chair of the Committee. I note with thanks the President's statement about the electronic access control system today, and I applaud his work with Senators of the Committee on Procedure to settle this matter, this contentious matter. This new technology will necessarily disrupt and displace older ways of ensuring the security and safety of the people who work in this place in service of the Australian people, our practices and the information we hold. You will no doubt, Mr President, recall the interest of the Committee of Privileges in the EAX system, security systems and practices, and new digital modes of working, including their management and oversight. Our particular interest is driven by our determination to ensure parliamentary privilege is protected in ways that adapt to the realities of these digital days. The committee has taken a close and active interest in negotiations to update the memorandum of understanding on the execution of search warrants in the premises of members of parliament and the associated AFP national guideline for the execution of search warrants where parliamentary privilege may be involved. In the 45th Parliament, the committee considered two matters relating to the disposition of material over which a claim of privilege had been made. In both matters, the material had been seized under search warrants executed by the AFP. The first matter related to the NPN Co papers and the second related to a claim of privilege made by Senator Pratt. In both matters, the committee concluded that the claim of privilege should be upheld and recommended to the Senate that the seized materials be withheld from the AFP investigation. The Senate adopted those recommendations. In the wake of these matters in 2018, the Senate called on the Attorney General as a matter of urgency to work with the presiding officers to develop a new protocol for the execution of search warrants and the use by executive agencies of other intrusive powers. The Senate noted the new protocol should comply with the principles and address the shortcomings identified in reports tabled in the 45th Parliament by the Senate Committee of Privileges and the House of Representatives, Committee of Privileges and Members' Interest. Compliance with the MOU and the associated AFP national guideline is intended to ensure the exercise of investigative powers does not improperly interfere with the parliament, parliamentary committees or parliamentarians freely performing their functions. However, it is clear from the committee's work over recent years that there is confusion about the scope of parliamentary privilege. In particular, there appears to be limited awareness that the powers to punish contempts may be invoked where the exercise of an investigative power amounts to improper interference with the functions of the parliament. More practically, the MOU and the guidelines fo guideline focus on the execution of search warrants on physical premises occupied or used by a member of the parliament. Increasingly, the investigative powers of law enforcement officers, which have the potential to intrude on parliamentary privilege, include powers to access telecommunications data and other electronic data relating to parliamentarians or their staff. In June, the committee agreed to draft guiding principles to facilitate the renegotiation of the MOU and the guideline and, uh, and, the guideline, and provided these to the president and the senators, other senators. The changes proposed by the committee are aimed at updating the MOU and the guidelines so they continue to fulfil their purpose of protecting the ability of the houses, their members and committees to exercise their authority and perform their duties without undue external influence. However, the committee is also conscious that the MOU and the guideline must recognise the legitimate interest of law enforcement against illegal activity. These protocols must not inadvertently shield, provide a shield to illegal activity. 
I note, Mr. President, that work is underway. This progress is encouraging, but this is a matter that the Senate first called for action on in 2018. I hoped that revised protocols, which ensure that the exercise of investigative powers does not improperly interfere with the parliament freely performing its functions, can be quickly concluded. Indeed, I might even put it on my Christmas list, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cormann. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the routine of business for the remainder of today. So leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. Uh, I move the motion as circulated and move that the motion be now put without amendment or debate. The question is the motion be put. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion to amend the routine of business. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Yes, Senator McKim. Uh, President, I'd just ask that the Australian Greens' opposition to this motion be noted. So noted. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek um, leave of the Senate uh, to move um, motion number 792 from the notice paper that we didn't get to earlier is today. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 792. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. And I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber, and I move the motion. Question. Senator Foreman. I seek leave to make a brief uh, statement. Leave is granted. That the Australian Aboriginal flag is a powerful and respected symbol for all Australians. That the Australian government is aware of the concerns around the copyright of the Aboriginal flag, and would like to see a resolution to this uh, issue in a way that respects the rights of the flag's creator while ensuring the flag continues to be a powerful symbol of unity for Aboriginal people. It is a delicate and sensitive issue, and the government respects the copyright of Mr Thomas and the interests of all parties. We do not want to see the process currently underway jeopardised. It is important to note that the Australian Aboriginal flag can be flown freely as per the intention of copyright holder Mr Thomas. The question is the motion moved by Senator Gallagher as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. We'll now re return to the routine of business, which is motions to take note. Just before I ask if there are notice uh, motions to take note, I remind senators this will uh, finish at 3:30. Senator Polly. Thank you. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Rustin to questions asked by Senator Gallagher and McAllister. Well, what an extraordinary question time we had today. It seems to be that there's a cancer in this government, and that is they just don't want to pay attention to what's happening in the community. There is no accountability, and there certainly is no responsibility. Australia's economy fell by 7 per cent in the June quarter, making it the first recession in almost three decades. Not only that, that we are now in the deepest recession that Australia has experienced since the Great Depression. And yet we have a minister who can't seem to do her maths when there's a reduction to the job seeker payment from five hundred dollars down to and a loss of five hundred dollars down to three hundred dollars, and she doesn't see that as a loss. Well there's there's a lot of Australians out looking for work before we had this pandemic and now the economic circumstances. A million Australians are out there looking for work. In Australia, the figures, there's one job for 13 people trying to get that job. In Tasmania, my home state, it's at least 15 people applying for that one job. And the minister says, and I quote, but across much of the economy, we are starting to see green shoots of our economy opening up. We are starting to see jobs occur. Well, I don't know where she's been lately because I can tell you one thing for sure. In Tasmania, we're looking at losing a lot more jobs, a lot more jobs. And we know, because all the reports are telling us, that we can expect another 400,000 Australians by Christmas are going to have lost their jobs. Now, we've seen time after time across the last few months businesses, small businesses, closing their door. But 
failing to be able to reopen. We have a situation where we have a government that is great at making announcements. They love the photo op, but they just don't deliver. And we've seen that again today. When a minister stands up and tries to tell us, oh, look, it's all OK, it's all OK, it'll be right, mate, it's going to snap back. Well, the reality is, in the real world, when you go out and talk to real Australians, you will understand that people are doing it very, very tough, and it's only going to get worse. Now, I was reprimanded today because I did uh, hold up and I said, well, here you are, here's the government's plan, the jobs plan. There is no plan, and unless we have a plan, unless this government can somehow get the ability to put together a jobs plan, things are going to be very bleak for our economy for some time to come. Now, to say, as the leader of the government in this uh, place said today during question time, that there's jobs out there, there's a lot of jobs out there, well, please tell us where all those jobs are so I can tell my fellow Australians that are either unemployed or underemployed, we have in excess of 30,000 Tasmanians that are either unemployed now or underemployed. We've got businesses, restaurants, cafes, hotels, clubs. The list goes on of businesses that are doing it really, really tough. Now, we've got two economies running at the moment in my home state. We've got the businesses that rely on local to support them. And they're saying, you know, everything is going along as well as can be expected. But they're not putting on as many people um, as they did previously. And then we've got the industries around tourism and others that actually rely on not only national visitors coming to our home state, but also um, international visitors. So to say that we've got green shoots, I'd just like to remind you, Minister, what's really happening is the vines are withering and they're dying. And with that comes a lot more disadvantage, social issues that are going to impact on our communities. Now, a bleak Christmas for, in addition to the one million unemployed Australians, now there's going to be 400 thousand additional people unemployed. Now, when we sing um, off the hymn sheets that we've seen over the last uh, two weeks that we've been sitting in the Senate and talking about how good they've been with job seeker and job keeper, there are many in our communities who have been left behind. And when the Prime Minister used to refer to in, at the start of this pandemic that we're all in this together, that didn't last very long because what he's doing is he's leaving people behind leaving people behind, and it's unacceptable. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator Ban. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I rise to take note of the minister's answers as well. And it's been one thing to see that Australia is entering into its first recession in 29 years, a remarkable, remarkable event in and of itself. And the amount of growth that's happened in the Australian economy, especially over the last seven years, all comes down to the coalition government. Now, we entered into this recession, a recession that I remind senators <clears throat> is caused entirely by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has shut down economies all around the world. Now, let me just put on notice where Australia has performed um, as against some of its even larger international peers. So, Australia's GT GDP decreased by 7 per cent. We acknowledge that. The US, uh, the United States of America's GDP has shrunk by 9.5 per cent. Germany's has shrunk by 10.1 per cent. France decreased by 13.8. The whole Eurozone was 12.1. And, Madam Deputy President, the UK, their GDP has decreased by 20.4 per cent. So I think the senators here can see, by any measure, the Australian economy has done better than far many of its peers. Now, as I said at the beginning, the uh, fall in GDP, this recession, has been caused by COVID-19. And indeed, in some states where there is no lockdowns, 
no border closures, like the good state of New South Wales. There is, yes, indeed, green shoots starting to arise because businesses can open. Businesses see the light of day. They see their ability to be able to trade out of this. Unlike, Madam Deputy President, my home state of Victoria, where there is little or no hope. Why? Because we're in lockdown. We're in stage four lockdown, and we're going to be locked down for an awful long time yet. Why are we locked down? I hear you all ask. Well, it's thank you very much, Minister. The reason is that the Andrews state government has failed Victorians, failed them miserably. Why have they failed? Well, let me talk about why they have failed. There is a number of ways that you can protect a community from a pandemic. One, you keep it out of the community. That's called quarantine. That was failure number one for Premier Andrews. So if you've got let it out into the community, and this can happen, as New South Wales has seen, you can have outbreaks, well, then what do you need to do? You need to contain it. How do you contain a pandemic? Well, two ways to do that, testing and through contact tracing. Now, New South Wales has provided a gold standard. It provides a lesson to Victoria how to do contact tracing. Victoria's contact tracing is, on any estimate, at about 30 per cent of what New South Wales is. Now, by any measure, 30 per cent is a failure, a complete and utter failure. The Andrews state government has failed Victorians. The economy there is going to be strangled because it is not going to come out of lockdown. He's already, the Premier has already stated that he's going to keep us in lockdown for another two weeks longer than the six weeks that was initially planned. So that will be eight weeks of stage four. The number of businesses that I've spoken to that are in desperate straits because they've been, they got through stage three and then stage four, they were just crushed, crushed under the weight of not being open their doors. If you want jobs, it's very, very simple. Let businesses open their doors. If you want jobs, let people travel to your state to do business, to go to your tourism sector, to go to restaurants. Not in Victoria. They can't lock down the borders because no one wants to come in in the first place. They have strangled the economy such that it is going to take forever to recover. Now, I know those opposite in coming months and years are going to point at the Morrison government and say, look what you've done. I want, to, I want to put on record here that I will remind those senators opposite at every turn how this happened in Victoria, that it was the Andrews state government that failed Victorians, continues to fail Victorians, is now even locking them up for a Facebook post. This is shameful behaviour, absolutely shameful behaviour, and I, for one, condemn it. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Ayres. Madam Acting Deputy President, well, we've seen in Senator Van's response the essence of the problem with the coalition's approach. Uh, the problem with the coalition's approach is they blame everybody but themselves. Uh, the, the problem that Senator Van points to with uh, lockdowns and border closures around the country is a direct result of failed national leadership, of a national cabinet that's neither national nor a cabinet, but is just a photo opportunity and a complete vacancy of national leadership from this Prime Minister is a key reason why the Australian economy is in free fall. There will be more Australians unemployed because this government's job keeper and job seeker package was too little, too late and badly designed. There will be more Order. Australians unemployed in the economy and there are now more Australians unemployed in the economy because the economy was in a terrible state in 2019. The growth that Senator Van referred to is imaginary growth. There was no growth. We had, we had wage stagnation, no real wage growth, good jobs disappearing across the economy, productivity falling. The economy was in free fall, and that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to deliver growth at the moment. There will be Order. more Australians unemployed. Order. More people will lose their jobs because this government is cutting the job seeker and job keeper packages. There are a million Australians unemployed today, more people than in our history. 400,000 people, because of your cuts, your cuts, 
will lose their jobs between now and Christmas. And we heard in the minister's answers she can't grapple with the reality. She was quibbling about whether they were cuts or whether it was a continuation of the program. Well, it's pretty simple. Are the JobKeeper amounts going to be bigger or smaller? Are they going to be more or less? She couldn't grapple with the reality and take responsibility for the impact that the withdrawal, the tapering off of these, project, the, pr, pr, these, uh, these particular projects, the tapering off over the course of the rest of the year will mean that more Australians will lose their jobs. It's predicted that 740,000 additional Australians, ANU research, 740,000 additional Australians will be plunged into poverty because of the JobKeeper and JobSeeker cuts. What do you think, Madam Acting Deputy President, that means for Australian children in those households? What is the impact of poverty on Australian children? There is a complete disregard on that side of the chamber for the real impact of those cuts. And the minister said yesterday, across much of the economy, she said, we are starting to see green shoots. Well, maybe in the garden parties that the minister goes to in Turak Gardens or Malvern or Gilberton, she sees green shoots. But across Australia, in the country, in our regions, in the suburbs, this is what we see. We see a million lost jobs. We see no vacancies. We see closed businesses. We see dwindling opportunities. And we see cuts to the other opportunities that Australian families look to to lift themselves up. Cuts to universities. The TAFE system in ruins. Cuts to JobKeeper and job seeker. This government is totally out of touch. It's got an incapacity to empathise with ordinary Australians who have got their heads just above water at the moment. They've kept their heads just above water month after month after month, and now the government's going to cut job keeper and the government's going to cut job seeker, and hundreds of thousands of those people will lose their jobs. And what do you think that's going to mean? for Australian families. This government should be focused on a plan for jobs. It should be focused on using the power of government to lift Australians, ordinary Australian families, into work, into jobs, into opportunity, rebuild the economy. But instead what we're going to see is callous, Reaganite Thatcherism driving a very bad agenda for Australians, a weakened government impact, and that's why Many hundreds you, of thousands Senator of Australians Ayers, are going to lose their jobs. Expired. Senator Stoker. Ah, uh, Senator Ayres, the ultimate troll hiding fearfully from the shadows of political figures from other countries in other decades, hiding from these very scary people like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. They're not alive and with us, of course, but Senator Ayres is hiding away, terrified that somebody might want to suggest that, I don't know, the economy might need to have the support of this parliament to grow and become um, able to get out of this crisis on its own. It's the kind of crazy, blatant doublespeak we get from those opposite all the time. And I'll give you an example. When those on this side of the chamber extend JobKeeper, providing a gentle transition out of government support for those businesses who are using it as they emerge bit by bit from this economic shock, they don't acknowledge the fairness in that. They don't acknowledge the extra help that the taxpayer is providing to keep people in jobs. No, 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 no. We've got to put the most negative spin on it possible. It's a cut, they say. They cannot resist talking down our economy. But you know what? There's something that Australians need right now, and it is to believe that the people in this place want them to go forward, want them to succeed, want to believe in their economy, want to believe that their businesses can get back on their feet and that they're going to have a government to support them to do just that. But those on the other side are intent every day that we are here on running down Australians and their good work. 
We're prepared to fight for you, Australians. We'll fight for your job. We'll fight for your business. And Thank we'll you, fight Senator for Stoker. Truth. The time for this debate has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Polly to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Australian Citizenship Amendment, Citizenship Cessation Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator McKim. Well, thanks, Deputy President. <clears throat> the Australian Greens will be opposing this legislation. This bill will repeal the self-executing provisions that currently operate to automatically re remove a person's citizenship. This would normally be a good thing and something that we would welcome and support. However, the bill also provides an alternative scheme that allows the minister to make determinations to remove a person's citizenship. But—and this is critical—the safeguards in place to ensure that a person is a dual citizen before their citizenship is revoked are weakened by this legislation. The minister already has far too many discretionary powers over people's lives. This is a government and a minister that has attacked and weakened the rule of law in Australia and has undermined the separation of powers in this country. And now the minister wants to be able, with a stroke of a pen, to render people stateless. This bill responds to recommendations by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor that current sections in the Migration Act that provide for an automatic loss of citizenship should be repealed with retrospective effect. However, in doing so, this bill will increase the danger that people will be rendered stateless by weakening safeguards in place to, assure, to ensure that a person is in fact a dual citizen before his or her citizenship is removed. <clears throat> the potential for this legislation to render a person stateless was raised by several submitters to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security Inquiry, including the Castan, Stander for, uh, the Castan Centre for Human Rights Law. In its submission, the Castan Centre expressed concerns over the so-called safeguards against statelessness, arguing that they do not provide sufficient protection to remedy the risk that a person may be re rendered stateless as a result of the operation of the citizenship cessation. This is because, unlike in the existing legislation, a, determine may, a determination may be made by the minister even if the minister is incorrect. As argued by the Australian Human Rights Commission in their submission to the PJCIS inquiry, proposed sections in this bill that are provided as safeguards, in fact, change the question of whether a person would be rendered stateless from a question of fact to a question of subjective satisfaction, satisfaction of the minister. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. satisfaction. <laughs> it's been a long couple of weeks, minister. Satisfaction of the minister. <laughs> the Australian Greens agree with that, and we also agree with the Federation of Ethnic Communities Councils of Australia who opposed th this proposed introduction of subjectivity by arguing citizenship is an objective fact, and given the potential for devastating and long-lasting impact on a person, their family and community of becoming stateless, the threshold for this determination of cessation of citizenship should not be changed from fact to the minister's satisfaction. In their submission to the PJCIS inquiry, the Peter McMullen Centre on Statelessness warned the bill's proposed amendments risk rendering the Australian Citizenship Act 2007 inconsistent with Australia's international legal obligations. This includes Australia's obligations under both the 1954 Convention relating to the, stateless of stateless, the status of stateless persons and the 1961 Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness. In that 1961 convention, Article 8.1 provides that a state shall not deprive a person of its nationality if such deprivation would render him stateless. But that is exactly what Australia, a signatory to the convention, would be able to do on the whim of a minister 
under the provisions of this bill. Moreover, the minister will be able to make these subjective decisions to ruin lives, tear families apart by declaring someone, uh, someone to uh, not have citizenship and render them stateless without any judicial or merits review of his or her decision. I want to talk about the diminished judicial review aspect. The Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills raised concerns regarding the court's ability, ability to judicially review subjective citizenship cessation determinations made by the minister and noted that under this bill a court would not consider whether or not the alleged conduct in a judicial review application had, as a matter of fact, even occurred. Despite all the answers and all the information provided in the response to the committee by the minister, the committee remained concerned that this bill would, and I quote, allow the minister to cease a person's citizenship for conduct that could constitute a criminal offence, but without any of the protections associated with a criminal trial, such as the requirement to prove the requisite intention to commit an offence. This, the committee rightfully argued, could unduly trespass on a person's rights or liberties. This includes the potential for this legislation and its removal of judicial oversight of citizenship cessation powers to render a person stateless, which could lead to indefinite detention in an Australian immigration detention facility. I also want to speak about the lack of merits review. This legislation also denies people who are subject to a citizenship cessation determination access to a merits review. When this was raised as a concern by the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, the minister essentially defended this provision by arguing that as a member of parliament, responsible to parliament, a minister's decision should not be reviewable by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. This lacklustre excuse was rightfully not accepted by the committee. A merits review for decisions by the minister to remove citizenship based on conduct was also recommended by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor, which argued there should be merits review in the Security Appeals Division as to whether there could have been or is reasonable satisfaction as to the existence of the requisite conduct for citizenship loss. These decisions that could have such profoundly devastating effects on people and their families should be subject to, to judicial and merits reviews that consider facts and not the minister's satisfaction or the reasonableness of his or her decision. We also hold significant concerns, along with those held by many other expert stakeholders, regarding delegated legislation, sentencing, retrospectivity, procedural fairness and lowered thresholds, such as the maximum penalty for terrorism offences that trigger the citizenship cessation provisions being lowered from six years' imprisonment to three years. Sadly, I won't have enough time in this speech to cover everything that is poor or lacking in this appalling piece of legislation in detail. But I do want to address the constitutionality of this bill and its attack on Australia's doctrine of the separation of powers. The Law Council has yet again, and gee, they must be sick and tired of doing this, had to warn this government of the likelihood that one of its bills is unconstitutional. In its submission to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, the Law Council said that it, and I quote, remains concerned that a, a discretional decision made by the minister in absence of a judicial ruling represents executive overreach and notes that the High Court has held that chapter three of the constitution embodies the doctrine of the separation of powers, relevantly meaning that the judicial power of the Commonwealth may only be vested in chapter three courts. This is a government that wields its powers of citizenship as a weapon against people whose conduct it doesn't like. This bill gives powers to a minister 
who has consistently shown that he cannot be trusted to use them responsibly. This is a minister who has no respect for the rule of law and has at least twice been threatened with contempt of court for refusing a court's direction. This is a minister, Minister Dutton, who was criticised by federal court judge His Honour Mr Geoffrey Flick for his, and I quote, unapologetic reluctance to take personal responsibility for his own non-compliance with the law. Well, this government might trust Minister Dutton to do the right thing, and the Labor Party clearly trusts Minister Dutton to do the right thing, but I draw both of their attentions to that uh, criticism from His Honour Mr Flick and his observation that the current minister, Minister Dutton, has an unapologetic reluctance to take personal responsibility for his own non-compliance with the law. This bill creates dangerous powers in the hands of any minister, but in Minister Dutton's hands they could be disastrous. Now, the Australian Labor Party, uh, in uh, Senator Keneally's contribution, uh, says shame on the Greens for not supporting this legislation. And she's made that comment because, as she observed, ASIO has argued for these provisions. Well, I say shame on the Labor Party, who, along with the LNP, uh, display a whimpering acceptance of the views of Australia's intelligence and security apparatus. ASIO does not make the law in this country. We make the law in this country. And it might be news to Senator Keneally, but you don't have to slavishly accept everything that ASIO says in terms of law reform in this country. It's our job to make the law, not theirs. They're entitled to their opinions, as everyone is, and I welcome ASIO's contribution to the debate. But the simple fact is ASIO has its blinkers on. They want increased powers because they want to be able to control the behaviour of more Australians. That is understandable for ASIO, but it's not understandable for senators in this place to uh, slavishly have the same view. And unfortunately, the uh, LNP ALP duopoly on national security is undermining the rule of law in Australia and leading us down the dangerous path to a police and surveillance state in this country. We remain the only liberal democracy in the world that does not have a Charter of Rights or Bill of Rights. I'm not surprised that the LNP does not support a Charter of Rights or a Bill of Rights, but I am surprised and disappointed that the Labor Party did not take a policy to the last election of supporting a Charter or Bill of Rights and, in fact, in the previous parliament, voted against a Greens motion to establish an inquiry into what uh, a Charter of Rights might look like in this country. We need a Charter of Rights in Australia. We desperately need to enshrine the rights of our people so that we can start standing up against this dark journey that this country is on down the path to a police and surveillance state. Uh, Madam Deputy President, the absence of a Charter of Rights, the bipartisanship on national security, the collusion between the ALP and the LNP on every single national security bill that has come before this chamber in my five years in this place, and the many other things, erosions of rights and freedoms and liberties that we are seeing, all those things collectively are how fascism starts. And if you don't think fascism can happen in Australia, I simply refer you to human history. We should not ever consider we are immune from the dangers of fascism, and I think it is highly arguable that, in fact, Australia is in early onset fascism as we debate this bill. For that and for many other reasons, we'll be opposing this legislation.
Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. This is a really important bill for Australians, and in more than one sense. For good, law-abiding Australians, it offers another important tool in the security agencies of this country's box to help keep those who hate Australia, who hate Australians, and the values of freedom and tolerance that make this country great. But for those who are dual citizens of Australia and another country and who would seek to do the wrong thing, whether through terrorist acts overseas, whether through fighting with the armies of terrorist militia overseas, treason, sabotage, espionage, foreign interference and offences associated with planning, preparation and carrying out terrorism here in Australia, well, they will face its brunt. This vital reform will be undertaken through the Australian Citizenship Amendment Citizenship Cessation Bill, which the committee, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, considered in tandem with a statutory review of the regime that was previously in place in this place for cancelling the citizenship of dual citizens who engage in um, these types of acts. This bill changes the method for achieving that objective. It means that while we are aiming for the same goal, the cancellation of the Australian citizenship of people who very much object to all that this country stands for, but it means now it will be done by allowing the Minister for Home Affairs to end a person's Australian citizenship if satisfied that their conduct demonstrates, in, in effect, a repudiation of their allegiance to Australia. The minister would also have to be satisfied that it is not in the public interest anymore for that person to remain an Australian citizen. The ministerial decision-making model proposed by this bill is an improvement on the current arrangements. And Quite importantly, given the gravity of these decisions for the citizenship and the rights of the individual in the opportunity that exists for persons affected by these citizenship cessation provisions to seek judicial review and, in relation to an ASIO qualified security assessment, merits review. Now, this is the main complaint that is made by people who don't like this bill. There will be some people who will say they don't like the idea that the general approach to reviewing decisions of this kind is one of judicial review. So I really want to address that and say something about just how much opportunity this bill provides for any problems in the decision-making process to be corrected. The availability of judicial review includes the ability for a person who is subject to citizenship cessation to seek declaratory relief from a court that the conduct that it is said formed the basis of the decision to cease that citizenship was not in fact engaged in. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> it provides the person with a broad and effective opportunity to have the facts of that issue canvassed before a court and to have a court make a determination in relation to those facts. No, it's not merits review. But it is indeed a fabulous and effective way of ensuring that we are protecting the rights of the individual. The situation that is most likely to give rise to a need for review is a factual situation where a person has been the subject of a decision to cease their Australian citizenship on the basis of evidence that gives rise to the minister's satisfaction that the person is the holder of a citizenship or nationality of another country, a country other than Australia. But for argument's sake, let's assume that information has turned out to be, despite the best and honest efforts of the minister, incorrect. It's a very unlikely scenario, but theoretically it's possible because determining whether someone is a citizen of another country can be a difficult activity because you're trying to understand the laws of other countries. Now, if that worst case scenario were to happen, there is substantial protection of the rights of the individual 
in the following five aspects of the bill. First, there is the right of merits review for an adverse security assessment if it's a decision that's been made on the basis of one of those, although I freely admit that the power proposed in 36B of this bill can be exercised in the absence of such an adverse security assessment. There will nevertheless have been an assessment, though, in many relevant cases. The second protection is the right of judicial review that exists for the decision under proposed section 36B, capital B that is, particularly noting that this will cover circumstances where a minister made a decision that was affected by bias, where a minister considered irrelevant matters, or where a minister failed to take into account matters that were relevant. That's how we sort out decisions that are wrongly made. The third protection that exists under this bill is the right under proposed section 36 capital H to seek revocation of a citizenship cessation decision after receiving notice that it's taken place. And that's a power that must be exercised in the event that an individual who's affected can show that they don't have a non-Australian citizenship or nationality, or if they can show that they weren't engaged in the conduct that forms the basis of the decision. Now, it also permits revocation of the decision if it's in the public interest to do so. This is a process, of course, that needs to be made under this bill according to the rules of natural justice. So if there was the worst happening and the decision was made and it was in error, there are mechanisms in this bill to set it straight. And so all the frothing that we get from Senator McKim and the Greens about the great injustice of this begs the question, whose side are they on here? <laughs> on the, on the, fourth, the fourth matter of protection that is provided by this bill is in proposed section 36 capital K. It affirms the right. You know, Senator McKim might learn a few things if he could be quiet enough to listen. He Order. would learn that the right of an individual to seek relief, like, for instance, declaratory relief from the High Court or the Federal Court to remedy a decision made in error of the minister, should one be made, on the question of the citizenship or nationality of the person of a country other than Australia, remains. Proposed section 36 capital K also provides for the correction of a decision should there be um, the disallowance of an instrument by this place where that instrument declares a terrorist organisation um, to be relevant for the purposes of some of our other security laws. And that's important because um, that consideration can be relevant to determining whether or not the person has done the wrong thing in the first place. But it provides for those sorts of decisions to be corrected should that unlikely circumstance arise. And finally, if all of those quite substantial measures of protection were to fail, again, I'd suggest it's pretty unlikely, but let's prepare for the worst while working for the best scenario, the minister has a further power pursuant to proposed section 36 capital J2 of his or her own initiative, revoke a determination if satisfied it's in the public interest. The matters for the minister to take into account in determining what constitutes the public interest are listed in proposed section 36 capital E, and it's quite an extensive list. So while some in the academic fraternity or in the lawyers' lobby, they're always arguing for more work for lawyers in the merits review sphere, might froth at this bill, the fact is it has a lot of protections for the correction of decisions that are made in error and to protect the individual from potential abuses of power. And I think that's really important because it means we're getting the balance right between making sure we have accuracy and fairness in the decision making, but that we are ensuring our agencies and our minister has the tools necessary to keep Australians safe. It gets the balance right. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security made a series of recommendations for this bill, and those recommendations have been incorporated. I must commend the members of um, the Labor Committee, um, the Labor Committee representatives on the PJCIS, for their contributions because um, this has been difficult to work through, and we have worked together to get it over the line. But the recommendations we made for this bill to be um, 
improved were to clarify that proposed section 36 capital B of the bill required the minister to be reasonably satisfied of the matters listed in proposed section 36 capital B sub 1, and that the explanatory memorandum of the bill clarify um, the nuts and bolts of the things that the minister should take into account when considering what amounts to the public interest, like, for instance, um, whether or not there are dependents, for instance, affected by the decision. And finally, we inserted a recommendation for the PJCIS to review the bill three years after its assent, so that we can continue to improve the way we go about doing this in Australia, just as we endeavour to do in this bill, improve upon the regime for the automatic operation of law cessation of citizenship that was in place before. These recommendations are the product of the PJCIS's comprehensive analysis of the bill, and they're reflective of the seriousness with which we approach the very important issue of who forms the body of Australia's citizenry. Citizenship cessation is effectively a form of modern exile, and the committee has ensured that any decision to remove a dual national's Australian citizenship is undertaken with care and taking into account all of the relevant factors for each individual's case, from their conduct through to their personal circumstances through to the operation of the law of the country for which they hold their other citizenship. Now, there will be some people who say that Australian citizenship is a right that can't be revoked in any circumstance. But there are two things you can say about that. First, no person who is solely an Australian citizen can have their citizenship revoked. They're not captured by this bill. It means that no person will be rendered stateless by this bill. And I think that's an important matter to make very clear in light of some of the pretty inflammatory things that have been said by Senator McKim in his contribution. Second, those dual citizens who betray their fellow Australians by engaging in acts of terrorism and similarly heinous conduct, they reject the responsibilities that are involved in holding Australian citizenship. They repudiate our values and they dishonour the people of this country. Their loyalties don't lie with this great nation. And, Madam Deputy President, it is right that that has consequences. Membership of the Australian community is a very, very special thing. We share it generously with people from all over the world. But if there are people who hate our democracy, people who hate our freedom and our tolerance, and hate it so much that they would harm their fellow Australians, well, then this nation is prepared to take away that gift. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on this bill, which amends the Australian Citizenship Act, and I rise to support the bill. Um, I want to make a few remarks about Labor's general approach to national security in the context of my membership of PJCIS. Uh, can I start by thanking all of the members of that committee for the deliberative way that they approach this task? And I point to that characteristic particularly because I want to talk about the nature of the offer that Labor makes on national security. We consider that national security is one of the most important tasks that a government must deliver and also that a parliament must deliver. And what that means, certainly in my own approach to my work on the committee, and I believe the work of my fellow Labor members and senators as well, is that we will never seek to unnecessarily politicise the work that is put before our committee. We think it is a serious, we have a serious obligation to engage with the evidence that is put before us. And that evidence is drawn from our national security agencies and it is drawn from the many civil society organisations that also engage with and contribute to our committee and to all of the people who contributed to the committee's deliberations. In this particular case, I thank you. 
Labor's support for this bill is not without qualification. Labor members of the PJCIS made an extensive, uh, provided an extensive set of additional comments, which you can read in the report, and I will talk about those a little bit later in my remarks. But our support for this legislation, at heart, arises because this legislation implements one of the most important recommendations made by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor and remedies one of the most important and significant flaws in this bill uh, in a way that is very important for Australians, Australia's national security but also uh, very important for Australians' legal system more broadly. I want to go to the review undertaken by Dr Renwick, uh, who recently completed his term as the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor. Monitor. And I want to place on record again my thanks to Dr Renwick for his service to our country and actually his pr very practical support uh, during the period of his period in office for the PJCIS. Uh, Dr Renwick undertook a review of the citizenship cessation provisions uh, which he completed last year. And consistent with his charter, he assessed whether or not these laws were necessary and proportionate, and he found in broad that the laws indeed are. But he examined the two means by which a citizen may lose, a, 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 a citizen may lose their citizenship, and he made these two observations. In relation to the provisions uh, that arise from a conviction, the conviction-based provisions, he said that this provision passes muster under the Insulum Act and should continue as it is uh, or will be necessary. But he went on to say, in contrast, the operation of law provisions uh, do not pass muster under the Insulum Act, and they should, with some urgency, be repealed but be simultaneously replaced with a ministerial decision-making model. And at its heart, that is what the legislation before us does, and it's on that basis that Labor provides support, despite some qualifications, because there are things that we would do differently. But the Insulum went through and made some very important observations about the consequences of these operation of law provisions in making his case for repeal. He made the argument that they operate in an uncontrolled manner. So a person who has committed the most serious of offences and is an undoubted threat to Australia while remaining a citizen is treated the same as one whose behaviour is at the lowest end of the spectrum of criminal behaviour. He pointed out that they operate in an uncertain manner and it will often not be possible for authorities to know when citizenship has ceased. He pointed out that they lack the traditional and desirable accountability with, which comes with a person court or tribunal taking responsibility for a decision. He observed that they potentially cause unintended and not easily contained effects on Australia's relations with other countries, and he also observed that they cause confusion and potential legal difficulties for ACES and ASD because uh, when those agencies seek to exercise their powers in relation to Australian citizens because of the uncertainty that they create about who is and is not a citizen. And it was for all those reasons that he recommended a repeal, and that is the proposition before us. These reservations were echoed by ASIO's evidence to our committee. And ASIO gave a balanced indication, indicating that at some times the operation of these, uh, the uh, removal of citizenship is important and that other times it is not the most appropriate tool and that a judgment needs to be made on which occasion citizenship should be removed. And I want to quote what they said because in their evidence they said in some instances citizenship cessation will curtail the range of threat mitigation capabilities available to Australian authorities. It may also have unintended or unforeseen adverse security outcomes, potentially including reducing one manifestation of the terrorist threat while exacerbating another. There may be occasions where the better security outcome would be that citizenship is retained despite a person meeting the legislative criteria for citizenship cessation. That's an important qualification and it is an argument for consciously 
determining whether or not a person loses their citizenship rather than allowing it to operate automatically, uh, as is presently the case under the Citizenship Act. As I said, we have some recommendations about the way the government has gone about doing this. And we've made a series of recommendations in our additional comments that we consider uh, ought to occur. We think that there were a range of helpful uh, suggestions made by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor, monitor about review and the provisions for review. And it's disappointing that the government would not engage with those recommendations. We are concerned about statelessness, and we think that there were other ways that the bill might have approached the question of statelessness. And we considered that there ought to have been an element of intention uh, when the minister is considering prescribed conduct. These reservations, as I said, are set out in our additional comments. But Labor senators do not consider that we will, we will, did not conclude that we ought to insist upon these amendments. The core task of this bill, which is to repeal the uh, operation of law provisions, is too urgent um, to be left any longer, and Labor senators on those grounds recommend passage of the legislation. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak briefly in this debate on the Australian Citizenship Amendment Citizen Cessation uh, Bill 2019. This is another inst instalment of counter-terrorism legislation, part of a steady drumbeat of national security me measures presented to this parliament over the past two decades. Although the bill itself amends the Australian Citizenship Act 2007, 2007 it is first and foremost an intelligent intelligence and security measure. And it is a measure that involves major questions of principle and process as it amends the terrorism-related uh, citizen cessation provisions that were introduced in 2015 in response to the threat of foreign terrorist fighters returning to Australia from Syria and Iraq. Now, depriving a person of citizenship is a very significant measure, not something that has ever to be considered lightly. The Minister for Home Affairs, speaking in the other place, described the current legislation as an effective legal and administrative measure that has been removed from the Australian community dual citizens who fought as terrorists and extremists in Syria and Iraq. This bill amends the current legislation by establishing a ministerial decision-making regime with respect to the cessation of Australian citizenship, replacing the automatic operation of law provisions. Under this new legislation, the Minister for Home Affairs will be able to terminate a person's Australian citizenship if satisfied that their conduct demonstrates a repudiation of their allegiance to Australia and that it is not in the public interest for the person to remain an Australian citizen. The bill does seek to implement a number of recommendations by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor. The insulin recommendation uh, made was that a, a ministerial decision-making model, while retraining the three criteria by which a person may be considered to have repudiated their allegiance to Australia. First, a person can cease to be a citizen if they engage in specified terrorist conduct. A person can cease to be a citizen if they fight for uh, or are in the service of a specified terrorist organisation overseas. Finally, a person can cease to be a citizen if they have been convicted of a spe specified terrorism offence by an Australian court. The bill retains provisions that a person is not considered in the service of a declared terrorist organisation if acting unintentionally, under duress or providing humanitarian assistance. In accordance with Australia's obligation under international law, the bill also provides that no person will have their citizenship terminated unless the minister is satisfied that, there are citizens, uh, that they are citizens or nationals of another country. In determining whether to cease a person's citizenship, the minister must also have regard to public interest criteria, including the threat a person poses to the Australian community, Australia's international relations and the person's 
uh, connection with another country or citizenship. There are review mechanisms and a measure of transparency. Senator Stoker talked of those. The minister must uh, report to uh, the parliament and the uh, Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and uh, Security, the PJCIS, on these issues, uh, on the use of these uh, measures. The bill also amends the Intelligence Services Act to provide the PJCIS until 30 June 2021 to review the new provisions. It is here, however, that my main concerns with the legislation arise. I'll just indicate I am supporting the legislation. In deciding whether to deprive a person or, um, of, of Australian citizenship, the Minister for Home Affairs will almost in, inevitably in, uh, involve reliance on secret information gathered by the Australian intelligence community, gathered by ASIO, ASIS, the Australian Signals Directorate or the Australian Federal Police. Our intelligence agency has grown greatly in size and in its budget. The parliament has repeatedly extended uh, the responsibilities and powers of those agencies. They have a vastly expanded mandate to protect the Australian people and to gather information and make decisions that may profoundly affect individual citizens. In the case of this legislation, the advice of our intelligence agencies may indeed result in a person being deprived of their fundamental rights as citizens. Now, while many members in parliament are prone to praise heap on our uh, praise to heap praise on our uh, intelligence services, and I too acknowledge their professionalism, they are not infallible. They do make mistakes. The case of Mohammed Hanif is just but one in which the, our intelligence agencies got things horribly wrong. Intelligence is often opaque and, amb and ambiguous. Consequently, I have uh, uh, been, long been of the view, and uh, I've mentioned this in my uh, opening speech to uh, in my first speech to the Parliament, that the Parliament's preparedness to increase the powers and authorities of our intelligence services uh, and the powers and the authority of ministers who exercise control over these agencies must be matched with an equal preparedness to improve scrutiny of the intelligence community by the Parliament. In this regard, it is a major deficiency, unique to Australia amongst the so-called Five Eyes powers, that our Joint Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence uh, and, and Security is explicitly excluded from being able to review the operational activities of our intelligence community. This is a major deficiency in democratic accountability. And I have set on several occasions introduced amendments to the uh, Intelligence Service Act to extend the mandate of the PJCIS to cover operational matters. There should be nothing that is controversial, controversial about such a measure. The measures I'm proposing are closely modelled on the provisions governing the role of the Canadian Parliament's Intelligence Oversight Committee. So far, both the coalition government and Labor opposition have declined to support these measures, even though Labor has expressed uh, in principle support. They just can't bring themselves to vote for it. The provisions in this bill for a, uh, a one-off PJCIS review of the administration of these new ministerial powers is no substitute for ongoing review of operational matters, the business end of the intelligence community. And I know that the minister may uh, rise and suggest to me that this oversight is covered off by uh, the Inspector General of in Intelligence and Surveillance. Now, I have an, a letter in my, of in my office from um, uh, the IGES, who I greatly respect, that demonstrates that uh, the coverage of her uh, purview is in fact limited. So, uh, for example, she can't uh, review the um, uh, she can't review the directions of cabinet, for example. Even though those directions may affect policy 
They may affect international relations and are typically the sorts of things that parliaments have direct responsibility for. We can't subcontract out our constitutional responsibility of oversight. And that is, in fact, what we have done. I'm not in any way suggesting that uh, the Honourable um, Margaret Stone uh, is not competent. She is, uh, she is most competent. But it, it is the, the parliament's constitutional responsibility to have oversight of all aspects of government. <clears throat> now, the government may also stand up and say this is not the time and the place. Uh, to consider this, but I would say just when will it be the time or the place? More effective parliamentary oversight can be put on the back burner. The needs grow uh, sorry can't be put on the back burner. Um, the needs grow greater with every piece of counter new piece of counterterrorism legislation introduced to this parliament. So today I will give both sides, government and opposition, another opportunity to match their support for increased intelligence and security powers with a commitment to democratic scrutiny and accountability. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, and I thank those senators who have contributed to the debate on the Australian Citizenship Amendment Citizenship Cessation Bill 2019. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, the Australian Citizenship Amendment Citizenship Cessation Bill 2019 continues the Morrison government's efforts to address the threat of terrorism and delivers on our commitment to keep the Australian community safe. As we have heard during the debate, the bill's central reform is the replacement of the current operation of law provision for citizenship cessation with a ministerial decision-making arrangement. Importantly, the bill provides that the minister cannot cease a person's citizenship if it would result in the person not being a citizen or national of any country. The provisions of the bill will apply to persons who engage in specified terrorism-related conduct, who fight for or are in the service of a specified terrorist organisation overseas, or who have been convicted of specified terrorism-related offences and sentenced to a period or periods of imprisonment totalling at least three years. I would like to thank the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security for its work on this bill through its inquiry and recommendations. The committee's advisory report on the bill made three substantive recommendations, each of which the government has accepted. The Australian Citizenship Amendment Citizenship Cessation Bill 2019 again continues the Morrison government's work to protect Australians and our way of life and to keep our community safe. Australia is a united and cohesive country. It is something that we pride ourselves on. In recognising and protecting this unity and cohesion, it is essential that we continue to monitor, update and amend the way in which we deal with those who would threaten it. Behaviour that harms or seeks to harm our community, whether that be in Australia or offshore, is in clear opposition to the common bond and shared values that underpin membership of the Australian community. The bill deserves the support of all in this parliament, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I think the ayes have it. A division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that the bill be read at a second time. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left, and I appoint Senator Davy as teller for the eyes and Senator Seaward as teller for the nose. Oh. Could all the senators please take a seat for the decision? Could we have some senators? Could we have some quiet in the uh, chamber, please? We're having difficulty hearing the tellers. Thank you.
Thank you, Senators. There being 35 ayes and four noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. And I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Citizenship Act 2007 and for related purposes. As there has been an amendment provided, we, we will resolve into committee. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I would uh, like to. I, I'd seek leave to move amendments one and two together on sheet one zero three nine. Is leave granted? Yes. It's granted. Just, uh, just very briefly on this uh, amendment. This is an amendment uh, that uh, seeks to uh, enable the, uh, the PJCIS to have oper operational oversight of our intelligence services. Minister. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Acting Chair, at this point in time. Uh, thank you. Just in response to the amendment that Senator Patrick has moved uh, on sheet 1039, um, and the amendment being that the amendment would have the effect of repealing the limitations on operational oversight uh, of intelligence agencies to the uh, PJCIS. I do advise the chamber uh, that the government, as I think you know, Senator Patrick, will not be supporting uh, the amendment put forward. Uh, the reasons for that are this. Senator Patrick seeks to amend this particular bill to provide the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security uh, with operational oversight of intelligence agencies. And, uh, Senator Patrick, though, would be aware uh, that the government's long-standing position is that operational oversight uh, of Australia's intelligence, security and law enforcement agencies is appropriately conducted uh, by independent statutory bodies. Uh, Madam, Acting, oh, Madam Chair, uh, importantly, uh, Commonwealth legislation provides oversight bodies uh, again, as Senator Patrick would be aware, and I, I have listened to Senator Patrick uh, carefully, uh, Commonwealth legislation does provide oversight bodies robust powers uh, to conduct this oversight. Uh, and in fact, senators uh, in the chamber would be aware uh, the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security has the standing powers of, uh, or the powers of a standing royal commission, and they are very, very serious powers, uh, as you would know, uh, Madam Chair. The Inspector General of Intelligence and Security uh, has extensive powers to oversee and inquire uh, into the legality and propriety of national intelligence community operations. Uh, and in fact, and you think, Senator Patrick, uh, in your comments, uh, when you were commenting what you thought the, the government would say uh, in response to your amendment, uh, you actually said. Uh, the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, uh, you acknowledged in fact, regularly appears before the PJCIS, uh, otherwise known as the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, uh, on non-operational matters, uh, and the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security uh, may also request uh, the Inspector General of Intelligence uh, and Security to brief the committee. Uh, so certainly, uh, Madam Chair, uh, that option is open to the committee uh, should they wish to uh, exercise it. Uh, the government's view is that this amendment would duplicate existing oversight provided uh, and that existing arrangements appropriately— Minister, it being 4.30 and pursuant to the order, the committee will now report its progress. Report its progress. So, Senators, in accordance with the resolution agreed to earlier today, I will now put the questions required to dispose of the bills listed in that order. I will deal first with the Australian Citizenship Amendment Citizenship Cessation Bill 2020, and we will now deal with the amendments circulated by Senator Patrick. The question is that the amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 1039, moved by Senator Patrick, be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. 
No. I think the noes have it. Is the division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. I'm going to say stop the bells, even though we've still got sand going through. <laughs> so stop the bells. Um, the question is that the amendment one and two on sheet 1039 moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chairs, the noes to the left, and I appoint Senator McCarthy for the noes and Senator Seawert for the ayes.
There being seven ayes and 31 noes, the matter is, is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I'll call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Citizenship Act 2007 and for related purposes. Minister. Sorry, I will now deal with the sorry. I'll now deal with the Primary Industries Customs Charges Amendment, Dairy Cattle Export Charge Bill 2020. And I'll first deal with the second reading amendment moved by the Australian Greens. The question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 8988, circulated by the Australian Greens, be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. So the question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 8988, circulated by the Australian Greens, be agreed to. The, all those um, eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left, and I appoint Senator McCarthy as the teller for the nose and Senator Seward teller for the eyes. Thank you. The results of the division are seven ayes and 27 noes, so therefore resolved in the negative. Thank you. The question now is that the bill be now read a second time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Ayes have it. I will call the clerk. Oh, sorry. Did you, sorry. Sorry. Division required. Sorry. We'll ring the bells for one minute.
stop the bells. The question it now is that the bill be now read a second time. The eyes shall move to the right of the chair, the, left, the, the nose to the left of the chair. And I appoint Senator Seawert for the nose and Senator Davey for the eyes. The result of the division is eyes 30, nose 40, and four, sorry, and is therefore resolved in the affirmative. I'll call the clerk. Thank you. A bill for an act to amend the Primary Industries Customs Charge Act 1999 and for related purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Oh, sorry, Senator Seaworth. Uh, record the Greens uh, no, uh, so no to don't support the bill. Thank you. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Primary Industries Custom Charges Act 1999 and for related purposes. That concludes the, bill, the segment for bills. So if uh, senators would like to leave the chamber quietly, we will move back to routine bus of business. Yep. We're moving now to tabling in consideration of committee reports and government responses. Or, or. Uh, Senator Davey. Uh, I present oh, I, don't, I don't think I can pronounce this. I present a corindum of the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. Senator Scar. Madam Acting Deputy President, I present the examination report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity on the examination of the annual. Oh, sorry, if I can start again. I present the report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity on the examination of the annual report of the Integrity Commissioner 2018-19, together with the Hansard Record of Proceedings and documents presented to the committee. And I move that the Senate take note of the report.
Are you On behalf speaking? of the committee, I thank the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity for a comprehensive annual report and acknowledge the significant progress it has made in the last 12 months. The committee commends the Commission for the efforts undertaken in the last 12 months to conclude or discontinue older investigations where it was appropriate to do so and to ensure that its focus, the focus of its efforts is on matters relating to serious or systemic corruption. This is in accordance with the Commission's purpose under the Law Enforcement Integrity Commissioner Act. The committee noted that of the 116 investigations concluded in 2018 to 2019, 113 were discontinued under section 42 of the Law Enforcement Integrity Commissioner Act. That section provides a power for the commissioner to reconsider how a particular matter should be dealt with. To enhance the transparency of investigations that are discontinued under section 42 of the Law Enforcement Integrity Commissioner Act 2006, the committee recommends that the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity consider how it can collect data on investigations that are discontinued so that it is able to report at a high level the reasons why investigations are discontinued. The committee is satisfied that ACLI, as it's also known, performed strongly against its five key performance indicators and correlating targets for 2018 to 19. ACLI delivered positive investigative and operational results, including five prosecutions, all resulting in convictions. The committee particularly congratulates ACLI on the successful work of the Visa Task Force Committee. The task force integrated corruption prevention into operational activities that provided timely advice on corruption risk to key stakeholders. It exemplified how working in partnership with other law enforcement and integrity agencies can build capability and capacity to combat corruption-enabled crime. This goes to the very heart of the purpose of the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity. In conclusion, I would like to thank all of the staff of ACLI for their great work over the last 12 months. The committee has been most impressed by the contribution made thus far by the new Integrity Commission, Commissioner Ms Yala Hinchcliffe since her appointment in February. The committee notes the speed with which the Integrity Commissioner has familiarised herself with the key issues and taken steps to continually improve ACLI's efficiency and effectiveness. I would like to thank the committee secretariat for their assistance in preparing this report, in particular Dr Sean Turner and Ms Emmy Shields. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank all committee members for their contribution. In particular, as a new chair, I could not hope to have a better deputy than Senator Billick, who in the finest traditions of this place has been collegiate, helpful and always constructive. And with that, President, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, thank you, Senator Scars. Senator Billick. I think Senator Scars got something else he needs to table as well. <laughs> okay, Senator Scar. As I said, Senator Billick is always helpful, collegiate and constructive. <laughs> Madam Acting Deputy President, I present the delegation report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity on the visit to New Zealand and Vanuatu, which took place in December 2019. And I move that the Senate take note of the report. Uh, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Billick. Thank you. Um, I want to speak to the delegation um, report. So I had the pleasure of leading a delegation of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement Integrity to New Zealand and Vanuatu. The delegation was primarily to support the committee's ongoing inquiry into the integrity of Australia's border arrangements. The committee also used the delegation as an opportunity to understand integrity frameworks more broadly in the two countries and how individual initiatives or aspects of those frameworks might be relevant for Australia. There are emerging challenges for Australia's anti-corruption law enforcement and border agencies in ensuring our border arrangements are protected from transnational organised crime, changes in information and communications technology that can increase corruption vulnerability, criminal activities which seek to hide within legitimate movements across borders, and the potential for corruption in biosecurity and visa processing. Of particular interest to the delegation was looking into anti-corruption measures 
used by border agencies in nearby jurisdictions with which Australia has a close association as our partners in addressing transnational crime and corruption. This was of particular importance as the Australian Com Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity has reported that a number of investigations now involve international operations. The delegation would like to thank the Parliament of Vanuatu as well as many government agencies for their welcome to their beautiful country and their openness to our discussions. We reviewed a number of anti-corruption and integrity programs being undertaken in Vanuatu, many of which are directly supported or funded by the Australian government. The delegation was very pleased to see the significantly more sophisticated approach that many Vanuatu agencies are taking towards these measures to improve the integrity of a broad range of law enforcement, parliamentary and civic functions. The government of Vanuatu and its people are to be commended for the great steps being taken to strengthen the functions that underpin its democracy. Australia is honoured to work in partnership with our Pacific neighbours in their endeavours. And on behalf of the delegation, I wish to thank the government of New Zealand, our cousins across the Tasman. We met with a range of law enforcement, anti-corruption, integrity monitoring organisations. The delegation left with a greater understanding of how well Australia and New Zealand work together on these initiatives and how closely tied are our futures. One of the um, important lessons the delegation learned was the need to remain vigilant and clear-eyed about corruption and integrity risks. It's often said that the greatest trick the devil pulled was convincing people he didn't exist. The same can be said of corruption. The, greater, the greatest corruption driver of all is to think that corruption risk doesn't exist. Australian integrity and anti-corruption frameworks have been clear-eyed in identifying that risks to Australian borders do not start at our borders but can also be driven by weaknesses in regional trading partners. This delegation report outlines the work that some of Australia's trading partners have been doing to minimise those risks with the funding and support of the Australian government, and we commend these programs. And lastly, I also would like to thank my fellow delegates, Mr Conaghan, Mr Lamming and Mr Zappia, for participating in the delegation. I would also like to thank the committee secretary, uh, secretary for their extensive work in organising the delegation, in particular Ms Kate Gortier, who accompanied us to the delegation secretary. Their support, as always, was invaluable. Uh, thank you, Senator Billick. Do you, uh, do you, are you wishing to continue your remarks? Yes, I will seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, thank you. Senator Billick. I believe we have some messages from the House. Uh, um, uh, we'll come to you in a second. Thank you. Uh, the President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Migration Amendment prohibiting items in immigration detention facilities, Bill 2020, for concurrence. I call the minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. Uh, the, I'll, just, <laughs> I'll just advise that we're, we're doing messages from the House and we'll come back to the, uh, we'll come back to the order that you have. Um, the question is that the motion as moved uh, by the minister be put. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958 and for related purposes. The minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, in accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 6 October 2020. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of Mr Georganis in place of Ms Payne to the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme. That concludes, I believe, the messages from the House and uh, will now proceed to consideration of uh, documents which are listed on pages 17 and 18 of the notice paper. Senator Billick. Thank you. Um, 
I wish to seek leave to continue my remarks on documents 1, 2, 3 and 7 on page 17. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Billick. Uh, I seek leave to continue my remarks on documents number 12 on page 18 and then committee reports and government responses 1, 2 and 5 on page 18. Um, yes, we'll come to committee reports in a moment. Does anybody else wish to make uh, any contribution on documents? We're moving now to committee report, Senator Billy. Thank you. Um, I seek leave to continue my, my remarks on uh, number one, two, and five on page 18, 12, 14, and 16 on page 19. And am I right? To, oh, no, the next is a different area. <laughs> is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Billick. Are there other contributions on committee? Yes, there are. Yes, there are. Uh, Senator McKenzie, um, I'll come to you in a moment, Senator Roberts. <laughs> I'll come to you in a moment, Senator Roberts. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to take note of a committee, select committee report into jobs for the future in regional areas. Building strong, resilient regional communities is a priority for the National Party in government, and so I welcome this report to the Senate. I note Recommendation 1.61 calls for a requirement of a proportion of critical mineral ores mined in Australia to be processed and value-added domestically to enable the development of a domestic uh, battery manufacturing. I'm very, very excited about identifying possible and emerging manufacturing sectors, but we shouldn't just limit that to one single industry. Government senators uh, noted that the report does not ad adequately summarise the importance of the resources industry, including coal, oil and gas. Existing manufacturing must be included, and again, government senators noted the inadequate recognition of existing industries that already support uh, our regional economy. And the food processing sector alone uh, has the majority of its employment out in rural and regional uh, communities. And the Goulburn Valley in my own home state of Victoria is a fantastic example uh, of food processing, manufacturing being based close to the source product and providing a swathe of uh, great career options for rural and regional Australia. We have significant opportunities to build our regional manufacturing industry and, in doing so, to facilitate a strong regionally-led recovery from COVID-19. The National COVID Task Force has identified reinvigorating and bolstering Australia's manufacturing capability as a matter of national interest, placing manufacturing in a prime position to assist our nation's recovery. We must seize the opportunity to rise from the COVID crisis by re-establishing and growing our domestic manufacturing and processing. The time to do that is now, and the place to do it in is regional Australia. Currently, regional manufacturing employs more than 274,000 people and makes up over 31 per cent of total manufacturing, compared to 68 per cent in metropolitan areas. Our regions produce more than 60 per cent of our exports and have comparative advantage in manufacturing capabilities through their access to the natural resources and the ability to value add to exports through processing. For regional manufacturing to achieve these advantages, support must be provided through a broad regional development framework that unlocks and maximises regional Australia's economic potential, one that is supported by federal, state and local governments. Of course, there are challenges to overcome this, uh, but they are not insurmountable. These challenges include a fragmented regional development infrastructure constraints such as freight, transport and telecommunications, the need to attract skilled and experienced professionals to regional areas and a lack of technology. But as I said before, these challenges can be overcome and the Nationals have been working tirelessly to do so. 
Regional Australia is also, in this current environment, comparatively COVID-19 free, providing a way forward to economic recovery. There'll be less, there's less constraints for regional manufacturing. Localising supply chains by bringing regional and rural businesses into the pipeline for manufacturing will create business opportunities, jobs and economic growth, and the flow on benefits won't be restricted to the local area alone. Investing in value-adding opportunities through the reinvigoration of manufacturing with new technology, new processes, research and development will innovate our manufacturing industry, build their capabilities and create opportunities for development and expansion. We need to make sure that our manufacturers have access to uh, affordable and reliable power, and that means a suite of generation opportunities. We need to make sure we're backing those manufacturing uh, industries that have strategic interest uh, for our nation. And we need to make sure we can also focus on those where their export opportunities are greatest. The National Party has always backed agriculture, uh, we've always backed mining, and we've always backed manufacturing. And I'm excited about uh, what we'll be able to achieve in regional Australia by uh, working together to build a strong manufacturing base, providing many, many local jobs uh, and ensuring our fabulous product, our primary product out there in the regions, is value-added where it's sourced and exported to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Uh, did you seek leave to continue your remarks? I will. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. I think I'd given the call, Senator Stoker, to Senator Roberts, and I'll come to you next. Um, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd like to speak to report number one on page 18 of the notice paper. Thank you, Senator Roberts. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that the second progress report of the PFAS subcommittee has arrived 21 months after the first progress report. The first thing I notice is that the name has changed. The first report was titled Management of PFAS Contamination. The second report is titled Remediation of PFAS Contamination. I welcome this change of focus. The time has passed for PFAS to be managed. We are not managing these PFAS contamination plumes. The plumes are out of control. After 60 years of PFAS, the number of contaminated sites is now over 900. Plumes at Oakey, Richmond, Williamtown, Catherine and Townsville are spreading across formerly productive farmland. Residents are having their homes destroyed and poor medical outcomes for long-term residents are a fact we must own up to. Yet the government's response has been more spin than substance. The first report's recommendation one called for the creation of the Office of the Co Coordinator General to control the government's PFAS response. That office was never created and it has now disappeared from the second report. In its place is the PFAS Task Force which we are told is leading the government's efforts to coordinate a whole of government response to PFAS contamination. Oh, really? Is it? In a meeting with the Departments of Defence and Environment, I asked for the minutes of the three most recent meetings of the PFAS Task Force. I wanted to see what this sincere effort to create a whole of government response looked like. I was promised those minutes, yet they never arrived. I did a document discovery and the minutes never arrived. So let me repeat my request. Where are the minutes? The first report, second recommendation said, quote, the government should continue to upscale its investment on the containment of PFAS plumes leaving defence bases. That was perfectly clear. Has that been done? No. Defence had four mini remediation plants before the first report came out. It still has four. All of those are on defence land. There has been no active remediation in the red zones around defence bases. As a result, these plumes are spreading and drawing more and more everyday Australians into this PFAS nightmare. The first report's third recommendation called on the government to, quote, to review its existing advice in relation to the human health effects of PFAS exposure, including to acknowledge the potential links to certain medical conditions. In one of my meetings with Defence on PFAS, I asked for the medical science they were relying on for their stated position that residents in red zones were not risking medical conditions, provided they did not drink pore water. The studies I received were small-scale studies frequently offered by DuPont as proof that PFAS is harmless. Scientific integrity is essential to good governance. PFAS con compensation and remediation will cost billions and become a major exercise. The decision as to who we should compensate and relocate must be based on good science, robust science, not
not cover up studies of five cows DuPont funded by DuPont. It is for good reason that the new report's recommendation five calls on the government to, quote, use information on PFAS-related matters that is factual and cites trusted sources. I wholeheartedly agree. The first report's fifth recommendation called on the Australian government to, quote, assist property owners and businesses in affected areas with compensation, including the possibility of buybacks. Shortly after that report was released, the government chair of the PFAS subcommittee, Andrew Lamming MP, was dumped as chairman. There will be no talk of compensation and buybacks in this government. So imagine my surprise when the second progress report arrives on Tuesday that says the same thing, quote, the committee recommends that the government prioritise assisting property owners and businesses through compensation for financial losses, including the possibility of buybacks. I'll say that again. The committee recommends that the government prioritise assisting property owners and businesses through compensation for financial losses, including the possibility of buybacks. Has this been progress, Madam Acting Deputy President? No. The government is fighting compensation through the courts. This makes no sense. The government knows it is going to have to pay this money eventually. Why pay it to lawyers instead of affected residents? When all the new science on PFAS is considered, when the litany of medical conditions suffered by residents in the red zones is considered, when the financial losses stemming from not being able to use their properties is considered, the only fair and decent thing to do is compensation and like for like relocation. I applaud the committee for having the courage to say what must be said. It's time to make this right. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Yes, please. Uh, thank I do you. seek leave to continue there my being, remarks. Thank you. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I rise uh, to take note of Committee Report 7 on page 19 of uh, the notice paper. Our country's million-strong law-abiding firearm owners know all too well the impact felt as a result of unwarranted actions from law enforcement. And so I welcome the Parliamentary Joint Committee's report into the impact of law enforcement and intelligence powers. I note that section 2.4 details the background and events leading up to the inquiry. The principles of Australian democracy were considered as being at the very heart of their inquiry. These democratic principles of limited government, the rule of law and the idea of a democratic social contract are fundamental to our society. Yet time and again they have, it, it has failed for our law-abiding firearm owners in Victoria. The Victorian state Labor government is determined that Victorians who have diligently earned and maintained a firearms licence are to be subject to punishment for breaches of COVID-19 regulations far beyond those of the general public in Victoria. The Victorian police have threatened to reprimand, suspend or cancel licences of registered firearm owners who blatantly and deliberately breach the current directives of the Victorian Chief Health Officer. That's direct quotes there uh, from Vic Pohl. This threat from law enforcement could not be further from those principles of Australian democracy, and it is the antithesis of what determines a democratic social contract. No other comparable sections of society face such obviously discriminatory supplementary pun punishments for COVID-19 breaches. There are no reprimands for fishing licences. There's no cancelling <coughs> of your driver's licence. Only law-abiding licensed firearm owners are the subject of this politically motivated presumption of guilt in my home state of Victoria. What is so concerning is that it is not an isolated act. It is yet another example of law-abiding firearm owners being singled out for unfair and discriminatory action. Licensed firearm traders have had to face unlawful discrimination from our banking system, having been subject to a number of discriminately discriminatory lending practices. And APRA confirmed that the banks had no lawful grounds to discriminate, but in many cases the damage had already been done, both financially and to the reputation of hardworking Australians. Many of those affected were small business owners, of which there are an estimated 400 in the industry, translating into over 19,000 local jobs. The state Labor government in Victoria continues to use COVID-19 as justification to enact their discriminatory agenda against uh, lawful firearm owners. In March, 
Premier Daniel Andrews and the Victorian Labor government took advantage of the pandemic to unlawfully again suspend the sale of guns and ammunition in Victoria. This was followed by Victorian Police Minister Lisa Neville insinuating that firearm owners had exacerbated the threat of domestic violence despite there being absolutely no data to support Minister Neville's claims. Our community deserves better. No other industry has been subject to such a blatant, opportunistic attempt at financial sabotage. This is not fair democratic social contract. The hunting and sporting shooting industry contribute over $2.4 billion to our economy in 2018 and generates over, as I said, 19,000 jobs. Law-abiding firearm owners are proactive in their community, celebrating a cultural practice, uh, participating in sport, winning gold medals for our country uh, and ridding our environment of feral animals and pests that do so much damage. Rather than discriminate uh, against them, we should be thanking them and we should be treating them like every single other citizen. And it's absolutely appalling that the state Labor government in my home state uh, has chosen to use COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity to continue to threaten and discriminate against law-abiding firearm owners in Victoria. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Were you seeking leave? No. Uh, the question is that the Senate take note of the report, although— Oh, sorry, Senator Watt. I'd like to take note of one of the reports as well, if I may. Uh, just a moment. I just need sure. to put that question. <laughs> uh, so the question is that the uh, Senate take note of the committee report um, that you've just addressed. Senator McKenzie, all those in favour say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd just like to very briefly take note of the Jobs for the Future in Regional Areas report. That was not a committee that I was a member of, but I did follow that inquiry quite closely, given my interest in uh, the subject matter of jobs in regional Australia, and particularly in my state of Queensland. I think that this is a particularly important topic at the moment, uh, as we all seek to deal with the effects of COVID-19. And the reason I wanted to just say something briefly today was that we all know that tomorrow there's going to be another meeting of the National Cabinet. And one of the reasons that we know that that meeting is on tomorrow is that we've seen day after day of sustained attacks by the Prime Minister, the Treasurer and various LNP members from Queensland on the Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk and her government. Now, only a few weeks ago, we remember uh, in this chamber, we had every single LNP senator sitting along the back row screaming at us on the Labor side about how important it was to open Queensland's borders. Well, weren't they proven wrong? They've been proven wrong on health grounds because we've been able to keep Queenslanders safe uh, from COVID-19 by having hard borders, and they've been, pre then, and they've been proven wrong. And they've been Order. proven wrong. Order. Order. I know, I know Senator McGrath and his LNP colleagues are embarrassed that they got it so badly wrong by calling on Anastasia Palaszczuk, Premier Palaszczuk, to open the borders a few weeks ago. And I've been amazed over the last couple of weeks that you're right, Senator Bellick, they haven't had the same uh, passion about opening the borders in Tasmania. I wonder if that could be about it being a Liberal Premier down there and a Liberal government. I wonder if that's why they haven't had a lot to say about the South Australian borders opening as well. Something about it being a Liberal government versus a Labor government. But some important statistics came out yesterday, and it is important in terms of jobs in regional Queensland. Now, you would have thought that if the Prime Minister, the Treasurer and his LNP colleagues were right in saying that Queensland's closed borders were destroying our local economy, you would have thought that that would have been backed up in yesterday's national accounts figures. Now, we saw in yesterday's national accounts figures that we are now in the worst recession that this country has seen in 100 years. So that will always be the record of Scott Morrison as, pre as Prime Minister, Josh Frydenberg as Treasurer and all of the LNP team behind them that they have delivered the worst recession in, Austra in Australia in 100 years. But it's very interesting to have a look. It's very interesting to have a look at how different states have coped with this in an economic.
makes sense. And it's very interesting when you look at the map that's included in those national accounts of Australia to see how each different state has performed. And funnily enough, despite the attacks of the Prime Minister and the Treasurer and their LNP team on Premier Palaszczuk and the state Labor government, it turns out that those Labor states with hard borders, such as Queensland and Western Australia, have performed better economically than open border states like New South Wales. So you would have thought if, if borders, if tough borders like what Queensland has shown were killing the Queensland economy in the way that the Prime Minister says, then you would think that would be reflected in the figures. But instead, while Queensland's economy has contracted, as has every other state around the country, it's, been, it's contracted by 5.9 per cent, as opposed to New South Wales, the worst performing state, which has had its state economy contract by 8.6 8 per cent. So on the one hand, Queensland, tough borders, kept infection rates low, economy contracting by only 5.9 per cent, still more than we'd like to see, but a lot lower than other states. On the other hand, New South Wales, open borders, higher infection rates, worse of an economic collapse. If that doesn't tell the story, I don't know what, it, what does. So can I suggest to the Prime Minister and all of his LNP colleagues that maybe they spend a little bit more time focusing on what's going wrong in New South Wales. That's the state of every state whose economy has collapsed worst it, with its open borders. And it's the, the states like Queensland and the states like WA that have had closed borders opposed by the Prime Minister, opposed by the Treasurer, opposed by the LNP, that have shielded their local economies and local jobs more than other states. The proof is in the pudding. Queensland taking strong action on borders has kept us safe from COVID, has kept our infection rates relatively low compared to other states, and it has also shielded our economy from the worst of the economic fallout from this recession delivered by the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister should stop his bully boy antics. He should stop picking on Premier Palaszczuk and stop briefing against her in the media. He should actually get his own act together. He should be a leader. He should actually get the National Cabinet working and make sure that the entire Australian economy is being shielded, not just the Queensland economy, which is being shielded by Premier Palaszczuk. Uh, thank you, Senator Watt. And I I think you are seeking leave to continue your remarks. I am seeking leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Watt. Is there any further consideration of committee reports? Uh, if not, I'll move to a committee membership and then come to ministerial statements. Uh, so, yep, yes, Senator, be, Senator um, Billick. Yep. Acting Deputy President, are we doing the Auditor General's reports? Yes. Okay. Can I take note of the Auditor General reports on page 20, number one and two, and seek leave to continue my remarks? Yes. Please. Thank you, Thank Senator you. Billick. And I will now move to a committee membership. Uh, the President has received letters nominating senators to be members of a committee. I call the Minister. I ask the to move a motion to appoint senators to a committee. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the senators be appointed to a committee as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Uh, the question is that the motion uh, moved by the minister be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. And uh, we'll now move to uh, ministerial statements. Uh, thank you. I call the minister. I table documents relating to orders to two orders uh, for the production of documents concerning the MV LQ8. I think that's all I have to do, isn't it, Jackie? And, uh, um, and on behalf of the minister uh, for finance, Senator Cormann, I table the report outlining the status of all orders for the production of documents made during the current parliament, which have not been completely complied with. Thank you. Minister, thank you, Senator Hume. Um, I I call the clerk. General business notice of motion 782, standing in the name of Senator Patrick, relating to the national cabinet. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. So this motion uh, deals. Uh, actually, can I just check on the is it the hard markers at 5:30? Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So this motion deals with uh, an issue that is at the very centre of Australian government. In Sydney on the 13th of March 2020, 
The Council of Australian Governments held its 48th meeting that had been convened to deal with the rapidly escalating COVID-19 crisis. At that meeting, the Prime Minister and the Premiers and Chief Ministers endorsed measures that had been taken in response to the pandemic and agreed to commission protocols um, underpinned by advice from the Australian Health Protection Principle uh, Committee the AHPPC, relating to the management of mass gatherings, uh, school closures and health needs of more remote communities and uh, public transport. COAG further agreed that the AHPPC advice will have the status of COAG advice and to implement and follow the advice as necessary. The COAG communi uh, communique did not include any references to changes in intergovernmental consultation and decision making. But at the following press release, the Prime Minister announced uh, that it had been uh, resolved to form what is called a national cabinet, comprised of himself and the premiers and chief ministers that would meet on a weekly basis to ensure a coordinate, coordinated response to COVID-19 across the country. The first National Cabinet meeting took place on 15 March 2020 and met frequently thereafter. On 29 May, the Prime Minister announced the abolition of COAG and its replacement with the National Cabinet as the apex of a new National Federation Reform Council. The Council of fin uh, Federal Financial uh, Relations, consisting of the Federal, State and Territory Treasurers, will report to National Cabinet, various intergovernmental ca councils and task forces will also um, uh, be subordinate to the National Council, as would the AHPPC. Now, this motion uh, goes to uh, the, not, not to the performance of the National Cabinet, but to the nature of its radical change in practices. And what, what's happening here, and, and I might point out that uh, Again, consistent with what I was saying, that I'm not critical of the, the work of the, the National Cabinet. In World War II, we had a National Council. It's not a new idea to, to bring uh, prime ministers, premiers, uh, and uh, ter territory leaders together. What's new about this particular arrangement is that the uh, Prime Minister has sought to veil all activities under the National Cabinet under Cabinet in Confidence. And that goes against all principles of democratic uh, uh, and responsible government. Cabinet has been uh, around for a long time. It's not a, a, a creature of statute. It's, been, it's a creature of convention. Uh, ever since Federation, we've had a cabinet. It, it was uh, not necessarily well organised in the first uh, 20 or so years. In 1926, we had our first cabinet handbook. It was secret. And in the 80s, uh, it was published, setting out uh, rules around the convention that gave some consistency and integrity to the, uh, to the cabinet body. Uh, to the officials that uh, worked around it, but also gave some flexibility to the Prime Minister as well. Except um, what's happening now is the Prime Minister has uh, abandoned what most people would consider to be a cabinet, and that is a cabinet of ministers, and that means people uh, appointed in parliament, and has extended it to other categories, such as the AHPPC. Suddenly now, a cabinet is not a cabinet of ministers, it's a cabinet of doctors. And the NCCC, that's, uh, that's a, a cabinet of entrepreneurs and, and, uh, and, and executives. And the difficulty here is that anything that these bodies do, the government is challenging in terms of uh, any requests for information, either from the COVID committee which has had great difficulty getting access to information, and indeed for people who simply want to participate in democracy using FOI. What's happening is the, the National Cabinet uh, and its secrecy provisions are actually being expanded uh, to the point where they intrude upon statute rights. 
So this parliament has granted rights to Australian citizens to have access to information. Of course, cabinet in confidence is an exemption under FOI. But by expanding or purporting to lawfully expand the, uh, the, the national cabinet to cover all manner of things, it intrudes upon the rights that were set up when that bill was uh, first introduced in 1982. And that is not acceptable. And it is now subject to challenge. Uh, I, I do uh, have uh, an information commissioner challenge, and I can inform the, the, uh, the chamber that the information commissioner is now considering elevating that uh, to the AAT, recognising the complexity and importance of the question that, that has been put to it. And that is, is the national cabinet a cabinet for the purposes of the FOI Act? Can a cabinet be? as uh, the National Cabinet is, uh, one Prime Minister and no other, no other um, permanent members. So that you know, when the Prime Minister has a meeting with his com car driver, that's Cabinet in confidence, or his gardener. And uh, so we have, to, we have to look at uh, how we, uh, we, we deal with that. I'm also challenging the fact that uh, the National Cabinet is not a cabinet that reports uh, that, uh, there's not a cabinet of government that reports to one parliament. So we will have to uh, see how that, uh, that plays out. But I uh, suggest that what this parliament now needs to consider in order to make sure that we don't have this sort of abuse uh, moving forward is perhaps wrapping some statute around cabinet itself. I support the idea of cabinet. But when it starts to intrude on responsible government, Thank you. It, has to be, uh, it has to be a challenge. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Uh, it, being 5.30, your time has expired uh, and you will be in uh, continuation when the Senate resumes. Uh, I propose that the Senate now adjourn and call Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. When I was growing up uh, in Queensland, uh, Bly Bly, I remember the number plates, and I, we were the, you know, the Sunshine State, and Victoria the number plate I think was the Garden State. I think now it is uh, the Education State. But looking at recent events, you'd think that Victoria probably needs to change their number plates to, you know, the Victoria where freedom goes to die, or Victoria the Police State, or Victoria all praise Chairman Dan. Because I'm a big supporter of the police in Queensland, a big supporter of what our police officers and their families do to protect us. But you sort of have to ask yourself, what is going on in Victoria when a, a pregnant mother, when someone who is pregnant is handcuffed by the police? Not because they've committed a crime, they've been a bank robber or they've been a hooligan, but because they did a Facebook post. So this is the Australia we live in at the moment where there are Labor premiers. That in Victoria, someone, I don't know this lady, I, don't, I wouldn't know her from Adam or Eve, that this person can be arrested in her own home put in handcuffs for a Facebook post. Seriously? Is this, is this what society is coming to, where the police are barging into people's homes and enforcing a, a, a code and then arresting people? This is Victoria, where mere weeks ago, Tens of thousands of people protested in the streets <coughs> for Black Lives Matter. Now, I'm someone who fundamentally and strongly believes in the power and the right and the might of freedom of speech. But I do know that through this current crisis that we've had to give up some of our freedoms. But what it seems to happen in Victoria is that there are certain types of approved freedoms. Yes, you're allowed to go and protest for Black Lives Matter, but if you want to have a different protest with something the police and the Labor government don't approve of, well, no, 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 no. Uh, Madam, come over here, please. We'll pop the handcuffs in you, throw you in the paddy wagon and pop you off to jail. What's this, what is society coming to when that, that is what the police are doing in Victoria? 
Are we serious about this? And then we go to Queensland, my home state, a Queensland where the Labor government is using coronavirus as an alibi to cover up their poor economic record. Senator Murray Watt was very proud of, of the economic record in Queensland. He said, to quote, the proof is in the pudding. Well, it's a pretty rotten pudding when you look at Queensland's economic record. The highest bankruptcies in Australia, the highest unemployment in Australia, the lowest level of business confidence. And I'd, I'd invite those Labor senators to go around regional Queensland and see the impacts of what Labor has been doing to the financial and economic system that is Queensland. And, and shame on the Labor Party for that, because they're using coronavirus to cover up their, their dodgy financial and ec economic malpractice. But they're using border wars even more shamefully, more shamefully as a political issue, and people justify it. They say, oh, it's very popular. Well, just because something is popular doesn't mean it is right or good for you. You know, double fried, deep fried chips with extra salt. You know, I love them. They're very popular. They're not necessarily good for me. We need to make sure that when it comes to these border wars, there is compassion and common sense. How is it that in the township of Mungandai, and I encourage people to go and watch the Mayor of Moree in, in her interview on, on sunrise this morning, where she took uh, she took the lash to Premier Palaszczuk about the politics of, border, of the border wars. We need to make sure we stand up for all Australians and those who need health. Hospitals are for Australians. They're not for someone because they live on one side of the border or the other. How dare we tell a pregnant mother you cannot come to a Queensland hospital? How dare we tell that mother that? You have to wait for 16 hours and then you, then you can go to Sydney and you lose your child? How dare we? Is that what our society has come to? That we use party politics and we lose lives over that? How dare you, Premier? Shame on you. Um, point of order? Senator Keneally. I want to bring to the Morrison government's attention what's in the front of Australian passports. It reads, and I quote, the Australian government provides assistance to Australians in difficulty overseas. An Australian passport is a powerful tool. Well, it used to be until the Morrison government came along. As of this week, there are 23,000 stranded Aussies overseas, 23,000 Australians trying to get home in the middle of a global pandemic. In fact, 23,000 people is basically the capacity of Shark Park home of the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison's beloved and adopted rugby league team. That's how many Australians are stranded overseas. We learnt this week from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade that number has jumped by more than 20 per cent in the last fortnight. 3,450 of these stranded Aussies are considered to be medically or financially vulnerable. And what has the Morrison government done for these, these stranded Aussies? Nothing. These are Australian citizens. These are people of the right to come back to their country because they are Australians. Tomorrow, it will be eight weeks since Scott Morrison rushed to make an announcement on caps for incoming international passengers. In fact, the day he announced the caps, the Prime Minister was asked about Aussies getting home and he said, quote, it will be more difficult because there will be a reduction in the available capacity for people coming back to Australia. The Morrison government knew they were going to be stranding Australians and Australian families overseas. So what did they do? Nothing. Did they come up with a plan? No. Did they communicate with Australians overseas effectively? No. Did they provide assurances to their friends and families in Australia? No. Two weeks ago, the Prime Minister announced in the media that he had asked his senior ministers to come up with ideas to support those stranded Australians overseas as a result of this cap. And what have the senior ministers of the Morrison government done? Nothing. Mr. Morrison is more interested in getting a headline than developing a plan. It's not as if these 23,000 Australians haven't been trying to get home. They have. 
It's easy for members of the government to say they should have come home already, but this government is leaving these Australians behind. International borders have been closed. Planes have been grounded. Flights have been cancelled. Ms Scott Morrison imposed a cap on arrivals, and now Australians are being price gouged by airlines. Eight weeks after the cap had been announced, there's been no plan from this government to do its most basic function, look after Australians who are stranded overseas and enable them to come home in the middle of a deadly global pandemic. One of my West Australian colleagues pointed out to me that in March this government announced an international freight assistance mechanism. Now it's great that we're able to support trade, but let's understand what this freight assistance mechanism does. It flies lobsters, prawn and abalone from Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth to China, Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore and the United Arab Emirates. Great to support trade. How much has the Morrison government spent on this? $350 million. How many chartered flights has the Morrison government sent out for seafood? 1,800 flights. Fantastic if you're into trading seafood. But under the Morrison government, nothing's been done for stranded Australians. If you're a lobster, you get a ticket on a charter flight. But if you're an Aussie overseas, you get left stranded, left behind by this Morrison government. Left stranded in the UK in Singapore, in the Philippines, in India, and in Lebanon. Lebanon after a humanitarian disaster, one this government's already acknowledged. Australians are being told by this government to raid their superannuation or start online fundraisers to get home. Sydney mum, Melissa Inkster, arrived home this week after being stranded in the Democratic Republic of Congo since March. She ended up having to fundraise $15,000 to get home. My colleagues and I have been flooded with stories of stranded Aussies trying to get help. If you go to removethecap.com, you'll be able to read stories of Australians stranded overseas. So the Morrison government can allow the number of arrivals under international flight caps to go up, stop the price gouging, charter flights with Virgin or Qantas planes that are currently sitting in storage, or put in place federal quarantine arrangements like they did when they brought people home from Wuhan. It can be done. This is a heartfelt demand for the 23,000 Australians who are separated for the love, from their loved ones right now. The Morrison government needs to bring these stranded Aussies home. Senator Keneally, your time has expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Australia's uh, space activity could uh, be best described as having been disorganised and haphazard, hence the title of the Senate Committee report back in 2008 lost in space, setting a new direction for Australia's space science and industry sector. An announcement uh, to set up a space program in September 2017 by the government was well received. True to its word, in July 2018, the Australian Space Agency was formally stood up with uh, $26 million in seed funding allocated in the budget. Australia was committing. Enthusiasm was high. The Space Agency issued their strategy in April 2019, with uh, uh, fantastic targets being $12 billion uh, per annum in activity and an additional 20,000 jobs by 2030. Now, who could shy in their enthusiasm on that? I'm very keen for Australia to enter the space domain. We have the land, location, people and the smarts to do this. And indeed, South Australia will play a pretty, pretty key role in all of this. So I've been watching. From media releases and announcements, I see the grants flowing, international and domestic agreements being signed, and Australian companies have been winning commercial contracts with uh, the domestic and foreign customers. An agency, and I quote, focusing on marketing gaps, emerging areas and areas of competitive advantage. Collaboration between government, our R&D sector and industry is, is growing. It looks like all systems are go. However, now the reality is setting in and the view is less, is less favourable. An article in The Australian on the 1st of September sets the scene with the headline Countdown on Space Sorry, Countdown on But Space Industry Dragged Back to Earth by Bureaucratic Delays. Look, I wasn't surprised when I read this. In fact, this was one of my concerns as we entered into this new foray. 
So I started making my own inquiries. And what did I discover? Well, I found an industry highly enthusiastic uh, on, the, on the topic of what they do. But no one wanted to talk to me about the issues they're facing. They're concerned that the situation, uh, about the situation, uh, which is threatening their survivability, but they're not willing to talk about it. I see this in the Australian defence industry as well. They fear speaking out because of the resultant persecution from all the all-powerful Department of Defence. It's clear a major issue right now is the inability of Australian companies to get permits they require from the space agency to launch their rockets. One company applied in September last year. It turns out they needed a permit from the Civil, a permit from the Civil Aviation Authority, uh, Safety Authority, which took a couple of months, and one from the Space Agency, which they don't have yet, and they have no idea when they'll get it. And the launch is supposed to be next month. I think the only way uh, the company may get into space is by simply stacking up all the paperwork they've had to fill in and climb up and they might, actually, uh, they might actually get there. Again, no one wants to talk about the, uh, the details. The attitude and bureaucracy within the, sp within the space agency is clearly threatening a, a burgeoning growth industry, killing the enthusiasm and making customers wary. Recently on Four Corners, Minister Andrews said that there were opportunities and we needed to grab them with both hands. I'm very confident she didn't mean around the throat and strangling the life out of them. The, the space agency does have a regulatory role, but it is also to assist a commercial industry, not hinder it. So my message to the leadership of the space agency is it's not good enough. Ms Clark, Mr Murphitt, you are on notice. I will be measuring you not by the glossy brochures, uh, not by the number of MOUs you sign, but how you use those M MOUs to assist Australian industry, how you use uh, uh, the, the agency to progress our industry. Madam Acting De Deputy President, I don't recall President Kennedy saying that the US was going to, to the moon provided they could get the bureaucracy right. Thank you. Senator Chandler. Here, here. Last week in the Senate, I spoke about World Rugby's efforts to defend the integrity and safety of women's sport by ensuring women's rugby is for female players. At the end of my speech, I referenced the recent case of a woman being fired from her job for speaking about the reality of biological sex, and I posed the question, how do Australians know that they are free to speak about women's rights and the reality of biological sex without being censured or fired by their employer? Well, it didn't take long to get the answer to that question, because the answer is Australians are not free to acknowledge the realities of sex or to defend the integrity of women's sport. Today, I received a letter from the Tasmanian Equal Opportunity Commission summoning me to attend a conciliation conference to answer for my statements on free speech and sex-based rights. The complaint, made under the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Act, is in relation to an op-ed I had published in the Mercury newspaper earlier this year about, quite ironically, free speech. My op-ed started the recent publication of an open letter signed by 150 writers and academics in defence of free speech offers a glimmer of hope that we can put a stop to the anti-democratic cancel culture which has taken root in many corners of our society. Well, I'm not so sure about there being a glimmer of hope for free speech now. The complaint letter I received today goes on to say, in referencing my actions, it is clear or can be inferred from her comments that she considers people who are born male and then seek to live as a female should not have access to female toilets, facilities or sports. This is problematic because excluding someone who was designated by male at birth and currently expresses their gender as female from single-sex facilities or sport may be direct discrimination on the basis of gender identity. It is open to the Commissioner to dismiss the complaint as vexatious and without substance. But she has chosen instead to pursue it and to compel me to attend a compulsory mediation with the complainant. Another part of the complaint relates to my response to an email I received after my op-ed on free speech was published. The email I received asked me to clarify if I understand the difference between sex and gender. In my reply, I said, I do understand the difference. 
That is why I have made the point in my article that women's sports, women's toilets and women's change rooms are designed for people of the female sex and should remain that way. The Commissioner has found that this sentence could be considered offensive, intimidating, insulting, ridiculing or humiliating. The Commissioner goes on to say in her letter to me, it is arguable that following shifts towards unisex toilets, it is no longer necessary to have separate toilets based on sex. Of course, the complainant and indeed the Anti-Discrimination Commissioner are perfectly free to disagree with me on this issue. Indeed, they are both perfectly free to never cast a vote for me as a senator for Tasmania if they don't wish to do so. But I'm quite sure there are plenty of Tasmanians who do agree with me on this. And they have every right to have their say and for their views to be represented in the federal parliament by people such as myself. It is deeply concerning that in a democracy, instead of using our own free speech to respond and perhaps even campaign against me in an election, some people are instead seeking to use the law to silence me and every Tasmanian who shares my concerns. Being summoned by a quasi-judicial body to appear and explain why I say that males shouldn't be in female change rooms or in female sporting competitions is an indictment on the state of free speech in this country. It is yet another example of the assault on truth and the assault on the very meaning of the word woman by activists who are determined to remove every sex-based right that women around the world have and allow anyone who identifies as a woman into women's sports and women's spaces. I will not be silenced. Mm -hmm. Unlike 24 million other Australians, I am fortunate to have this platform in our nation's parliament to be able to speak and to be heard. But this complaint, just like the complaints and the legal actions in recent years against others for saying what they believe in, sends a clear and chilling message to every Australian that free speech is dramatically under threat in this country. A message that if you say something that an activist movement somewhere doesn't like, then you will be hauled before a tribunal and punished. And a message that no matter how ludicrous the demands of activists are, you must comply or face the consequences. I, and millions of others, will not submit myself to the demands of those who deny reality, and I will not accept this outrageous incursion on the free speech of every Australian. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you. Oops, I've turned the mic around, haven't I? Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the passing of two Aboriginal leaders in the last few weeks, few months, whose funerals I attended. <clears throat> Labor Party stalwart Mr John Arkitt, known to most as Jack, was the first Aboriginal cabinet minister in the Northern Territory, serving in the seat of Arnhem for 10 years from 1995 to 2005. Prior to that, he served as director of the Northern Land Council from 1984 to 1990, and then executive director of the Jowan Association in Catherine, where he was much respected. I succeeded Mr Arkitt in the NT Legislative Assembly when he retired from politics in 2005, and I will forever be grateful for his mentorship and his friendship. Mr Arkitt leaves a legacy for the next generation of leaders. He was cheeky, he was stubborn, a hard hit, and yet so determined to see a better Northern Territory for all people. These traits clearly pushed him in every area of his life to encourage all of us who knew him to do better. And he bled true blue for his beloved Darwin buffaloes. I pay my respects to his wife Gail and to his children Nari, Darren, Jonathan and families, and I certainly commend Nari for running successfully for the re-election as the member for Karama during what was an incredibly difficult personal time for her. Mr Arkett was remembered in a state funeral at TIO Stadium in Marara on the 22nd of July. I also wish to pay my respects to the families of Mr Robert Tippin Woody, whose funeral took place at St Mary's Cathedral in Darwin on 10 July. Mr Tippin Woody served as the chairman of the Tiwi Land Council from 2006 to 2012. He was passionate about maintaining Tiwi language and the speaking of Tiwi at home. I recall uh, Mr Tippin Woody on one of the Indigenous Advisory Councils when I was Indigenous Affairs Minister in the Northern Territory, and he was always uh, reminding me and others of the importance of homelands and outstations. Uh, he was enormously passionate about the need for First Nations people to have the opportunities to grow their business, their ventures on their own lands, and that is something that has always stayed with me. 
He was committed to assisting the Tiwi people in the development of both Melville and Bathurst Islands. My deepest condolences to his wife, children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Uh, Senator Waters, are you on the video link? Yes. Yes, thank oh. you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, over the last six months, the world's attention has understandably been diverted to the response to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, this afternoon, I want to draw this chamber's attention to the human rights abuses that continue to occur unabated around the world in spite of the pandemic. Indeed, in some cases, the abuses have been exacerbated by the pandemic. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has just said this week that COVID-19 has fueled authoritarian trends around the world. And as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights Defenders recently said, the pandemic means that we need to do more to protect human rights activists. In the short time I have available today, it's not possible to traverse all the atrocities that are occurring globally, but I wanted to mention a few. In India, Prime Minister Modi is rounding up critics in the shadow of the virus. Indian authorities have arrested dozens in a nationwide crackdown with arrests based on scant evidence. Those who have been detained include a youth activist who raised awareness about police violence against Muslims, an academic who opposes the Indian government's dangerous and anti-Muslim citizenship law, and a co-founder of a women's collective. And authorities continue to impose harsh and discriminatory measures in Kashmir just over a year after the Indian government drastically eroded Kashmiri's rights to self-determination. To quell dissent and to keep news away from the outside world, it continues to maintain stifling restraints with widespread detentions and drastic limits to the internet, to name a few abuses. In the Philippines, Duterte's brutal drug war goes on. The UN found in June that thousands have been killed in the so-called war with near impunity. Duterte's government has given police permission to kill. Along with ordinary Filipinos, human rights activists must also fear for their lives. Only a few weeks ago, unidentified gunmen fatally shot human rights worker Zara Alvarez. And separately, uh, separately peasant leader Randall um, Achanis was also murdered. They were the 13th and 14th human rights workers killed in the Philippines in the last four years, and they had been subject to so-called red tagging or political harassment. Their deaths show that extrajudicial killings in the Philippines remain rife in COVID times. In China, agrarian abuses against the Uyghur people go on, exacerbated by the pandemic. We continue to see mass arbitrary detention, surveillance, indoctrination and the destruction of heritage, as well as forced birth control. What we are seeing is cultural genocide of the Uyghur people, and it is aberrant. A bit further afield in Ethiopia, the government has begun a crackdown following the killing of popular Oromo artist and activist, Achalu Kundesa. Authorities have detained dozens of opposition members and journalists for prolonged periods, often without charge. Members of the Oromo community in Australia have raised their serious concerns with Greens MPs. Ethiopian authorities must bring credible charges against those detained or release them. And there should be an independent investigation into Mr. Hundes's killing. The cases I've just mentioned are only the tip of the iceberg. I could go on, but unfortunately I'm limited by time. To this end, I urge the government to actively call out global atrocities and abuses, even as our attention is turned inward to our domestic response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Waters. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again on Tuesday, the 6th of October at 12 noon.